Section ten of Three Soldiers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by M. B. Three Soldiers by John Dos Passos. Section ten. Two. The snow beat against the windows and pattered on the tin roof of the lean-to, built against the side of the hospital, that went by the name of Sun Parlor. It was a dingy place decorated by strings of dusty little paper flags that one of the Y-men had festooned about the slanting beams of the ceiling to celebrate Christmas. There were tables with torn magazines piled on them, and a counter where cracked white cups were ranged waiting for one of the rare occasions when cocoa could be bought. In the middle of the room, against the wall of the main building, a stove was burning, about which sat several men in hospital denims talking in drowsy voices. Andrews watched them from his seat by the window, looking at their broad backs bent over towards the stove, and at the hands that hung over their knees, limp from boredom. The air was heavy with the smell of coal gas mixed with carbolic from men's clothes, and stale cigarette smoke. Behind the cups at the counter, a Y man, a short, red-haired man with freckles, read the Paris edition of the New York Herald. Andrews, in his seat by the window, felt permeated by the stagnation about him. He had a sheaf of penciled music papers on his knees, that he rolled and unrolled nervously, staring at the stove and the motionless backs of the men about it. The stove roared a little, the Y-man's paper rustled, Men's voices came now and then in a drowsy whisper, and outside the snow beat evenly and monotonously against the window panes. Andrews pictured himself vaguely walking fast through the streets, with the snow stinging his face and the life of a city swirling about him, faces flushed by the cold, bright eyes under hat brims, looking for a second into his and passing on. Slim forms of women bundled in shawls that showed vaguely the outline of their breasts and hips. He wondered if he would ever be free again to walk at random through city streets. He stretched his legs out across the floor in front of him. Strange, stiff, tremulous legs they were, but it was not the wounds that gave them their leaden weight. It was the stagnation of the life about him that he felt sinking into every crevice of his spirit, so that he could never shake it off, the stagnation of dusty, ruined automatons that had lost all life of their own, whose limbs had practiced the drill manual so long that they had no movements of their own left, who sat limply, sunk in boredom, waiting for orders. Andrews was roused suddenly from his thoughts. He had been watching the snowflakes in their glittering dance just outside the window pane, when the sound of someone rubbing his hands very close to him made him look up. A little man with chubby cheeks and steel-gray hair very neatly flattened against his skull stood at the window rubbing his fat little white hands together and making a faint unctuous puffing with each breath. Andrews noticed that a white clerical collar enclosed the little man's pink neck that starched cuffs peeped from under the well-tailored sleeves of his officer's uniform. Sam Brown belt and puttees, too, were highly polished. On his shoulder was a demure little silver cross. Andrews's glance had reached the pink cheeks again, when he suddenly found a pair of steely eyes looking sharply into his. "'You look quite restored, my friend,' said a chanting clerical voice. I suppose I am. Splendid, splendid. But do you mind moving into the end of the room? That's it. He followed Andrews, saying in a deprecatory tone, We're going to have just a little bit of prayer, and then I have some interesting things to tell you boys. The red-headed Y man had left his seat and stood in the center of the room, his paper still dangling from his hand, saying in a bored voice, Please, fellows, move down to the end. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. The soldiers shambled meekly to the folding chairs at the end of the room, and after some chattering were quiet. A couple of men left, and several tiptoed in and sat in the front row. Andrews sank into a chair with a despairing sort of resignation. 
and, burying his face in his hands, stared at the floor between his feet. Fellas, went on the bored voice of the Y man, let me introduce the Reverend Dr. Skinner, who— The Y man's voice suddenly took on deep patriotic emotion. Who has just come back from the Army of Occupation in Germany. At the words, Army of Occupation, as if a spring had been touched, everybody clapped and cheered. The Reverend Dr. Skinner looked about his audience with smiling confidence and raised his hands for silence so that the men could see the chubby pink palms. First, boys, my dear friends, let us indulge in a few moments of silent prayer to our great Creator. His voice rose and fell in the suave chant of one accustomed to going through the Episcopal liturgy for the edification of well-dressed and well-fed congregations. Inasmuch as he has vouchsafed us safety and a mitigation of our afflictions, and let us pray that in his good name he may see fit to return us whole in limb and pure in heart to our families, to the wives, mothers, and to those whom we will some day honor with the name of wife, who eagerly await our return, and that we may spend the remainder of our lives in useful service to the great country for whose safety and glory we have offered up our youth a willing sacrifice. Let us pray. Silence fell dully on the room. Andrews could hear the self-conscious breathing of the men about him and the rustling of the snow against the tin roof. A few feet scraped. The voice began again after a long pause, chanting, Our Father, which art in heaven, at the Amen, everyone lifted his head cheerfully. Throats were cleared, chairs scraped, men settled themselves to listen. Now, my friends, I'm going to give you in a few brief words a little glimpse into Germany, so that you may be able to picture to yourselves the way your comrades of the Army of Occupation managed to make themselves comfortable among the Huns. I ate my Christmas dinner in Koblenz. What do you think of that? Never had I thought that a Christmas would find me away from my home and loved ones. But what unexpected things happen to us in this world. Christmas in Koblenz under the American flag. He paused a moment to allow a little scattered clapping to subside. The turkey was fine, too, I can tell you. Yes, our boys in Germany are very, very comfortable and just waiting for the word, if necessary, to continue their glorious advance to Berlin. For I am sorry to say, boys, that the Germans have not undergone the change of heart for which we had hoped. They have indeed changed the name of their institutions, but their spirit they have not changed. How grave a disappointment it must be to our great president, who has exerted himself so long to bring the German people to reason, to make them understand the horror that they alone have brought deliberately upon the world. Alas! Far from it! Indeed, they have attempted with insidious propaganda to undermine the morale of our troops. A little storm of muttered epithets went through the room. The Reverend Dr. Skinner elevated his chubby pink palms and smiled benignantly. To undermine the morale of our troops, so that the most stringent regulations have had to be made by the commanding general to prevent it. Indeed, my friends, I very much fear that we stopped too soon in our victorious advance, that Germany should have been utterly crushed. But all we can do is watch and wait, and abide by the decision of those great men who in a short time will be gathered together at the conference at Paris. Let me, boys, my dear friends, express the hope that you may speedily be cured of your wounds ready again to do willing service in the ranks of the glorious army that must be vigilant for some time yet, I fear, to defend as Americans and Christians the civilization you have so nobly saved from a ruthless foe. Let us all join together in singing the hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, which I am sure you all know. The men got to their feet, except for a few who had lost their legs and sang the first verse of the hymn unsteadily. The second verse petered out altogether, leaving only the Y man and the Reverend Dr. Skinner singing away at the top of their lungs. The Reverend Dr. Skinner pulled out his gold watch and looked at it, frowning. Oh my, I shall miss the train, he muttered. 
The Y man helped him into his voluminous trench coat, and they both hurried out of the door. Those are some puttees he had on, I'll tell you, said the legless man who was propped in a chair near the stove. Andrews sat down beside him, laughing. He was a man with high cheekbones and powerful jaws, to whose face the pale brown eyes and delicately penciled lips gave a look of great gentleness. Andrews did not look at his body. Somebody said he was a Red Cross man giving out cigarettes. Fooled us that time, said Andrews. Have a butt? I've got one, said the legless man. With a large, shrunken hand that was the transparent color of alabaster, he held out a box of cigarettes. Thanks. When Andrews struck a match, he had to lean over the legless man to light his cigarette for him. He could not help glancing down the man's tunic at the drab trousers that hung limply from the chair. A cold shudder went through him. He was thinking of the zigzag scars on his own thighs. Did you get it in the legs too, buddy? asked the legless man quietly. Yes, but I had luck. How long have you been here? Since Christ was a corporal. Oh, I don't know. I've been here since two weeks after my outfit first went into the lines. That was on November 16th, 1917. Didn't see much of the war, did I? Still, I guess I didn't miss much. No, but you've seen enough of the army. Uh, that's true. I guess I wouldn't mind the war if it wasn't for the army. They'll be sending you home soon, won't they? Guess so. Where are you from? New York, said Andrews. I'm from Cranston, Wisconsin. Do you know that country? It's a great country for lakes. You can canoe for days and without a portage. We have a camp on Big Loon Lake. We used to have some wonderful times there. Lived like wild men. I went for a trip for three weeks once without seeing a house. Ever done much canoeing? Not as much as I'd like to. That's the thing to make you feel fit. First thing you do when you shake out of your blankets is jump in and have a swim. Gee, it's great to swim when the morning mist is still on the water and the sun just strikes the tops of the birch branches. Ever smell bacon cooking? I mean, out in the woods in a frying pan over some sticks of pine and beech wood. Some great old smell, isn't it? And after you've paddled all day and feel tired and sunburned right to the palms of your feet, to sit around the fire with some trout roasting in the ashes and hear the sizzling the bacon makes in the pan? Oh, boy! He stretched his arms wide. God, I'd like to have wrung that damn little parson's neck, said Andrews suddenly. Would you? The legless man turned brown eyes on Andrews with a smile. I guess he's about as much to blame as anybody is, guys like him. I guess they have that kind in Germany, too. You don't think we've made the world quite safe for democracy as it might be? said Andrews in a low voice. Hell, how should I know? I bet you never drove an ice wagon. I did, all one summer down home. It was some life. Got up at three o'clock in the morning and carry a hundred or two hundred pounds of ice into everybody's ice box. That was the life to make a fellow feel fit. I was going around with a big Norwegian named Olaf, who was the strongest man I ever knew, and drink! He was the boy who could drink. I once saw him put away twenty-five dry martini cocktails and swim across the lake on top of it. I used to weigh a hundred and eighty pounds, and he could pick me up with one hand and put me across his shoulder. That was the life to make a fella feel fit. Why, after being out late the night before, we'd jump out of bed at three o'clock feeling springy as a cat. What's he doing now? asked Andrews. He died on the transport coming across here. Died of the flu. I met a fellow came over in his regiment. They dropped him overboard when they were in sight of the Azores. Well, I didn't die of the flu. Have another butt? No, thanks, said Andrews. They were silent. The fire roared in the stove. No one was talking. The men lolled in chairs somnolently. Now and then someone spat. Outside of the window, Andrews could see the soft, white dancing of the snowflakes. His limbs felt very heavy. His mind was permeated with dusty stagnation, like the stagnation of old garrets and lumber rooms, 
where, among superannuated bits of machinery and cracked, grimy crockery, lie heaps of broken toys. John Andrews sat on a bench in a square full of linden trees, with the pale winter sunshine full on his face and hands. He had been looking up through his eyelashes at the sun that was the color of honey, and he let his dazzled glance sink slowly through the black lacework of twigs, down the green trunks of the trees to the bench opposite, where sat two nursemaids, and, between them, a tiny girl with a face daintily colored and lifeless like a doll's face, and a frilled dress under which showed small ivory knees and legs encased in white socks and yellow sandals. Above the halo of her hair floated, with the sun shining through it as through a glass of claret, a bright carmine balloon which the child held by a string. Andrews looked at her for a long time, enraptured by the absurd daintiness of the figure between the big bundles of flesh of the nursemaids. The thought came to him suddenly that months had gone by. Was it only months? Since his hands had touched anything soft since he had seen any flowers. The last was a flower an old woman had given him in a village in the Argonne, an orange marigold, and he remembered how soft the old woman's withered lips had been against his cheek when she had leaned over and kissed him. His mind suddenly lit up as with a strain of music, with the sense of sweetness of quiet lives worn away monotonously in the fields, in the gray little provincial towns in old kitchens full of fragrance of herbs and tang of smoke from the hearth, where there are pots on the window-sill full of basil and flour. Something made him go up to the little girl and take her hand. The child, looking up suddenly and seeing a lanky soldier with pale, lean face and light, straw-colored hair escaping from a cap too small for him, shrieked and let go the string of the balloon which soared slowly into the air, trembling a little in the faint, cool wind that blew. The child wailed dismally, and Andrews, quailing under the furious glances of the nursemaids, stood before her, flushed crimson, stammering apologies, not knowing what to do. The white caps of the nursemaids bent over, and ribbons fluttered about the child's head as they tried to console her. Andrews walked away dejectedly now and then looking up at the balloon which soared, a black speck against the grey and topaz-coloured clouds. Salam Kang, he heard one nursemaid exclaim to the other. But this was the first hour in months he had had free, the first moment of solitude. He must live. Soon he would be sent back to his division. A wave of desire for furious fleshly enjoyments went through him making him want steaming dishes of food drenched in rich, spice-flavored sauces, making him want to get drunk on strong wine, to roll on thick carpets in the arms of naked, libidinous women. He was walking down the quiet gray street of the provincial town with its low houses with red chimney-pots and blue slate roofs and its irregular yellowish cobbles. A clock somewhere was striking four with deep, booming strokes. Andrews laughed. He had to be in hospital at six. Already he was tired. His legs ached. The window of a pastry shop appeared invitingly before him, denuded as it was by wartime. A sign in English said, Tea. Walking in, he sat down in a fussy little parlor where the tables had red cloths, and a print in pinkish and greenish colors, hung in the middle of the imitation brocade paper of each wall. Under a print of a poster bed with curtains in front of which eighteen to twenty people bowed, with the title of Secret d'Amour, sat three young officers, who cast cold, irritated glances at this private with a hospital badge on who invaded their tea shop. Andrews stared back at them, flaming with dull anger. Sipping the hot, fragrant tea, he sat with a blank sheet of music paper before him, listening in spite of himself to what the officers were saying. They were talking about Ronsard. It was with irritated surprise that Andrews heard the name. What right had they to be talking about Ronsard? 
he knew more about Ronsard than they did. Furious, conceited phrases kept surging up in his mind. He was as sensitive, as humane, as intelligent, as well-read as they were. What right had they to the cold, suspicious glance with which they had put him in his place when he had come into the room? Yet that had probably been as unconscious, as unavoidable, as was his own biting envy. The thought that if one of those men should come over to him he would have to stand up and salute and answer humbly, not from civility, but from the fear of being punished, was bitter as wormwood, filled him with a childish desire to prove his worth to them as when older boys had ill-treated him at school and he had prayed to have the house burned down so that he might heroically save them all. There was a piano in an inner room, where in the dark the chairs upside down perched dismally on the table-tops. He almost obeyed an impulse to go in there and start playing, by the brilliance of his playing to force these men who thought of him as a coarse automaton, something between a man and a dog, to recognize him as an equal, a superior. But the war is over, I want to start living. Red wine, streets of the nightingale, cries to the rose, said one of the officers. What do you say we go a while to Paris? Dangerous. Well, what can they do? We are not enlisted men. They can only send us home. That's just what I want. I'll tell you what. We'll go to the Cochon Bleu and have a cocktail and think about it. The lion and the lizard keep their courts there. What the devil was his name? Anyway, we'll glory and drink deep while Major Peabody keeps his court in Dijon to his heart's content. Spurs jingled as the three officers went out. A fierce disgust took possession of John Andrews. He was ashamed of his spiteful irritation. If, when he had been playing the piano to a roomful of friends in New York, a man dressed as a laborer had shambled in, wouldn't he have felt a moment of involuntary scorn? It was inevitable that the fortunate should hate the unfortunate because they feared them. But he was so tired of all those thoughts. Drinking down the last of his tea at a gulp, he went into the shop to ask the old woman, with little black whiskers over her bloodless lips who sat behind the white desk at the end of the counter, if she minded his playing the piano. In the deserted tea-room, among the dismal upturned chairs, his crassened fingers moved stiffly over the keys. He forgot everything else. Locked doors in his mind were swinging wide, revealing forgotten sumptuous halls of his imagination. The Queen of Sheba, grotesque as a satyr, white and flaming with worlds of desire, as the great implacable Aphrodite, stood with her hand on his shoulder sending shivers of warm sweetness rippling through his body, while her voice intoned in his ears all the inexhaustible voluptuousness of life. An asthmatic clock struck somewhere in the obscurity of the room. Seven. John Andrews paid, said good-bye to the old woman with the moustache, and hurried out into the street. Like Cinderella at the ball, he thought. As he went towards the hospital, down faintly lighted streets, his steps got slower and slower. Why go back? a voice kept saying inside him. Anything is better than that. Better throw himself in the river, even, than go back. He could see the olive-drab clothes in a heap among the dry bulrushes on the river bank. He thought of himself crashing naked through the film of ice into water black as Chinese lacquer. And when he climbed out numb and panting on the other side, wouldn't he be able to take up life again as if he had just been born? How strong he would be if he could begin life a second time! How madly, how joyously he would live now that there was no more war! He had reached the door of the hospital. Furious shudders of disgust went through him. He was standing dumbly humble while a sergeant bawled him out for being late. Andrews stared for a long while at the line of shields that supported the dark ceiling beams on the wall opposite his cot. The emblems had been erased, and the grey stone figures that crowded under the shields, the satyr with his shaggy goat's legs, the townsman with his square hat, the warrior with the sword between his legs, 
had been clipped and scratched long ago in other wars. In the strong afternoon light they were so dilapidated he could hardly make them out. He wondered how they had seemed so vivid to him when he had lain in his cot, comforted by their comradeship, while his healing wounds itched and tingled. Still he glanced tenderly at the grey stone figures as he left the ward. Downstairs in the office, where the atmosphere was stuffy with the smell of varnish and dusty papers and cigarette smoke, he waited a long time, shifting his weight restlessly from one foot to the other. "'What do you want?' said a red-haired sergeant, without looking up from the pile of papers on his desk. "'Waiting for travel orders.' "'Aren't you the guy I told to come back at three? "'It is three. "'Hm.' The sergeant kept his eyes fixed on the papers, which rustled as he moved them from one pile to another. In the end of the room a typewriter clicked slowly and jerkily. Andrews could see the dark back of a head between bored shoulders in a woolen shirt leaning over the machine. Beside the cylindrical black stove against the wall, a man with large moustaches and the complicated stripes of a hospital sergeant was reading a novel in a red cover. After a long silence, the red-headed sergeant looked up from his papers and said suddenly, Ted! The man at the typewriter turned slowly round, showing a large red face and blue eyes. Well, he drawled, go and see if the loot has signed them papers yet. The man got up, stretched himself deliberately, and slouched out through a door beside the stove. The red-haired sergeant leaned back in his swivel chair and lit a cigarette. Hell, he said, yawning. The man with the moustache beside the stove let the book slip from his knees to the floor and yawned too. Uh, this goddamn armistice sure does take the ambition out of a fella, he said. Hell of a note, said the red-haired sergeant. Do you know they had my name in for an OTC? Hell of a note going home without a Sam Brown. The other man came back and sank down into his chair in front of the typewriter again. The slow, jerky clicking recommenced. Andrews made a scraping noise with his foot on the ground. "'Well, what about that travel order?' said the red-haired sergeant. "'Loot's out,' said the other man, still typewriting. "'Well, didn't he leave it on his desk?' shouted the red-haired sergeant angrily. "'Couldn't find it.' "'I suppose I've got to go look for it. God!' The red-haired sergeant stamped out of the room. A moment later he came back with a bunch of papers in his hand. Your name Jones? he snapped to Andrews. No. Snivsky? No. Andrews. John. Why the hell couldn't you say so? The man with the mustaches beside the stove got to his feet suddenly. An alert, smiling expression came over his face. Good afternoon, Captain Higginsworth, he said cheerfully. An oval man with a cigar slanting out of his broad mouth came into the room. When he talked, the cigar wobbled in his mouth. He wore greenish kid gloves, very tight for his large hands, and his puttees shone with a dark luster like mahogany. The red-haired sergeant turned round and half saluted. "'Going to another swell party, Captain?' he asked. The captain grinned. "'Say, have you boys got any Red Cross cigarettes? I ain't only got cigars, and you can't hand a cigar to a lady, can you?' The captain grinned again. An appreciative giggle went round. "'Will a couple of packages do you? Because I've got some here,' said the red-haired sergeant, reaching in the drawer of his desk. "'Fine!' The captain slipped them into his pocket and swaggered out, doing up the buttons of his buff-coloured coat. The sergeant settled himself at his desk again with an important smile. "'Did you find the travel order?' asked Andrews timidly. "'I'm supposed to take the train at four two. Can't make it. Did you say your name was Anderson? Andrews. John Andrews. Ah, uh, here it is. Why didn't you come earlier? The sharp air of the ruddy winter evening, sparkling in John Andrews's nostrils, vastly refreshing after the stale odors of the hospital, gave him a sense of liberation. Walking with rapid steps through the grey streets of the town, where in windows lamps already glowed orange, he kept telling himself that another epoch was closed. 
it was with relief that he felt that he would never see the hospital again or any of the people in it he thought of chrisfield it was weeks and weeks since chrisfield had come to his mind at all now it was with a sudden clench of affection that the indiana boy's face rose up before him an oval heavily tanned face with a little of childish roundness about it yet with black eyebrows and long black eyelashes but he did not even know if chrisfield were still alive furious joy took possession of him he john andrews was alive what did it matter if everyone he knew died there were jollier companions than ever he had known to be found in the world cleverer people to talk to more vigorous people to learn from the cold air circulated through his nose and lungs his arms felt strong and supple he could feel the muscles of his legs stretch and contract as he walked while his feet beat jauntily on the irregular cobblestones of the street the waiting-room at the station was cold and stuffy full of a smell of breathed air and unclean uniforms french soldiers wrapped in their long blue coats slept on the benches or stood about in groups eating bread and drinking from their canteens a gas lamp in the centre gave dingy light andrews settled himself in a corner with despairing resignation he had five hours to wait for a train and already his legs ached and he had a side feeling of exhaustion the exhilaration of leaving the hospital and walking free through wine-tinted streets in the sparkling evening air gave way gradually to despair his life would continue to be this slavery of unclean bodies packed together in places where the air had been breathed over and over cogs in the great slow-moving juggernaut of armies what did it matter if the fighting had stopped the armies would go on grinding out lives with lives crushing flesh with flesh would he ever again stand free and solitary to live out joyous hours which would make up for all the boredom of the treadmill he had no hope his life would continue like this dingy ill-smelling waiting-room where men in uniform slept in the field air until they should be ordered out to march or to stand in motionless rows endlessly futilely like toy soldiers a child has forgotten in an attic Andrews got up suddenly and went out on the empty platform. A cold wind blew. Somewhere out in the freight yards an engine puffed loudly, and clouds of white steam drifted through the faintly lighted station. He was walking up and down with his chin sunk into his coat and his hands in his pockets when somebody ran into him. Damn, said a voice, and the figure darted through a grimy glass door that bore the sign, Bouvette. Andrews followed, absent-mindedly. I'm sorry I ran into you. I thought you were an M.P. That's why I beat it. When he spoke, the man, an American private, turned and looked searchingly in Andrews's face. He had very red cheeks and an impudent little brown moustache. He spoke slowly with a faint Bostonian drawl. Oh, that's nothing, said Andrews. Let's have a drink, said the other man. I'm AWOL. Where are you going? To some place near Bar-le-Duc back to my division. Been in hospital. Long? Ah, uh, since October. Gee, have some Kurokoa. It'll do you good. You look pale. My name's Harlow. Ambulance with the French Army. They sat down at an unwashed marble table where the soot from the trains made a pattern sticking to the rings left by wine and liqueur glasses. I'm going to Paris, said Henslow. My leave expired three days ago. I'm going to Paris and get taken ill with peritonitis or double pneumonia, or maybe I'll have a cardiac lesion. The army's a bore. A oh, hospital isn't any better, said Andrews with a sigh, though I shall never forget the night which I realized I was wounded and out of it. I thought I was bad enough to be sent home. Why, I wouldn't have missed a minute of the war. But now that it's over, hell, travel is the password now. I've just had two weeks in the Pyrenees. Nîmes, Arles, Les Baux, Carcassonne, Perpignan, Lourdes, Gavarly, Toulouse. What do you think of that for a trip? What were you in? Infantry. Must have been hell. Bean, it is. 
Why don't you come to Paris with me? I, I don't want to be picked up, stammered Andrews. Not a chance. I know the ropes. All you have to do is keep away from the Olympia and the railway stations, walk fast and keep your shoes shined. And you've got wits, haven't you? Not many. Let's drink a bottle of wine. Isn't there anything to eat to be got here? Not a damn thing, and I daren't go out of the station on account of the MP at the gate. There'll be a diner on the Marseille Express. But I can't go to Paris. Sure. Look, how do you call yourself? John Andrews. Well, John Andrews, all I can say is that you've let him get your goat. Don't give in. Have a good time in spite of him. To hell with him. He brought the bottle down so hard on the table that it broke and the purple wine flowed over the dirty marble and dripped gleaming on the floor. Some French soldiers who stood in a group round the bar turned round. Vlanga qui gaspille le bon vin, said a tall, red-faced man with long, sloping whiskers. Pour vin sous, je mangerai la bouteille, cried a little man, lurching forward and leaning drunkenly over the table. Done, said Henslow. Say, Andrews, he says he'll eat the bottle for a franc. He placed a shining silver franc on the table beside the remnants of the broken bottle. The man seized the neck of the bottle in a black, claw-like hand and gave it a preparatory flourish. He was a cadaverous little man, incredibly dirty, with moustaches and beard of a moth-eaten toe-color, and a purple flush on his cheeks. His uniform was clotted with mud. When the others crowded round him and tried to dissuade him, he said, Mon fou, c'est mon métier and rolled his eyes so that the whites flashed in the dim light like the eyes of a dead codfish. "'Why, he's really going to do it!' cried Henslow. The man's teeth flashed and crunched down on the jagged edge of the glass. There was a terrific crackling noise. He flourished the bottle end again. "'My God, he's eating it!' cried Henslow, roaring with laughter. "'And you're afraid to go to Paris!' An engine rumbled into the station, with a great hiss of escaping steam. Gee, that's the Paris train! Tiens! He pressed the franc into the man's dirt-crusted hand. Come along, Andrews! As they left the bouvette, they heard again the crunching, crackling noise as the man bit another piece off the bottle. Andrews followed Henslow across the steam-filled platform to the door of a first-class carriage. They climbed in. Henslow immediately pulled down the black cloth over the half-globe of the light. The compartment was empty. He threw himself down with a sigh of comfort on the soft, buff-colored cushions of the seat. But, but what on earth? stammered Andrews. Mon fou, c'est mon métier, interrupted Henslow. The train pulled out of the station. End of section 10《Section 11 of Three Soldiers》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by M. B.《Three Soldiers》by John Dos Passos — Section 11 3. Henslow poured wine from a brown earthen crock into the glasses, where it shimmered a bright thin red the color of currants. Andrews leaned back in his chair and looked through half-closed eyes at the table with its white cloth and little burnt umber loaves of bread, and out of the window at the square dimly lit by lemon-yellow gas lamps, and at the dark gables of the little houses that huddled round it. At a table against the wall opposite a lame boy, with white beardless face and gentle violet-colored eyes, sat very close to the bareheaded girl who was with him and who never took her eyes off his face, leaning on his crutch all the while. A stove hummed faintly in the middle of the room, and from the half-open kitchen door came ruddy light and the sound of something frying. On the wall, in brownish colors that seemed to have taken warmth from all the rich scents of food they had absorbed since the day of their painting, were scenes of the boot as it was fancied to have once been, with windmills and wide fields. "'I want to travel,' Henslow was saying, dragging out his words drowsily. 
abyssinia patagonia turkestan the caucasus anywhere and everywhere what do you say you and i go out to new zealand and raise sheep but why not stay here there can't be anywhere as wonderful as this then i'll put off starting for new guinea for a week but hell i'll go crazy staying anywhere after this it's got into my blood all this murder it's made a wanderer of me that's what it's done i'm an adventurer God, I wish it had made me into anything so interesting. Tie a rock onto your scruples and throw them off the pont neuf and set out. Oh, boy, this is the golden age for living by your wits. You're not out of the army yet. I should worry. I'll join the Red Cross. How? Now I've got a tip about it. A girl with an oval face and faint black down on her upper lip brought them soup a thick, greenish-colored soup that steamed richly into their faces. "'If you tell me how I can get out of the army, you'll probably save my life,' said Andrews seriously. Uh, "'There are two ways. Oh, but let me tell you later. Let's talk about something worthwhile. So you write music, do you?' Andrews nodded. An omelette lay between them, pale golden yellow with flecks of green. A few amber bubbles of burnt butter still clustered round the edges. "'Talk about tone poems,' said Henslow. "'But if you are an adventurer and have no scruples, how is it you are still a private?' Henslow took a gulp of wine and laughed uproariously. "'That's the joke!' They ate in silence for a little while. They could hear the couple opposite them talking in low, soft voices. The stove purred, and from the kitchen came a sound of something being beaten in a bowl. Andrews leaned back in his chair. "'This is so wonderfully quiet and mellow,' he said. "'It is so easy to forget that there's any joy at all in life.' "'Rot, it's a circus parade.' "'Have you ever seen anything drearier than a circus parade?' One of those jokes that just aren't funny. Justine, encore du vin, called Henslow. So you know her name? I live here. The boot is the boss on the middle of the shield. It's the axle of the wheel. That's why it's so quiet, like the center of a cyclone, of a vast, whirling, rotary circus parade. Justine, with her red hands that had washed so many dishes, off which other people had dined well, put down before them a scarlet langouste, of which claws and feelers sprawled over the tablecloth that already had a few purplish stains of wine. The sauce was yellow and fluffy like the breast of a canary bird. "'Do you know,' said Andrews suddenly, talking fast and excitedly while he brushed the straggling yellow hair off his forehead, I'd almost be willing to be shot at the end of the year if I could live up here all that time with a piano and a million sheets of music paper. It would be worth it. But this is a place to come back to. Imagine coming back here after the highlands of Tibet where you'd nearly got drowned and scalped and had made love to the daughter of an Afghan chief, who had red lips smeared with lukumi so that the sweet taste stayed in your mouth. Henslow stroked softly his little brown moustache. But what's the use of just seeing and feeling things if you can't express them? What's the use of living at all? For the fun of it, man! Damn ends! But the only profound fun I ever have is that... Andrews's voice broke. Oh, God! I would give up every joy in the world if I could turn out one page that I felt was adequate. Do you know it's years since I've talked to anybody? They both stared silently out of the window at the fog that was packed tightly against it like cotton wool, only softer, and a greenish-gold color. "'The MPs sure won't get us tonight,' said Henslow, banging his fist jauntily on the table. "'I've got a great mind to go to the Rue Saint-Anne and leave my card on the provost marshal.' "'God damn! Do you remember that man who took the bite out of our wine bottle?' He didn't give a hoot in hell, did he? Talk about expression! Why don't you express that? I think that's the turning point of your career. 
That's what made you come to Paris. You can't deny it. They both laughed loudly, rolling about on their chairs. Andrews caught glints of contagion in the pale violet eyes of the lame boy and in the dark eyes of the girl. Let's tell them about it, he said laughing, with his face bloodless after the months in the hospital, suddenly flushed. Salut, said Henslow, turning round and elevating his glass. Nous rions parce que nous sommes gris de vin gris. Then he told them about the man who ate glass. He got to his feet and recounted slowly in his drawling voice with gestures. Justine stood by with a dish full of stuffed tomatoes of which the red skins showed vaguely through a mantle of dark brown sauce. When she smiled, her cheeks puffed out and gave her face a little of the look of a white cat's. "'And you live here?' asked Andrews, after they had all laughed. "'Always. It is not often that I go down to town. It's so difficult. I have a withered leg.' He smiled brilliantly, like a child telling about a new toy. "'And you?' "'How could I be anywhere else?' answered the girl. "'It's a misfortune, but there it is.' She tapped with the crutch on the floor, making a sound like someone walking with it. The boy laughed and tightened his arm round her shoulder. "'I should like to live here,' said Andrews simply. "'Why don't you?' "'But don't you see he's a soldier?' whispered the girl hurriedly. A frown wrinkled the boy's forehead. "'Well, it wasn't by choice, I suppose,' he said. Andrews was silent. Unaccountable shame took possession of him before these people, who had never been soldiers, who would never be soldiers. "'The Greeks used to say,' he said bitterly, using a phrase that had been a long time on his mind, "'that when a man became a slave, on the first day he lost one half of his virtue. "'When a man becomes a slave,' repeated the lame boy softly, "'on the first day he loses one half of his virtue. "'What's the use of virtue? It is love you need,' said the girl. "'I've eaten your tomato, friend Andrews,' said Henslow. "'Justine will get us some more.' He poured out the last of the wine that half filled each of the glasses with its thin sparkle, the color of red currants. Outside the fog had blotted everything out in even darkness, which grew vaguely yellow and red near the sparsely scattered street lamps. Andrews and Henslow felt their way blindly down the long, gleaming flights of steps that led from the quiet darkness of the boot through the confused lights and noises of more crowded streets. The fog caught in their throats and tinkled in their noses and brushed against their cheeks like moist hands. "'Why did we go away from that restaurant?' I'd like to have talked to those people some more, said Andrews. We haven't had any coffee either. But, man, we're in Paris. We're not going to be here long. We can't afford to stay all the time in one place. It's nearly closing time already. The boy was a painter. He said he lived by making toys. He whittles out wooden elephants and camels for Noah's arks. Did you hear that? They were walking fast down a straight, sloping street. Below them already appeared the golden glare of a boulevard. Andrews went on talking, almost to himself. What a wonderful life that would be to live up here in a small room that would overlook the great, rosy expanse of the city. To have some absurd work like that to live on, and to spend all your spare time working and going to concerts. A quiet, mellow existence. Think of my life beside it, slaving in that iron, metallic, brazen New York to write ineptitudes about music in the Sunday paper. God! And this! They were sitting down at a table in a noisy café, full of yellow light flashing in eyes and on glasses and bottles, of red lips crushed against the thin, hard rims of glasses. Wouldn't you just like to rip it off? Andrews jerked at his tunic with both hands where it bulged out over his chest. 
Oh, I'd like to make the buttons fly all over the cafe, smashing the liqueur glasses, snapping in the faces of all those dandified French officers who look so proud of themselves that they survived long enough to be victorious. The coffee's famous here, said Henslow. The only place I ever had it better was at a bistro in Nice on this last permission. <sighs> somewhere else again. That's it. Forever and ever, somewhere else. Let's have some prunelle. Before the war, Prunel. The waiter was a solemn man, with a beard cut like a prime minister's. He came with the bottle held out before him, religiously lifted. His lips pursed with an air of intense application while he poured the white glinting liquid into the glasses. When he had finished, he held the bottle upside down with a tragic gesture. Not a drop came out. It is the end of the good old times, he said. Damnation to the good old times, said Henslow. Here's to the good old new roughhousey circus parades. I wonder how many people they are good for, those circus parades of yours, said Andrews. Where are you going to spend the night, said Henslow. I don't know. I suppose I can find a hotel or something. Why don't you come with me and see Bert? She probably has friends. I want to wander about alone. Not that I scorn Bert's friends, but I'm so greedy for solitude. John Andrews was walking alone down streets full of drifting fog. Now and then a taxi dashed past him and clattered off into the obscurity. Scattered groups of people, their footsteps hollow in the muffling fog, floated about him. He did not care which way he walked, but went on and on crossing large, crowded avenues where the lights embroidered patterns of gold and orange on the fog, rolling in wide, deserted squares, diving into narrow streets where other steps sounded sharply for a second now and then, and faded, leaving nothing in his ears when he stopped still to listen, but the city's distant, muffled breathing. At last he came out along the river, where the fog was densest and coldest, and where he could hear faintly the sound of water gurgling past the piers of bridges. The glow of the lights glared and dimmed, glared and dimmed, as he walked along, and sometimes he could make out the bare branches of trees blurred across the halos of the lamps. The fog caressed him soothingly, and shadows kept flicking past him, giving him glimpses of smooth curves of cheeks and glints of eyes bright from the mist and darkness. Friendly, familiar people seemed to fill the fog just out of his sight. The muffled murmur of the city stirred him like the sound of the voices of friends. From the girl at the crossroads singing under her street lamp to the patrician pulling roses to pieces from the height of her litter, all the imagining of your desire. The murmur of life about him kept forming itself into long, modulated sentences in his ears. Sentences that gave him by their form a sense of quiet well-being, as if he were looking at a low relief of people dancing, carved out of Parian in some workshop in Attica. Once he stopped and leaned for a long while against the moisture-beaded stern of a street lamp. Two shadows defined, as they strolled towards him, into the forms of a pale boy and a bareheaded girl, walking tightly laced in each other's arms. The boy limped a little, and his violet eyes were contracted to wistfulness. John Andrews was suddenly filled with throbbing expectation, as if those two would come up to him and put their hands on his arms and make some revelation of vast import to his life. But when he reached the full glow of the lamp, Andrews saw that he was mistaken. They were not the boy and girl he had talked to on the boot. He walked off hurriedly and plunged again into tortuous streets, where he strode over the cobblestone pavements, stopping now and then to peer through the window of a shop at the light in the rear, where a group of people sat quietly about a table under a light, or into a bar where a tired little boy with heavy eyelids and sleeves rolled up from thin, grey arms was washing glasses, or an old woman, a shapeless bundle of black clothes, was swabbing the floor. From doorways he heard talking and soft laughs. 
upper windows sent yellow rays of light across the fog. In one doorway, the vague light from a lamp bracketed in the wall showed two figures, pressed into one by their close embrace. As Andrews walked past, his heavy army boots, clattering loud on the wet pavement, they lifted their heads slowly. The boy had violet eyes and pale beardless cheeks. The girl was bareheaded and kept her brown eyes fixed on the boy's face. Andrews's heart thumped within him. At last he had found them. He made a step towards them, and then strode on, losing himself fast in the cool, effacing fog. Again he had been mistaken. The fog swirled about him, hiding wistful, friendly faces, hands ready to meet his hands, eyes ready to take fire with his glance, lips cold with the mist, to be crushed under his lips. From the girl at the singing under her street lamp, and he walked on alone through the drifting fog. 4. Andrews left the station reluctantly, shivering in the raw gray mist under which the houses of the village street and the rows of motor trucks and the few figures of French soldiers swathed in long formless coats showed as vague dark blurs in the confused dawnlight. His body felt flushed and sticky from a night spent huddled in the warm, fetid air of an overcrowded compartment. He yawned and stretched himself, and stood irresolutely in the middle of the street with his pack biting into his shoulders. Out of sight, behind the dark mass in which a few ruddy lights glowed of the station buildings, the engine whistled and the train clanked off into the distance. Andrews listened to its faint reverberation through the mist with a sick feeling of despair. It was the train that had brought him from Paris back to his division. As he stood shivering in the grey mist, he remembered the curious, despairing reluctance he used to suffer when he went back to boarding school after a holiday. How he used to go from the station to the school by the longest road possible, taking frantic account of every moment of liberty left him. Today his feet had the same leaden reluctance as when they used to all but refuse to take him up the long sandy hill to the school. He wandered aimlessly for a while about the silent village, hoping to find a café where he could sit for a few minutes to take a last look at himself before plunging again into the groveling promiscuity of the army. Not a light showed. All the shutters of the shabby little brick and plaster houses were closed. With dull, springless steps he walked down the road they had pointed out to him from the RTO. Overhead the sky was brightening, giving the mist that clung to the earth in every direction ruddy, billowing outlines. The frozen road gave out a faint, hard resonance under his footsteps. Occasionally the silhouette of a tree by the roadside loomed up in the mist ahead, its uppermost branches clear and ruddy with sunlight. Andrews was telling himself that the war was over, and that in a few months he would be free in any case. What did a few months more or less matter? But the same thoughts were swept recklessly away in a blind panic that was like a stampede of wild steers within him. There was no arguing. His spirit was contorted with revolt, so that his flesh twitched and dark splotches danced before his eyes. He wondered vaguely whether he had gone mad. Enormous plans kept rising up out of the tumult of his mind and dissolving suddenly like smoke in a high wind. He would run away and, if they caught him, kill himself. He would start a mutiny in his company. He would lash all these men to frenzy by his words, so that they too should refuse to form into guns, so that they should laugh when the officers got red in the face shouting orders at them so that the whole division should march off over the frosty hills, without arms, without flags, calling all the men of all the armies to join them, to march on singing, to laugh the nightmare out of their blood. Would not some lightning flash of vision sear people's consciousness into life again? What was the good of stopping the war if the armies continued? But that was just rhetoric. His mind was flooding itself with rhetoric that it might keep its sanity. 
His mind was squeezing out rhetoric like a sponge that he might not see dry madness face to face. And all the while his hard footsteps along the frozen road beat in his ears, bringing him nearer to the village where his division was quartered. He was climbing a long hill. The mist thinned about him and became brilliant with sunlight. Then he was walking in the full sun over the crest of a hill with pale blue sky above his head. Beyond him and before him were mist-filled valleys, and beyond other ranges of long hills, with reddish-violet patches of woodland glowing faintly in the sunlight. In the valley at his feet he could see, in the shadows of the hill he stood on, a church tower and a few roofs rising out of the mist, as out of water. Among the houses bugles were blowing mess call. The jauntiness of the brassy notes ringing up through the silence was agony to him. How long the day would be! He looked at his watch. It was seven-thirty. How did they come to be having mess so late? The mist seemed doubly cold and dark when he was buried in it again after his moment of sunlight. The sweat was chilled on his face, and streaks of cold went through his clothes, soaked from the effort of carrying the pack. In the village street, Andrews met a man he did not know and asked him where the office was. The man, who was chewing something, pointed silently to a house with green shutters on the opposite side of the street. At a desk sat Crisfield smoking a cigarette. When he jumped up, Andrews noticed that he had a corporal's two stripes on his arm. "'Hello, Andy!' They shook hands warmly. "'Are you all right now, old boy?' "'Sure. I'm fine,' said Andrews. A sudden constraint fell upon them. "'That's good,' said Crisfield. "'You're a corporal now. Congratulations.' Mm "'Mm-hmm. Made me more'n a month ago.' They were silent. Crisfield sat down in his chair again. "'What sort of a town is this?' "'It's a hell-hole, this dump is, a hell-hole.' "'That's nice.' "'Going to move soon, tell me. Army occupation.' But I had not to have told you that. Don't tell any of the fellows. Where's the outfit quartered? You won't know it. We've got fifteen new men. No account, all of them. Second draft men. Civilians in the town? You bet. Come with me, Andy, and I'll tell them to give you some grub at the cook shack. No, wait a minute and you'll miss the hike. Hikes every day since the goddamn armistice. They sent out a general order telling him to double up on the drill. They heard a voice shouting orders outside, and the narrow street filled up suddenly with the sound of boots beating the ground in unison. Andrews kept his back to the window. Something in his legs seemed to be tramping in time with the other legs. "'There they go,' said Crisfield. "'Loot's with him today. "'Want some grub? "'If it ain't been punk since the armistice.' The Y-hut was empty and dark. Through the grimy window panes could be seen fields and a leaden sky full of heavy ochreous light, in which the leafless trees and the fields full of stubble were different shades of dead grayish brown. Andrews sat at the piano without playing. He was thinking how once he had thought to express all the cramped boredom of this life. The thwarted limbs regimented together lashed into straight lines, the monotony of servitude. Unconsciously as he thought of it, the fingers of one hand sought a chord, which jangled in the badly tuned piano. "'God, how silly!' he muttered aloud, pulling his hands away. Suddenly he began to play snatches of things he knew, distorting them, willfully mutating the rhythm, mixing into them snatches of ragtime. The piano jangled under his hands, filling the empty hut with clamor. He stopped suddenly letting his fingers slide from bass to treble, and began to play in earnest. There was a cough behind him that had an artificial, discreet ring to it. He went on playing without turning round. Then a voice said, "'Beautiful, beautiful!' Andrews turned round to find himself staring into a face of vaguely triangular shape with a wide forehead and prominent eyelids over protruding brown eyes. The man wore a Y.M.C.A. uniform which was very tight for him, 
so that there were creases running from each button across the front of his tunic. Oh, do go on playing. It's years since I heard any Debussy. It wasn't Debussy. Oh, it wasn't? Anyway, it was just lovely. Do go on. I'll just stand here and listen. Andrews went on playing for a moment, made a mistake, started over, made the same mistake, banged on the keys with his fist and turned round again. I can't play, he said peevishly. Oh, you can, my boy, you can! Where did you learn? I would give a million dollars to play like that if I had it. Andrews glared at him silently. You are one of the men just back from hospital, I presume? Yes, worse luck. Oh, I don't blame you. These French towns are the dullest places. Though I just love France, don't you? The Y man had a faintly whining voice. Anywhere is dull in the army. Look, we must get to know each other real well. My name's Spencer Sheffield, Spencer B. Sheffield, and between you and me there's not a soul in the division you can talk to. It's dreadful not to have intellectual people about one. I suppose you're from New York. Andrews nodded. Mm-hmm, so am I. You've probably read some of my things in Vain Endeavor. What? You've never read Vain Endeavor? I guess you don't go round with the intellectual set. Most people often don't. Of course, I don't mean the village. All anarchists and society women there. I've never gone around with any set, and I never... Uh, never mind, we'll fix that when we get back to New York. And now you just sit down at that piano and play me Debussy's arabesque. I know you love it just as much as I do. But first, what's your name? Andrews. Folks come from Virginia? Yes, Andrews got to his feet. Then you're related to the Pendletons. I may be related to the Kaiser, for all I know. The Pendletons, that's it. You see, my mother was a Miss Spencer from Spencer Falls, Virginia, and her mother was a Miss Pendleton. So you and I are cousins. Now, isn't that a coincidence? Distant cousins. But I must go back to the barracks. Come and see me any time, Spencer B. Sheffield shouted after him. You know where, back of the shack, and knock twice so I'll know it's you. Outside the house where he was quartered, Andrews met the new top sergeant, a lean man with spectacles and a little moustache of the color and texture of a scrubbing brush. Here's a letter for you, the top sergeant said. Better look at the new KP list I've just posted. The letter was from Henslow. Andrews read it with a smile of pleasure in the faint afternoon light, remembering Henslow's constant drawling talk about distant places he had never been to, and the man who had eaten glass, and the day and a half in Paris. Andy, the letter began, I've got the dope at last. Courses begin in Paris, February 15th. Apply at once to your CO to study something at University of Paris. Any amount of lies will go. Apply all pull possible via sergeants, lieutenants, and their mistresses and laundresses. Yours, Henslow. His heart thumping, Andrews ran after the sergeant, passing, in his excitement, a lieutenant without saluting him. Look here, snarled the lieutenant. Andrews saluted and stood stiffly at attention. Why didn't you salute me? I, I was in a hurry, sir, and didn't see you. I was going on very urgent company business, sir. Remember that just because the armistice is signed, you needn't think you're out of the army. At ease. Andrews saluted. The lieutenant saluted, turned swiftly on his heel, and walked away. Andrews caught up to the sergeant. Sergeant Coffin, can I speak to you a minute? I'm in a hell of a hurry. Have you heard anything about this Army Students Corps to send men to universities here in France? Something the YMCA is getting up. Can't be for enlisted men. No, I ain't heard a word about it. Do you want to go to school again? If I get a chance. To finish my course. College man, are you? So am I. Well, I'll let you know if I get any general order about it. Can't do anything without getting a general order about it. Looks to me like it's all a bushwa. I guess you're right. The street was gray-dark. Stung by a sense of impotence, surging with despairing rebelliousness, 
Andrews hurried back towards the buildings where the company was quartered. He would be late for mess. The grey street was deserted. From a window here and there, ruddy light streamed out to make a glowing oblong on the wall of a house opposite. God damn it! if you don't believe me, go ask the lieutenant. Look here, Toby, didn't our outfit see hotter work than any goddamn engineers? Toby had just stepped into the cafe, a tall man with a brown bulldog face and a scar on his left cheek. He spoke rarely and solemnly, with a Maine Coast Yankee twang. I reckon so, was all he said. He sat down on the bench beside the other man, who went on bitterly. I guess you would reckon so. Hell, man, you ditch diggers ain't in it. Ditch diggers? The engineer banged his fist down on the table. His lean, pickled face was a furious red. I guess we don't dig half so many ditches as the infantry does, and when we've dug em we don't crawl into em and stay there like goddamn cotton-tailed jackrabbits. You guys don't get near enough to the front. Like goddamn cotton-tailed jackrabbits, shouted the pickle-faced engineer again roaring with laughter. Ain't that so? He looked round the room for approval. The benches at the two long tables were filled with infantrymen who looked at him angrily. Noticing suddenly that he had no support, he moderated his voice. The infantry's damn necessary, I'll admit that. But where do you fellows be without us guys to string the barbed wire for you? There weren't no barbed wire strung in the Oregon forest where we was, boy. What do you want barbed wire when you're advancing for? Look here, I'll bet you a bottle of cognac my company had more losses than yourn did. Check em up, Joe, said Toby, suddenly showing an interest in the conversation. All right, it's a go. We had fifteen killed and twenty wounded, announced the engineer triumphantly. How badly wounded. What's that to you? Hand over the cognac? Like hell. We had fifteen killed and twenty wounded, too, didn't we, Toby? I reckon you're right, said Toby. Ain't I right? asked the other man, addressing the company generally. Sure, goddamn right, muttered voices. Well, I guess it's all off, then, said the engineer. No, it ain't, said Toby. Reckon up your wounded. The feller who's got the worst wounded takes the cognac. Ain't that fair? Sure. We've had seven fellers sent home already, said the engineer. We've had eight, ain't we? Sure, growled everybody in the room. How bad was they? Two of em was blind, said Toby. Hell, said the engineer, jumping to his feet as if taking a trick at poker. We had a guy who was sent home without arms nor legs, and three fellers got TB from being gassed. John Andrews had been sitting in a corner of the room. He got up. Something had made him think of the man he had known in the hospital, who had said that was the life to make a fellow feel fit. Getting up at three o'clock in the morning, he jumped out of bed just like a cat. He remembered how the olive-drab trousers had dangled, empty from the man's chair. That's nothing. One of our sergeants had to have a new nose grafted on. The village street was dark and deeply rutted with mud. Andrews wandered up and down aimlessly. There was only one other café. That would be just like this one. He couldn't go back to the desolate barn where he slept. It would be too early to go to sleep. A cold wind blew down the street and the sky was full of vague movement of dark clouds. The partly frozen mud clotted about his feet as he walked along. He could feel the water penetrating his shoes. Opposite the YMCA hut at the end of the street, he stopped. After a moment's indecision, he gave a little laugh and walked round to the back where the door of the Y-man's room was. He knocked twice, half hoping there would be no reply. Sheffield's whining, high-pitched voice said, Who is it? Andrews. Come right in. You're just the man I wanted to see. Andrews stood with his hand on the knob. Do sit down and make yourself right at home. Spencer Sheffield was sitting at a little desk in a room with walls of unplaned boards and one small window. Behind the desk were piles of cracker boxes and cardboard cases of cigarettes, and in the midst of them a little opening like that of a railway ticket office, 
in the wall through which the y man sold his commodities to the long lines of men who would stand for hours waiting meekly in the room beyond andrews was looking round for a chair oh i just forgot i'm sitting in the only chair said spencer sheffield laughing twisting his small mouth into a shape like a camel's mouth and rolling about his large protruding eyes oh that's all right what i wanted to ask you was do you know anything about look do you come into my room interrupted sheffield i've got such a nice sitting-room with an open fire just next to lieutenant bleezer and there we'll talk about everything i'm just dying to talk to somebody about the things of the spirit do you know anything about a scheme for sending enlisted men to french universities men who have not finished their courses oh wouldn't that be just fine i tell you boy there's nothing like the u s government to think of things like that but have you heard anything about it no but i surely shall do you mind switching the light off that's it now just follow me oh i do need a rest i've been working dreadfully hard since that knights of columbus man came down here isn't it hateful the way they try to run down the y now we can have a nice long talk you must tell me all about yourself but you really don't know anything about that university scheme they say it begins february fifteenth andrews said in a low voice i'll ask lieutenant bleezer if he knows anything about it said sheffield soothingly throwing an arm around andrews's shoulder and pushing him in the door ahead of him they went through a dark hall to a little room where a fire burned brilliantly in the hearth lighting up with tongues of red and yellow a square black walnut table with two heavy armchairs with leather backs and bottoms that shone like lacquer. This is wonderful, said Andrews involuntarily. Romantic, I call it. Makes you think of Dickens, doesn't it? And Locksley Hall. Yes, said Andrews vaguely. Have you been in France long? asked Andrews, settling himself in one of the chairs and looking into the dancing flames of the log fire. Will you smoke? he handed Sheffield a crumpled cigarette. No, thanks. I only smoke special kinds. I have a weak heart. That's why I was rejected from the army. Oh, but I think it was superb of you to join as a private. It was my dream to do that, to be one of the nameless marching throng. I think it was damn foolish not to say criminal, said Andrews sullenly, still staring into the fire. You can't mean that. Or do you mean that you think you had abilities which would have been worth more to your country in another position? I have many friends who felt that no i don't think it's right of a man to go back on himself i don't think butchering people ever does any good i have acted as if i did think it did good out of carelessness or cowardice one or the other that i think bad you mustn't talk that way said sheffield hurriedly so you're a musician are you he asked the question with a jaunty confidential air i used to play the piano a little if that's what you mean said andrews music has never been the art i had most interest in but many things have moved me intensely debussy and those beautiful little things of nevins you must know them poetry has been more my field when i was young younger than you are quite a lad oh if only we could stay young i am thirty-two i don't see that youth by itself is worth much it's the most superb medium there is though for other things said andrews well i must go he said if you do hear anything about that university scheme you will let me know won't you indeed i shall dear boy indeed i shall they shook hands in jerky dramatic fashion and andrews stumbled down the dark hall to the door when he stood out in the raw night air again he drew a deep breath by the light that streamed out from a window he looked at his watch there was time to go to the regimental sergeant major's office before tattoo at the opposite end of the village street from the Y.M.C.A. hut was a cube-shaped house, set a little apart from the rest in the middle of a broad lawn, which the constant crossing and recrossing of a staff of cars and trains of motor-trucks had turned into a muddy morass in which the wheel-tracks criss-crossed in every direction. A narrow boardwalk led from the main road to the door. In the middle of this walk, Andrews met a captain, and automatically got off into the mud and saluted. The regimental office was a large room that had once been decorated by wan and ill-drawn mural paintings in the manner of Puvis de Chavannes, 
but the walls had been so chipped and soiled by five years of military occupation that they were barely recognizable. Only a few bits of bare flesh and floating drapery showed here and there above the maps and notices that were tacked on the walls. At the end of the room a group of nymphs in Nile green and pastel blue could be seen emerging from under a French war loan poster. The ceiling was adorned with an oval of flowers and little plaster cupids in low relief, which had also suffered and in places showed the laths. The office was nearly empty. The littered desks and silent typewriters gave a strange air of desolation to the gutted drawing-room. Andrews walked boldly to the furthest desk, where a little red card leaning against the typewriter said, Regimental Sergeant Major. Behind the desk, crouched over a heap of typewritten reports, sat a little man with scanty, sandy hair, who fixed up his eyes and smiled when Andrews approached the desk. "'Well, did you fix it up for me?' he asked. "'Fix what?' said Andrews. "'Oh, I thought you were someone else.' The smile left the regimental sergeant major's thin lips. "'What do you want?' "'Why, regimental sergeant major, can you tell me anything about a scheme to send enlisted men to colleges over here? Can you tell me who to apply to?' "'According to what general orders? And who told you to come and see me about it anyway?' "'Have you heard anything about it?' "'No, nothing definite. I'm busy now, anyway. Ask one of your own non-coms to find out about it.' He crouched once more over the papers. Andrews was walking towards the door, flushing with annoyance, when he saw that the man at the desk by the window was jerking his head in a peculiar manner, just in the direction of the regimental sergeant-major, and then towards the door. Andrews smiled at him and nodded. Outside the door, where an orderly sat on a bench reading a torn Saturday evening post, Andrews waited. The hall was part of what must have been a ballroom, for it had a much scarred hardwood floor and big spaces of bare plaster framed by gilt and lavender-colored moldings, which had probably held tapestries. The partition of unplaned boards that formed other offices cut off the major part of a highly decorated ceiling, where cupids with crimson-daubed bottoms swam in all attitudes in a sea of pink and blue and lavender-colored clouds, wreathing themselves coyly in heavy garlands of waxy hothouse flowers, while cornucopias spilling out squishy fruits gave Andrews a feeling of distinct insecurity as he looked up from below. "'Say, are you a Kappa Mu? Andrews looked down suddenly and saw in front of him the man who had signaled to him in the regimental sergeant major's office. "'Are you a Kappa Mu? he asked again. "'No, not that I know of,' stammered Andrews, puzzled. "'What school did you go to?' "'Harvard.' "'Harvard. Guess we haven't got a chapter there. I'm from Northwestern. Anyway, you want to go to school in France here if you can. So do I. Don't you want to come and have a drink?' The man frowned, pulled his overseas cap down over his forehead where the hair grew very low, and looked about him mysteriously. "'Yes,' he said. They splashed together down the muddy village street. We've got thirteen minutes before tattoo. My name's Walters. What's yours? He spoke in a low voice in short staccato phrases. Andrews. Andrews, you've got to keep this dark. If everybody finds out about it, we're through. It's a shame you're not a Kappa Mu, but college men have got to stick together. That's the way I look at it. Oh, I'll keep it dark enough, said Andrews. It's too good to be true. The general order isn't out yet, but I've seen a preliminary circular. What school do you want to go to? Sorbonne, Paris. That's the stuff. Do you know the back room at Baboon's? Walters turned suddenly to the left up an alley and broke through a hole in a hawthorn hedge. A guy's got to keep his eyes and ears open if he wants to get anywhere in this army, he said. As they ducked in the back door of a cottage, Andrews caught a glimpse of a billowy line of a tile roof against the lighter darkness of the sky. They sat down on a bench built into a chimney, where a few sticks made a splutter of flames. Monsieur Désir, a red-faced girl with a baby in her arms, came up to them. That's Babette. Baboon, I call her, said Walters with a laugh. Chocolat, said Walters. That'll suit me all right. It's my treat, remember. I'm not forgetting it. 
Now, let's get to business. What you do is this. You write an application. I'll make that out for you on the typewriter tomorrow, and you meet me here at eight tomorrow night, and I'll give it to you. You sign it at once and hand it in to your sergeant, see? This will just be a preliminary application. When the order's out, you'll have to make another. The woman, this time without the baby, appeared out of the darkness of the room with a candle and two cracked bowls from which steam rose, faint primrose color in the candlelight. Walters drank his bowl down at a gulp, grunted, and went on talking. Give me a cigarette, will you? You'll have to make it out darn soon, too, because once the order's out, every son of a gun in the division will be making out to be a college man. How did you get your tip? From a fellow in Paris. You've been to Paris, have you? said Walters admiringly. Is it the way they say it is? Gee, these French are immoral. Look at this woman here. She'll sleep with a fellow soon as not. Got a baby, too. But who do the applications go into? To the colonel, or whoever he appoints to handle it. You a Catholic? No. Neither am I. That's the hell of it. The regimental sergeant major is. Well? I guess you haven't noticed the way things run up at divisional headquarters. It's a regular cathedral. Isn't a mason in it. But I must beat it. Better pretend you don't know me if you meet me on the street, see? All right. Walters hurried out of the door. Andrews sat alone, looking at the flutter of little flames about the pile of sticks on the hearth, while he sipped chocolate from the warm bowl held between the palms of both hands. He remembered a speech out of some very bad romantic play he had heard when he was very small. About your head I fling the curse of Rome. He started to laugh, sliding back and forth on the smooth bench which had been polished by the breeches of generations warming their feet at the fire. The red-faced woman stood with her hands on her hips, looking at him in astonishment while he laughed and laughed. Mais quel gaieté! Mais quel gaieté! she kept saying. The straw under him rustled faintly with every sleepy movement Andrews made in his blankets. In a minute the bugle was going to blow, and he was going to jump out of his blankets, throw on his clothes, and fall into line for roll call in the black mud of the village street. It couldn't be that only a month had gone by since he had got back from hospital. No, he had spent a lifetime in this village being dragged out of his warm blankets every morning by the bugle, shivering as he stood in line for roll call shuffling in a line that moved slowly past the cook-shack, shuffling along in another line to throw what was left of his food into garbage cans, to wash his mess-kit in the greasy water a hundred other men had washed their mess-kits in, lining up to drill to march on along muddy roads, spattered by the endless trains of motor-trucks, lining up twice more for mess, and at last being forced by another bugle into his blankets again to sleep heavily, while a smell hung in his nostrils of sweating, woolen clothing, and breathed out air and dusty blankets. In a minute the bugle was going to blow to snatch him out of even these miserable thoughts, and throw him into an automaton under other men's orders. Childish, spiteful desires surged into his mind. If the bugler would only die! He could picture him, a little man with a broad face and putty-colored cheeks, a small rusty mustache and bow-legs, lying like a calf on a marble slab in a butcher's shop on top of his blankets. What nonsense! There were other buglers. He wondered how many buglers there were in the army. He could picture them all, in dirty little villages, in stone barracks, in towns, in great camps that served the country for miles with rows of black warehouses and narrow barrack buildings, standing with their feet a little apart, giving their little brass bugles a preliminary tap before putting out their cheeks and blowing in them, and stealing a million and a half, or was it two million or three million, lives, and throwing the warm, sentient bodies into coarse automatons, who must be kept busy lest they grow restive, till killing time began again. The bugle blew with the last jaunty notes. A stir went through the barn. Corporal Christfield stood on the ladder that led up from the yard, his head on a level with the floor, shouting, Shake it up, fellas! If a guy is late to roll call, it's K.P. for a week! As Andrews, while buttoning his tunic, passed him on the ladder, he whispered, Tell me we're going to see service again, Andy. Army occupation. While he stood stiffly at attention, waiting to answer when the sergeant called his name, Andrews's mind was whirling in crazy circles of anxiety. 
what if they should leave before the general order came on the university plan the application would certainly be lost in the confusion of moving the division and he would be condemned to keep up this life for more dreary weeks and months would any years of work and happiness in some future existence make up for the humiliating agony of this servitude dismissed he ran up the ladder to fetch his mess kit and in a few minutes was in line again in the rutted village street where the grey houses were just forming outlines as light crept slowly into the leaden sky while a faint odour of bacon and coffee came to him making him eager for food eager to drown his thoughts in the heaviness of swiftly eaten greasy food and in the warmth of watery coffee gulped down out of a tin curved cup he was telling himself desperately that he must do something that he must make an effort to save himself that he must fight against the deadening routine that numbed him later while he was sweeping the rough board floor of the company's quarters the theme came to him which had come to him long ago in a former incarnation it seemed when he was smearing windows with soap from a gritty sponge along the endless side of the barracks in the training camp time and time again in the past year he had thought of it and dreamed of weaving it into a fabric of sound which would express the trudging monotony of days bowed under the yoke under the yoke that would be a title for it he imagined the sharp tap of the conductor's baton the silence of a crowded hall the first notes rasping bitterly upon the tense ears of men and women but as he tried to concentrate his mind on the music other things intruded upon it blurred it he kept feeling the rhythm of the queen of sheba slipping from the shoulders of her gaudily caparisoned elephant advancing towards him through the moonlight putting her hand fantastic with rings and long gilded fingernails upon his shoulders so that ripples of delight at all the voluptuous images of his desire went through his whole body making it quiver like a flame with yearning for unimaginable things it all muddled into fantastic gibberish into sounds of horns and trombones and double basses blown off key while a piccolo shrilled the first bars of the star-spangled banner he stopped sweeping and looked about him dazedly he was alone outside he heard a sharp voice call attention he ran down the ladder and fell in at the end of the line under the angry glare of the lieutenant's small eyes which were placed very close together on either side of a lean nose black and hard like the eyes of a crab the company marched off through the mud to the drill field after retreat andrews knocked at the door at the back of the y m c a but as there was no reply he strode off with a long determined stride to sheffield's room in the moment that elapsed between his knock and an answer he could feel his heart thumping a little sweat broke out on his temples why what's the matter boy you look all wrought up said sheffield holding the door half open and blocking with his lean form entrance to the room may i come in i want to talk to you said andrews oh i suppose it'll be all right you see i have an officer with me then there was a flutter in sheffield's voice oh do come in he went on with sudden enthusiasm lieutenant bleezer is fond of music too lieutenant this is the boy i was telling you about you must get him to play for us if he had the opportunities i am sure he'd be a famous musician Lieutenant Bleezer was a dark youth, with a hooked nose and a pince-nez. His tunic was unbuttoned, and he held a cigar in his hand. He smiled, in an evident attempt to put this enlisted man at his ease. "'Yes, I'm very fond of music, modern music,' he said, leaning against the mantelpiece. "'Are you a musician by profession?' "'Not exactly. Nearly.' Andrews thrust his hands into the bottoms of his trouser pockets and looked from one to the other with a certain defiance. "'I suppose you've played in some orchestra. How is it you are not in the regimental band?' "'No, except the Pyrrhon.' "'The Pyrrhon? Were you at Harvard?' Andrews nodded. "'So was I.' "'Isn't that a coincidence?' said Sheffield. "'I'm so glad I just insisted on your coming in.' "'What year were you?' said Lieutenant Bleezer with a faint change of tone, drawing a finger along his scant black moustache. Fifteen. I haven't graduated yet, said the lieutenant with a laugh. 
what i wanted to ask you mr sheffield oh my boy my boy you know you've known me long enough to call me spence broke in sheffield i want to know went on andrews speaking slowly can you help me to get put on the list to be sent to the university of paris i know that a list has been made out although the general order has not come yet i am disliked by most of the non-coms and i don't see how i can get on without somebody's help i simply can't go this life any longer andrews closed his lips firmly and looked at the ground his face flushing well a man of your attainment certainly ought to go said lieutenant bleezer with a faint tremor of hesitation in his voice i'm going to oxford myself trust me my boy said sheffield i'll fix it up for you i promise let's shake hands on it he seized andrews's hand and pressed it warmly in a moist palm if it's within human power within human power he added well, I must go, said Lieutenant Bleezer, suddenly striding to the door. I promised the Marquise I'd drop in. Goodbye. Take a cigar, won't you? He held out three cigars in the direction of Andrews. No, thank you. Oh, don't you think the old aristocracy of France is just too wonderful? Lieutenant Bleezer goes almost every evening to call on the Marquise de Rompemouville. He says she is just too spiritual for words. He often meets the commanding officer there. Andrews had dropped into a chair and sat with his face buried in his hands, looking through his fingers at the fire, where a few white fingers of flame were clutching intermittently at a grey beech log. His mind was searching desperately for expedients. He got to his feet and shouted shrilly, "'I can't go this life any more, do you hear that? No possible future is worth all this. If I can get to Paris, all right. If not, I'll desert and damn the consequences.' but I've already promised I'll do all I can. Well, do it now, interrupted Andrews brutally. All right, I'll go and see the colonel and tell him what a great musician you are. Let's go together now. But that'll look queer, dear boy. I don't give a damn. Come along. You can talk to him. You seem to be thick with all the officers. You must wait till I tidy up, said Sheffield. All right. Andrews strode up and down in the mud in front of the house snapping his fingers with impatience, until Sheffield came out. Then they walked off in silence. "'Now wait outside a minute,' whispered Sheffield when they came to the white house with bare grapevines over the front where the colonel lived. After a wait, Andrews found himself at the door of a brilliantly lighted drawing-room. There was a dense smell of cigar smoke. The colonel, an elderly man with a benevolent beard, stood before him with a coffee cup in his hand. Andrews saluted punctiliously. They tell me you're quite a pianist. Sorry I didn't know it before, said the colonel in a kindly tone. You want to go to Paris to study under this new scheme? Yes, sir. What a shame I didn't know before. The list of the men going is all made out. Of course, perhaps at the last minute, if somebody else doesn't go, your name can go in. The colonel smiled graciously and turned back into the room. Thank you, colonel, said Andrews, saluting. Without a word to Sheffield, he strode off down the dark village street towards his quarters. Andrews stood on the broad village street, where the mud was nearly dry, and a wind streaked with warmth ruffled the few puddles. He was looking into the window of the café to see if there was anyone he knew inside, from whom he could borrow money for a drink. It was two months since he had had any pay, and his pockets were empty. The sun had just set on a premature spring afternoon flooding the sky and the grey houses and the tumultuous tiled roofs with warm violet light. The faint premonition of the stirring of life in the cold earth that came to Andrews with every breath he drew of the sparkling wind stung his dull boredom to fury. It was the first of March, he was telling himself over and over again. The 15th of February he had expected to be in Paris, free, or half free, at least able to work, it was the first of March, and here he was still helpless, still tied to the monotonous wheel of routine, incapable of any real effort, spending his spare time wandering like a lost dog up and down the muddy street, from the YMCA hut at one end of the village to the church and the fountain in the middle, and to the divisional headquarters at the other end, then back again, looking listlessly into windows, staring in people's faces without seeing them. 
he had given up all hope of being sent to Paris. He had given up thinking about it or about anything. The same dull irritation of despair droned constantly in his head, grinding round and round like a broken phonograph record. After looking a long while in the window of the café of the Brave Allier, he walked a little down the street and stood in the same position, staring into the Repos du Poilu, where a large sign, American spoken, blocked up half the window. Two officers passed. His hand snapped up to the salute automatically like a mechanical signal. It was nearly dark. After a while he began to feel serious coolness in the wind, shivered, and started to wander aimlessly down the street. He recognized Walters coming towards him, and was going to pass him without speaking when Walters bumped into him, muttered in his ear, Come to baboons, and hurried off with his swift business-like stride. Andrews stood irresolutely for a while with his head bent, then went with unresilient steps up the alley, through the hole into the hedge, and into Babette's kitchen. There was no fire. He stared morosely at the grey ashes until he heard Walters's voice beside him. "'I've got you all fixed up. What do you mean?' "'Mean? Are you asleep, Andrews? They've cut a name off the school list, that's all. Now if you shake a leg and somebody doesn't get in ahead of you, you'll be in Paris before you know it. That's damn decent of you to come and tell me.' "'Here's your application,' said Walters, drawing a paper out of his pocket. "'Take it to the colonel. Get him to OK it, and then rush it up to the sergeant major's office yourself. They're making out travel orders now. So long.' Walters had vanished. Andrews was alone again, staring at the grey ashes. Suddenly he jumped to his feet and hurried off towards headquarters. In the anteroom to the colonel's office he waited a long while, looking at his boots that were thickly coated with mud. Those boots will make a bad impression, those boots will make a bad impression, a voice was saying over and over again inside of him. A lieutenant was also waiting to see the colonel, a young man with pink cheeks and a milky white forehead, who held his hat in one hand with a pair of khaki-colored kid gloves, and kept passing a hand over his light, well-brushed hair. Andrews felt dirty and ill-smelling in his badly-fitting uniform. The sight of this perfect young man in his whipcord breeches, with his manicured nails and immaculately polished puttees, exasperated him. He would have liked to fight him, to prove that he was the better man, to outwit him, to make him forget his rank and his important air. The lieutenant had gone in to see the colonel. Andrews found himself reading a chart of some sort tacked up on the wall. There were names and dates and figures, but he could not make out what it was about. "'All right, go ahead,' whispered the orderly to him, and he was standing with his cap in his hand before the colonel, who was looking at him severely, fingering the papers he had on the desk with a heavily veined hand. Andrews saluted. The colonel made an impatient gesture. "'May I speak to you, colonel, about the school scheme? I suppose you've got permission from somebody to come to me?' Uh, "'No, sir.' Andrews's mind was struggling to find something to say. Well, you'd better go and get it. But, Colonel, there isn't time. The travel orders are being made out at this minute. I've heard that there's been a name crossed out on the list. Too late. But, Colonel, you don't know how important it is. I'm a musician by trade. If I can't get into practice again before being demobilized, I shan't be able to get a job. I have a mother and an old aunt dependent on me. My family has seen better days, you see, sir. It's only by being high up in my profession that I can earn enough to give them what they are accustomed to. And a man in your position in the world, Colonel, must know what even a few months of study in Paris mean to a pianist. The Colonel smiled. Let's see your application, he said. Andrews handed it to him with a trembling hand. The Colonel made a few marks on one corner with a pencil. Now, if you can get that to the sergeant major in time to have your name included in the orders, well and good. Andrews saluted and hurried out. A sudden feeling of nausea came over him. He was hardly able to control a mad desire to tear the paper up. The sons of bitches, the sons of bitches, he muttered to himself. Still, he ran all the way to the square, isolated building where the regimental office was. He stood panting in front of the desk that bore the little red card, Regimental Sergeant Major. The Regimental Sergeant Major looked up at him inquiringly. 
Here is an application for school at the Sorbonne, Sergeant. Colonel Wilkins told me to run up to you with it. Said he was very anxious to have it go at once. Too late, said the regimental sergeant major. But the colonel said it had to go in. Can't help it. Too late, said the regimental sergeant major. Andrews felt the room and the men in their olive drab shirt sleeves and the typewriters and the three nymphs creeping from behind the French war loan poster whirl round his head. Suddenly he heard a voice behind him. Is the name Andrews? John, Sarge? How the hell should I know, said the regimental sergeant major. Because I've got it in the orders already. I don't know how it got in. The voice was Walters's voice, staccato and businesslike. Well, then why do you want to bother me about it? Give me that paper. The regimental sergeant major jerked the paper out of Andrews's hand and looked at it savagely. All right, you leave tomorrow. A copy of the orders will go to your company in the morning, growled the regimental sergeant major. Andrews looked hard at Walters as he went out, but got no glance in return. When he stood in the air again, disgust surged up within him, bitterer than before. The fury of his humiliation made tears start in his eyes. He walked away from the village down the main road, splashing carelessly through the puddles, slipping in the wet clay of the ditches. Something within him, like the voice of a wounded man swearing, was winding in his head long strings of filthy names. After walking a long while, he stopped suddenly with his fists clenched. It was completely dark. The sky was faintly marbled by a moon behind the clouds. On both sides of the road rose the tall, grey skeletons of poplars. When the sound of his footsteps stopped, he heard a faint lisp of running water. Standing still in the middle of the road, he felt his feelings gradually relax. He said aloud in a low voice several times, You are a damn fool, John Andrews and started walking slowly and thoughtfully back to the village. End of section 11。section 12 of Three Soldiers。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。recording by M.B. Three Soldiers by John Dos Passos Section 12 5 Andrews felt an arm put round his shoulder. "'I've been looking to hell and gone for you, Andy,' said Chrisfield's voice in his ear, jerking him out of the reverie he had walked in. He could feel in his face Chrisfield's breath, heavy with cognac. "'I'm going to Paris tomorrow, Chris,' said Andrews. "'I know it, boy, I know it. That's why I was that right smart to talk to you. You don't want to go to Paris. Why don't you come up to Germany with us? Tell me they live like kings up there. All right, said Andrews. Let's go to the back room at Babette's. Chrisfield hung on his shoulder, walking unsteadily beside him. At the hole in the hedge, Chrisfield stumbled and nearly pulled them both down. They laughed, and still laughing, staggered into the dark kitchen where they found the red-faced woman with her baby, sitting beside the fire with no other light than the flicker of the rare flames that shot up from a little mass of wood embers. The baby started crying shrilly when the two soldiers stamped in. The woman got up and, talking automatically to the baby all the while, went off to get a light and wine. Andrews looked at Chrisfield's face by the firelight. His cheeks had lost the faint, childish roundness they had had when Andrews had first talked to him, sweeping up cigarette butts off the walk in front of the barracks at the training camp. "'I tell you, boy, you ought to come with us to Germany. Nothing but whores in Paris. The trouble is, Chris, that I don't want to live like a king or a sergeant or a major general. I want to live like John Andrews. What are you going to do in Paris, Andy?' "'Study music.' I guess some day I'll go into a movie show, and when they turn on the lights, who'll I see but my old friend Andy ragging the scales on the piano? <laughs> Something like that. How do you like being a corporal, Chris? Oh, I don't know. Chrisfield spat on the floor between his feet. It's funny, ain't it? You and me was right smart friends once. Guess it's being a non-com. 
Andrews did not answer. Chrisfield sat silent with his eyes on the fire. Well, I got him. God, it was easy, he said suddenly. What do you mean? I got him, that's all. You mean? Chrisfield nodded. Mm Mm-hmm, in the Oregon forest, he said. Andrews said nothing. He felt suddenly very tired. He thought of the men he had seen in attitudes of death. I wouldn't have thought it had been so easy, said Chrisfield. The woman came through the door at the end of the kitchen with a candle in her hand. Chrisfield stopped speaking suddenly. Tomorrow I'm going to Paris, cried Andrews boisterously. It's the end of soldiering for me. I bet it'll be some sport in Germany, Andy. Sarge says we'll be going up to Coab... What's his name? Koblenz. Chrisfield poured a glass of wine out and drank it off, smacking his lips after it and wiping his mouth on the back of his hand. Do you remember, Andy, we was both of us brushing cigarette butts at that bloody training camp when we first met up with each other? Considerable water has run under the bridge since then. I reckon we won't meet up again, most likely. Hell, why not? They were both silent again, staring at the fading embers of the fire. In the dim edge of the candlelight, the woman stood with her hands on her hips, looking at them fixedly. Reckon a fellow wouldn't know what to do with himself if he did get out of the army. Now would he, Andy? So long, Chris. I'm beating it, said Andrews in a harsh voice, jumping to his feet. So long, Andy, old man. I'll pay for the drinks. Chrisfield was beckoning with his hand to the red-faced woman, who advanced slowly through the candlelight. Thanks, Chris. Andrews strode away from the door. A cold, needle-like rain was falling. He pulled up his coat collar and ran down the muddy village street towards his quarters. 6. In the opposite corner of the compartment, Andrews could see Walters, hunched up in an attitude of sleep, with his cap pulled down far over his eyes. His mouth was open, and his head wagged with the jolting of the train. The shade over the light plunged the compartment into dark blue obscurity, which made the night sky outside the window and the shapes of trees and houses evolving and pirouetting as they glided by seem very near. Andrews felt no desire to sleep. He had sat a long time leaning his head against the frame of the window, looking out at the fleeting shadows and the occasional little red-green lights that darted by, and the glow of the stations that flared for a moment and were lost in dark silhouettes of unlighted houses and skeleton trees and black hillsides. He was thinking how all the epochs in his life seemed to have been marked out by railway rides at night. The jolting rumble of the wheels made the blood go faster through his veins, made him feel acutely the clattering of the train along the gleaming rails spurning fields and trees and houses, piling up miles and miles between the past and future. The gusts of cold night air when he opened the window, and the faint whiffs of steam and coal gas that tingled in his nostrils, excited him like a smile on a strange face seen for a moment in a crowded street. He did not think of what he had left behind. He was straining his eyes eagerly through the darkness, towards the vivid life he was going to live. Boredom and abasement were over. He was free to work and hear music and make friends. He drew deep breaths. Warm waves of vigor seemed flowing constantly from his lungs and throat to his fingertips and down through his body and the muscles of his legs. He looked at his watch. One. In six hours he would be in Paris. For six hours he would sit there looking out at the fleeting shadows of the countryside, feeling in his blood the eager throb of the train, rejoicing in every mile the train carried him away from things past. Walters still slept, slipping off the seat, with his mouth open and his overcoat bundled round his head. Andrews looked out of the window, feeling in his nostrils the tingle of steam and coal gas. A phrase out of some translation of the Iliad came to his head. Ambrosial night, night ambrosial unending. But 
better than sitting round a camp-fire drinking wine and water and listening to the boastful yarns of long-haired Achaeans, was this hustling through the countryside, away from the monotonous whine of past unhappiness, towards joyousness and life. Andrews began to think of the men he had left behind. They were asleep at this time of night, in barns and barracks, or else standing on guard with cold, damp feet and cold hands which the icy rifle-barrel burned when they tended it. He might go far away out of sound of the tramp of marching, away from the smell of overcrowded barracks where men slept in rows like cattle, but he would still be one of them. He would not see an officer pass him without an unconscious movement of servility. He would not hear a bugle without feeling sick with hatred. If he could only express these thwarted lives, the miserable dullness of industrialized slaughter, it might have been almost worth while for him. For the others, it would never be worth while. But you're talking as if you were out of the woods. You're a soldier still, John Andrews. The words formed themselves in his mind as vividly as if he had spoken them. He smiled bitterly and settled himself again to watch silhouettes of trees and hedges and houses and hillsides fleeing against the dark sky. When he awoke, the sky was grey. The train was moving slowly, clattering loudly over switches, through a town of wet slate roofs that rose in fantastic patterns of shadow above the blue mist. Walters was smoking a cigarette. "'God, these French trains are rotten,' he said when he noticed that Andrews was awake. "'The most inefficient country I ever was in, anyway.' "'Inefficiency be damned!' broke in Andrews, jumping up and stretching himself. He opened the window. "'The heating's too damned efficient. I think we're near Paris.' The cold air, with a flavor of mist in it, poured into the stuffy compartment. Every breath was joy. Andrews felt a crazy buoyancy bubbling up in him. The rumbling clatter of the train wheels sang in his ears. He threw himself on his back on the dusty blue seat and kicked his heels in the air like a colt. "'Liven up, for God's sake, man!' he shouted. "'We're getting near Paris!' "'We are lucky bastards,' said Walters, grinning, with the cigarette hanging out of the corner of his mouth. "'I'm going to see if I can find the rest of the gang.' Andrews, alone in his compartment, found himself singing at the top of his lungs. As the day brightened, the mist lifted off the flat, linden-green fields intersected by rows of leafless poplars. Salmon-colored houses with blue roofs wore already a faintly citified air. They passed brick kilns and clay quarries, with reddish puddles of water in the bottom of them, crossed a jade-green river where a long file of canal boats with bright paint on their prows moved slowly. The engine whistled shrilly. They clattered through a small freight yard, and rows of suburban houses began to form, at first chaotically in broad patches of garden land, and then in orderly ranks with streets between them and shops at the corners. A dark grey dripping wall rose up suddenly and blotted out the view. The train slowed down, and went through several stations crowded with people on their way to work. Ordinary people in varied clothes, with only here and there a blue or khaki uniform. Then there was more dark grey wall, and the obscurity of wide bridges, under which dusty oil lamps burned orange and red, making a gleam on the wet wall above them, and where the wheels clanged loudly. More freight yards, and the train pulled slowly past other trains full of faces and silhouettes of people to stop with a jerk in a station. And Andrews was standing on the grey cement platform, sniffing smells of lumber and merchandise and steam. His ungainly pack and blanket roll he carried on his shoulder like a cross. He had left his rifle and cartridge belt carefully tucked out of sight under the seat. Walters and five other men straggled along the platform towards him, carrying or dragging their packs. There was a look of apprehension on Walters's face. "'Well, what do we do now?' he said. "'Do!' cried Andrews, and burst out laughing. Prostrate bodies, in olive drab, 
hid the patch of tender green grass by the roadside. The company was resting. Crisfield sat on a stump, morosely whittling at a stick with a pocket knife. Judkins was stretched out beside him. What the hell do they make us do this damn hiking for, Corp? Guess they're a skeered will forget how to walk. Well, ain't it better than loafing around your billets all day, thinking and cursing and wishing you was home? Spoke up the man who sat the other side, pounding down the tobacco in his pipe with a thick forefinger. It makes me sick, tramping round this way in ranks all day with the goddamn frogs staring at us and... They're laughing at us, I bet, broke in another voice. We'll be moving soon to the army occupation, said Crisfield cheerfully. In Germany it'll be a regular picnic. And you know what that means? burst out Judkins, sitting bolt upright. Do you know how long the troops is going to stay in Germany? Fifteen years. God, they couldn't keep us there that long, man. They can do anything they goddamn please with us. We're the guys as is getting the raw end of this deal. It ain't the same with an educated guy like Andrews or Sergeant Coffin or them. They can suck around after Y men and officers and get on the inside track. And all we can do is stand up and salute and say, Yes, Lieutenant, or No, Lieutenant, and let them ride us all they goddamn please. Ain't that the gospel truth, Corporal? I guess you're right, Judkey. We gets the raw end of the stick. That damn yeller dog Andrews goes to Paris and gets schoolin' for free and all that. Hell, Andy warn't yeller, Judkins. Well, why did he go belly aching around all the time like he knew more than the lieutenant did? I reckon he did, said Crisfield. Anyway, you can't say that those guys who went to Paris did a goddamn thing more than any of the rest of us did. God, I ain't even had a leave yet. Well, it ain't no use crabbing. No, once we get home and folks know the way we've been treated, there'll be a great old investigation, I can tell you that, said one of the new men. It makes you mad, though, to have something like that put over on you. Think of them guys in Paris having a hell of a time with wine and women, and we stay out here and clean our guns and drill. God, I'd like to get even with some of them guys. The whistle blew. The patch of grass became unbroken green again as the men lined up along the side of the road. Fall in, called the sergeant. Attention. Right dress. Front. God, you guys haven't got no snap in you. Stick your belly in, you. You know better than to stand like that. Squads right. March. Hep, hep, hep. The company tramped off along the muddy road. Their steps were all the same length. Their arms swung in the same rhythm. Their faces were cowed into the same expression. Their thoughts were the same. The tramp, tramp of their steps died away along the road. Birds were sitting among the budding trees. The young grass by the roadside kept the marks of the soldiers' bodies. Part 5 The World Outside 1. Andrews and six other men from his division sat at a table outside the café opposite the Garde Leste. He leaned back in his chair with a cup of coffee lifted, looking across it at the stone houses with many balconies. Steam, scented of milk and coffee, rose from the cup as he sipped it. His ears were full of a rumble of traffic and a clacking of heels as people walked briskly by along the damp pavements. For a while he did not hear what the men he was sitting with were saying. They talked and laughed, but he looked beyond their khaki uniforms and their boat-shaped hats unconsciously. He was taken up with the smell of the coffee and of the mist. A little rusty sunshine shone on the table of the café and on the thin varnish of wet mud that covered the asphalt pavement. Looking down the avenue, away from the station, the houses, dark grey tending to greenish in the shadow and to violet in the sun, faded into a soft haze of distance. Dull gilt lettering glittered along black balconies. In the foreground were men and women walking briskly, their cheeks whipped a little into color by the rawness of the morning. The sky was a faintly roseate gray. Walters was speaking. The first thing I want to see is the Eiffel Tower. 
why do you want to see that said the small sergeant with a black moustache and rings round his eyes like a monkey why man don't you know that everything begins from the eiffel tower if it weren't for the eiffel tower there wouldn't be any skyscrapers well how about the flatiron building and the brooklyn bridge they were built before the eiffel tower weren't they interrupted the man from new york the eiffel tower is the first piece of complete girder construction in the whole world reiterated walters dogmatically first thing i'm going to do is go to the foley bird jairs me for the w w's better lay off the wild women bill said walters i ain't going to look at a woman said the sergeant with the black moustache i guess i've seen enough women in my time anyway uh, the war's over anyway you just wait kid till you fasten your lamps on a real parisienne said a burly unshaven man with the corporal's stripes on his arm roaring with laughter andrews lost track of the talk again staring dreamily through half-closed eyes down the long straight street where greens and violets and browns merged into a bluish-gray monochrome at a little distance he wanted to be alone to wander at random through the city to stare dreamily at people and things to talk by chance to men and women to sink his life into the misty sparkling life of the streets the smell of the mist brought a memory to his mind for a long while he groped for it until suddenly he remembered his dinner with henslow and the faces of the boy and girl he had talked to on the boot he must find henslow at once a second's fierce resentment went through him against all these people about him christ he must get away from them all his freedom had been hard enough won he must enjoy it to the uttermost say i'm going to stick to you andy walters's voice broke into his reverie i'm going to appoint you the corps of interpreters andrews laughed uh, do you know the way to the school headquarters the rto said take the subway i'm going to walk said andrews you'll get lost won't you no danger worse luck said andrews getting to his feet i'll see you fellows at the school headquarters whatever those are so long say andy i'll wait for you there walters called after him andrews darted down a side street he could hardly keep from shouting aloud when he found himself alone free with days and days ahead of him to work and think gradually to rid his limbs of the stiff attitudes of the automaton the smell of the streets and the mist indefinably poignant rose like incense smoke in fantastic spirals through his brain making him hungry and dazzled making his arms and legs feel lithe and as ready for delight as a crouching cat for a spring his heavy shoes beat out a dance as they clattered on the wet pavements under his springy steps he was walking very fast stopping suddenly now and then to look at the greens and oranges and crimsons of vegetables in a pushcart to catch a vista down intricate streets to look into the rich brown obscurity of a small wine shop where a workman stood at the counter sipping white wine oval delicate faces bearded faces of men slightly gaunt faces of young women red cheeks of boys wrinkled faces of old women whose ugliness seemed to have hidden in it stirringly all the beauty of youth and the tragedy of lives that had been lived the faces of the people he passed moved him like rhythms of an orchestra after much walking turning always down the street which looked pleasantest he came to an oval with a statue of a pompous personage on a ramping horse place des victoires he read the name which gave him a faint tinge of amusement he looked quizzically at the heroic features of the sun king and walked off laughing i suppose they did it better in those days the grand manner he muttered and his delight redoubled in rubbing shoulders with the people whose effigies would never appear astride ramping-eared horses in squares built to commemorate victories he came out on a broad straight avenue where there were many american officers he had to salute and m p s and shops with wide plate-glass windows full of objects that had a shiny expensive look another case of victories he thought as he went off into a side street taking with him a glimpse of the bluish-gray pile of the opera, 
with its pompous windows and its naked bronze ladies holding lamps. He was in a narrow street full of hotels and fashionable barber shops, from which came an odor of cosmopolitan perfumery, of casinos and balloons and diplomatic receptions, when he noticed an American officer coming towards him, reeling a little. A tall, elderly man with a red face and a bottle nose. He saluted. The officer stopped still, swaying from side to side, and said in a whining voice, "'Shawnee, do you know where Henry's bar is?' "'No, I don't, Major,' said Andrews, who felt himself enveloped in an odor of cocktails. "'You'll help me to find it, Shawnee, won't you? It's dreadful not to be able to find it. I've got to meet Lieutenant Trevor's in Henry's bar.' The Major steadied himself by putting a hand on Andrews's shoulder. A civilian passed them. Didonk shouted the major after him. Didonk, mon cher, où est Henry's bar? The men walked on without answering. Now isn't that just like a frog not to understand his own language? said the major. But there's Henry's bar, right across the street, said Andrews suddenly. Bong, bong, said the major. They crossed the street and went in. At the bar, the Major, still clinging to Andrew's shoulder, whispered in his ear, I'm AWOL, she? She? Whole damn air service is AWOL. Have a drink with me. You enlisted man? Nobody cares here. War's over, sonny. Democracy is safe for the world. Andrews was just raising a champagne cocktail to his lips looking with amusement at the crowd of American officers and civilians who crowded into the small mahogany barroom, when a voice behind him drawled out, I'll be damned. Andrews turned and saw Henslow's brown face and small silky moustache. He abandoned his major to his fate. God, I'm glad to see you. I was afraid you hadn't been able to work it out, said Henslow slowly, stuttering a little. I am crazy. I'm about crazy, Henny, with delight. I just got in a couple of hours ago. Laughing, interrupting each other, they chattered in broken sentences. But how in the name of everything did you get here? With the Major, said Andrews, laughing. What the devil? Yes, that Major, whispered Andrews in his friend's ear. Rather the worse for wear. Asked me to lead him to Henry's bar and just fed me a cocktail in the memory of democracy late defunct. But what are you doing here? It's not exactly exotic. I came to see a man who was going to tell me how I could get to Romania with the Red Cross. But that can wait. Let's get out of here. God, I was afraid you hadn't made it. I had to crawl on my belly and lick people's boots to do it. God, it was low. But here I am. They were out on the street again, walking and gesticulating. But, libertad, libertad, allow ma femme, as Walt Whitman would have said, shouted Andrews. Ah, oh, but it's one grand and glorious feeling. I've been here three days. My section's gone home, God bless them. But what do you have to do? Do? Nothing, cried Henslow. Not a blooming bloody goddamn thing. In fact, it's no use trying. The whole thing is such a mess you couldn't do anything if you wanted to. I want to go and talk to people at the Scola Cantorum. Uh, there'll be time for that. You'll never make anything out of music if you get serious-minded about it. Uh, then, last but not least, I've got to get some money from somewhere. Now you're talking! Henslow pulled a burnt leather pocketbook out of the inside of his tunic. Monaco, he said tapping the pocket-book, which was engraved with a pattern of dull red flowers. He pursed his lips and pulled out some hundred-franc notes, which he pushed into Andrews's hand. Uh, "'Give me one of them,' said Andrews. Uh, "'All or none. They last about five minutes each.' "'But it's so damn much to pay back.' "'Pay it back? Heavens! Here, take it and stop your talking. I probably won't have it again.' So you'd better make hay this time. I warn you, it'll be spent by the end of the week. <sighs> All right. 
I'm dead with hunger. Let's go sit down on the boulevard and think about where we'll have lunch to celebrate Miss Libertad. Oh, but let's not call her that. Sounds like Liverpool, Andy, a horrid place. How about Freiheit? said Andrews as they sat down in basket chairs in the reddish-yellow sunlight. Treasonable! Off with your head! But think of it, man, said Andrews. The butchery's over, and you and I and everybody else will soon be human beings again. Human. All too human. No more than eighteen wars going, muttered Henslow. I haven't seen any papers for an age. How do you mean? People are fighting to beat the cats everywhere except on the western front, said Henslow. But that's where I come in. The Red Cross sends supply trains to keep them at it. I'm going to Russia if I can work it. But how about the Sorbonne? Oh, the Sorbonne can go to Ballyhack. But, Henny, I'm going to croak on your hands if you don't take me somewhere to get some food. Do you want a solemn place with red plush or with salmon pink brocade? Why have a solemn place at all? Because solemnity and good food go together. It's only a religious restaurant that has a proper devotion to the belly. No, oh, I, I know. We'll go over to Brooklyn. Where? To the Reeve Gauche. I know a man who insists on calling it Brooklyn. Awfully funny man. Never been sober in his life. You must meet him. Oh, I want to. It's a dog's age since I met anyone new, except you. I can't live without having a variegated crowd about, can you? You've got that right on this boulevard. Serbs, French, English, Americans, Australians, Romanians, Czechoslovaks. God, is there any uniform that isn't here? I tell you, Andy, the war's been a great thing for the people who knew how to take advantage of it. Just look at their patties. I guess they'll know how to make a good thing of the peace, too. Oh, that's going to be the best yet. Come along. Let's be little devils and take a taxi. This certainly is the main street of Cosmopolis. They threaded their way through the crowd, full of uniforms and glitter and bright colors that moved in two streams, up and down the wide sidewalk between the cafes and the boles of the bare trees. They climbed into a taxi and lurched fast through the streets where, in the misty sunlight, gray-green and gray-violet mingled with blues and pale lights as the colors mingle in a pigeon's breast feathers. They passed the leafless gardens of the Tuileries on one side, and the great inner courts of the Louvre, with their purple mansard roofs and their high chimneys on the other, and saw for a second the river, dull jade green, and the plane trees splotched with brown and cream color along the quay, before they were lost in the narrow brownish-gray streets of the old quarters. This is Paris. That was Cosmopolis said Henslow. I'm not particular just at present, cried Andrews gaily. The square in front of the Odeon was a splash of white, and the colonnade a blur of darkness as the cab swerved round the corner and along the edge of the Luxembourg, where, through the black iron fence, many brown and reddish colors in the intricate patterns of leafless twigs opened here and there on statues and balustrades and vistas of misty distances. The cab stopped with a jerk. This is the Place des Medicis, said Henslow. At the end of a slanting street, looking very flat through the haze, was the Dome of the Pantheon. In the middle of the square, between the yellow trams and the green low buses, was a quiet pool, where the shadow of horizontals of the house fronts was reflected. They sat beside the window, looking out at the square. Henslow ordered. Remember how sentimental history books used to talk about prisoners who were let out after years in dungeons not being able to stand it and going back to their cells? Do you like Saumonier? Anything, or rather, everything. But take it from me, that's all rubbish. Honestly, I don't think I've ever been happier in my life. Do you know, Henslow, there's something in you that is afraid to be happy. Oh, don't be morbid. There's only one real evil in the world, being somewhere without being able to get away. I ordered beer. This is the only place in Paris where it's fit to drink. 
and I'm going to every bloomin' concert. Cologne La Marue on Sunday, I know that. The only evil in the world is not being able to hear music or make it. These oysters are fit for Lucullus. Why not say fit for John Andrews and Bob Henslow, damn it? Why the ghosts of poor old dead Romans should be dragged in every time a man eats an oyster, I don't see. We're as fine specimens as they were. I swear I shan't let any old turn to clay Lucullus outlive me, even if I've never eaten a lamprey. And why should you eat a lamp, chimney, Bob? came a hoarse voice beside them. Andrews looked up into the round white face with large gray eyes hidden behind thick steel-rimmed spectacles. Except for the eyes, the face had a vaguely Chinese air. Hello, Heinz. Mr. Andrews, Mr. Heineman, said Henslow. Glad to meet you, said Heineman in a jovially hoarse voice. You guys seem to be overeating, to reckon by the way things are piled up on the table. Through the hoarseness, Andrews could detect a faint Yankee twang in Heineman's voice. You'd better sit down and help us, said Henslow. Sure. Do you know my name for this guy? He turned to Andrews. Sinbad. Sinbad was bad in Tokyo and Rome, in bad in Trinidad, and twice as bad at home. He sang the words loudly, waving a breadstick to keep time. Shut up, Heinz, or you'll get us run out of here the way you got us run out of the Olympia that night. They both laughed. And do you remember Monsieur Legui with his coat? Do I? God! They laughed till the tears ran down their cheeks. Heineman took off his glasses and wiped them. He turned to Andrews. Oh, Paris is the best yet. First absurdity? the peace conference and its 999 branches second absurdity spies third american officers a wall fourth the seven sisters sworn to slay he broke out laughing again his chunky body rolling about on the chair what are they three of them have sworn to slay sinbad and four of them have sworn to slay me but that's too complicated to tell at lunchtime Eighth, there are the Lady Relievers, Sinbad's specialty. Ninth, there's Sinbad. Ah, oh, shut up, Heinz, you're getting me maudlin, spluttered Henslow. Oh, Sinbad was in bad all around, chanted Heineman. But no one's given me anything to drink, he said suddenly in a petulant voice. Garçon une bouteille de macon pour un cadet de Gascogne. Oh, what's next? It ends with Vergon. You've seen the play, haven't you? Greatest play going. Seen it twice sober and seven other times. Cyrano de Bergerac? Ah, uh, that's it. Nous sommes le cadet de Gascon. Uh, rhymes with Yvron and songs vergon. You see, I work in the Red Cross. You know, Sinbad, old Peterson's a brick. I'm supposed to be taking photographs of tubercular children at this minute. The noblest of my professions is that of artistic photographer borrowed the photographs from the Ricketts man, so I have nothing to do for three months and five hundred francs travelling expenses. Oh, children, my only prayer is, give us this day our red workers' permit, and the Red Cross does the rest. Heineman laughed till the glasses rang on the table. He took off his glasses and wiped them with a rueful air. So now I call the Red Cross the cadets, cried Heineman, his voice a thin shriek from laughter. Andrews was drinking his coffee in little sips, looking out the window at the people that passed. An old woman with a stand of flowers sat on a small cane chair at the corner. The pink and yellow and blue-violet shades of the flowers seemed to intensify the misty straw color and azured gray of the wintry sun and shadow of the streets. A girl in a tight-fitting black dress and black hat stopped at the stand to buy a bunch of pale yellow daisies, and then walked slowly past the window of the restaurant in the direction of the gardens. Her ivory face and slender body and her very dark eyes sent a sudden flush through Andrews's whole frame as he looked at her. The black, erect figure disappeared in the gate of the gardens. Andrews got to his feet suddenly. I have to go, he said in a strange voice. I just remember a man was waiting for me at the school headquarters. 
Oh, let him wait. Why, you haven't had a liqueur yet, cried Heinemann. No, but where can I meet you people later? Café de Rouen at five, opposite the Palais Royal? You'll never find it. Yes, I will, said Andrews. Palais Royal Metro Station, they shouted after him as he dashed out of the door. He hurried into the gardens. Many people sat on benches in the frail sunlight. Children in bright-colored clothes ran about chasing hoops. A woman paraded a bunch of toy balloons in carmine and green and purple, like a huge bunch of party-colored grapes inverted above her head. Andrews walked up and down the alleys, scanning faces. The girl had disappeared. He leaned against a gray balustrade and looked down into the empty pond where traces of the explosion of a Bertha still subsisted. He was telling himself that he was a fool, that even if he had found her, he could not have spoken to her. Just because he was free for a day or two from the army, he needn't think that the age of gold had come back to earth. Smiling at the thought, he walked across the gardens, wandered through some streets of old houses in grey and white stucco with slate mansard roofs and faint complications of chimney-pots, till he came out in front of a church with a new classic façade of huge columns that seemed toppling by their own weight. He asked a woman selling newspapers what the church's name was. Mais monsieur, c'est sans soupice, said the woman in a surprised tone. Sans soupice. Manon's songs came to his head, and the sentimental melancholy of eighteenth-century Paris, with its gambling houses in the Palais Royal, where people dishonored themselves in the presence of their stern Cotonian fathers, and its billets doux written at little gilt tables, and its coaches lumbering in covered with mud from the provinces through the Port d'Orléans and the Port de Versailles. The Paris of Diderot and Voltaire and Jean-Jacques, with its muddy streets and its ordinaries where one ate bisques and larded pullets and souffles, a Paris full of muddy gilt magnificence, full of pompous ennui of the past and insane hope of the future. He walked down a narrow, smoky street, full of antique shops and old bookshops, and came out unexpectedly on the river opposite the statue of Voltaire. The name on the corner was Quai Malaquais. Andrews crossed and looked down for a long time at the river. Opposite, behind a lacework of leafless trees, were the purplish roofs of the Louvre, with their high peaks and their ranks and ranks of chimneys. Behind him the old houses of the quay, and the wing, topped by a balustrade with great stone urns, of a domed building of which he did not know the name. Barges were coming upstream, the dense green water spuming under their blunt bows, towed by a little black tugboat with its chimney bent back to pass under the bridges. The tug gave a thin, shrill whistle. Andrew started walking downstream. He crossed by the bridge at the corner of the Louvre, turned his back on the arch Napoleon had built to receive the famous horses from St. Marks, a pinkish pastry-like affair, and walked through the Tuileries, which were full of people strolling about or sitting in the sun, of doll-like children and nursemaids with elaborate white caps, of fluffy little dogs straining at the ends of leashes. Suddenly a peaceful sleepiness came over him. He sat down in the sun on a bench, watching, hardly seeing them, the people who passed to and fro casting long shadows. Voices and laughter came very softly to his ears above the distant stridency of the traffic. From far away he heard for a few moments notes of a military band playing a march. The shadows of the trees were faint blue-gray in the ruddy yellow gravel. Shadows of people kept passing and repassing across them. He felt very languid and happy. Suddenly he started up. He had been dozing. He asked an old man with a beautifully pointed white beard the way to Rue du Faubourg saint honore After losing his way a couple of times, he walked listlessly up some marble steps where a great many men in khaki were talking. Leaning against the doorpost was Walters. 
As he drew near, Andrews heard him saying to the man next to him, Why, the Eiffel Tower was the first piece of complete girder construction ever built. That's the first thing a fellow who's wide awake ought to see. Tell me the Opry's the grandest thing to look at, said the man next it. If there's wine and women there, me for it. And don't forget the song. But that isn't interesting like the Eiffel Tower is, persisted Walters. S say, Walters, I hope you haven't been waiting for me, stammered Andrews. No, I've been waiting in line to see the guy about courses. I want to start this thing right. I guess I'll see them tomorrow, said Andrews. Say, have you done anything about a room, Andy? Let's you and me be bunkies. All right, but maybe you don't want to room where I do, Walters. Where's that? In the Latin Quarter? You bet. I want to see some French life while I'm about it. Well, it's too late to get a room today. I'm going to the Y tonight, anyway. I'll get a fellow I know to put me up. Then tomorrow we'll see. Well, so long, said Andrews, moving away. Wait, I'm coming with you. We'll walk around town together. All right, said Andrews. The rabbit was rather formless, very fluffy, and had a glance of madness in its pink eye with a black center. It hopped like a sparrow along the pavement, emitting a rubber tube from its back which went up to a bulb in a man's hand, which the man pressed to make the rabbit hop. Yet the rabbit had an air of organic completeness. Andrews laughed inordinately when he first saw it. The vendor, who had a basketful of other such rabbits on his arm, saw Andrews laughing and drew timidly near to the table. He had a pink face with little sensitive lips rather like a real rabbit's, and large frightened eyes of a wan brown. "'Do you make them yourself?' asked Andrews, smiling. The man dropped his rabbit on the table with a negligent air. "'Oh, oui, monsieur, d'après la nature.' He made the rabbit turn a somersault by suddenly pressing the bulb hard. Andrews laughed, and the rabbit-man laughed. "'Think of a big, strong man making his living that way,' said Walters, disgusted. "'I do it all, de matière première au profit de la caporeur,' said the rabbit-man. "'Hello, Andy. Late as hell. I'm sorry,' said Henslow, dropping down into a chair beside them. Andrews introduced Walters. The rabbit-man took off his hat, bowed to the company, and went off making the rabbit hop before him along the edge of the curbstone. "'What's happened to Heinemann?' "'Here he comes now,' said Henslow. An open cab had driven up to the curb in front of the café. In it sat Heinemann, with a broad grin on his face, and beside him a woman in a salmon-coloured dress, ermine furs, and an emerald green hat. The cab drove off, and Heinemann, still grinning, walked up to the table. "'Where's the lion cub?' asked Henslow. "'They say it's got pneumonia.' "'Mr. Heineman, Mr. Walters.' The grin left Heineman's face. He said, "'How do you do?' curtly, cast a furious glance at Andrews, and settled himself in a chair. The sun had set. The sky was full of lilac and bright purple and carmine. Among the deep blue shadows, lights were coming on, primrose-colored street lamps, violet arc lamps, ruddy sheets of light poured out of shop windows. "'Let's go inside. I'm cold as hell,' said Heinemann crossly, and they filed in through the revolving door, followed by a waiter with their drinks. "'I've been in the Red Cross all afternoon, Andy. I think I am going to work that Romania business. Want to come?' said Henslow in Andrews's ear. "'If I can get hold of a piano and some lessons and the concerts keep up, you won't be able to keep me away from Paris with wild horses.' "'No, sir, I want to see what Paris is like. It's going to my head so. It'll be weeks before I know what I think about it.' "'Don't think about it. Drink,' growled Heinemann, scowling savagely. "'That's two things I'm going to keep away from in Paris.' Drink and women, and you can't have one without the other, said Walters. True enough, you sure do need them both, said Heinemann. Andrews was not listening to their talk. 
twirling the stem of his glass of vermouth in his fingers, he was thinking of the Queen of Sheba, slipping down from the shoulders of her elephant, glistening fantastically with jewels in the light of crackling, resinous torches. Music was seeping up through his mind as the water seeps into a hole in the sand of the seashore. He could feel all through his body the tension of rhythms and phrases taking form, not quite to be seized as yet, still hovering on the borderland of consciousness. From the girl at the crossroads singing under her street lamp, to the patrician pulling roses to pieces from the height of her litter, all the imaginings of your desire. He thought of the girl with skin like old ivory that he had seen in the Place des Medicis. The Queen of Sheba's face was like that now in his imaginings, quiet and inscrutable. A sudden cymbal clanging of joy made his heart thump hard. He was free now of the imaginings of his desire, to loll all day at café tables watching the tables move in changing patterns before him, to fill his mind and body with the reverberation of all the rhythms of men and women moving in the frieze of life before his eyes. No more like wooden automatons knowing only the motions of the drill manual, but supple and varied, full of force and tragedy. For heaven's sake, let's beat it from here. Gives me a pain, this place does. Heinemann beat his fist on the table. All right, said Andrews, getting up with a yawn. Henslow and Andrews walked off, leaving Walters to follow them with Heinemann. We're going to dine at Le Rat qui Danse said Henslow. An awfully funny place. We just have time to walk there comfortably with an appetite. They followed the long, dimly lighted Rue de Richelieu to the Boulevard, where they drifted a little while with the crowd. The glaring lights seemed to powder the air with gold. Cafés and the tables outside were crowded. There was an odor of vermouth and coffee and perfume and cigarette smoke mixed with the fumes of burnt gasoline from taxicabs. "'Isn't this mad?' said Andrews. "'It's always carnival at seven on the Grand Boulevard. They started climbing the steep streets to Montmartre. At the corner they passed a hard-faced girl with rouge-smeared lips and over-powdered cheeks, laughing on the arm of an American soldier who had a sallow face and dull green eyes that glittered in the slanting light of a street lamp. Hello, Stein, said Andrews. Who's that? A fellow from our division. Got here with me this morning. He's got curious lips for a Jew, said Henslow. At the fork of two slanting streets, they went into a restaurant that had small windows pasted over with red paper, through which the light came dimly. Inside were crowded oak tables and oak wainscoting with a shelf round the top on which were shell-cans, a couple of skulls, several cracked majolica plates, and a number of stuffed rats. The only people there were a fat woman and a man with long grey hair and a beard who sat talking earnestly over two small glasses in the centre of the room. A husky-looking waitress with a Dutch cap and apron hovered near the inner door, from which came a great smell of fish frying in olive oil. The cook's here from Marseilles, said Henslow, as they settled themselves at a table for four. I wonder if the rest of them lost the way, said Andrews. More likely old Hines stopped to have a drink, said Henslow. Let's have some hors d'oeuvre while we are waiting. The waitress brought a collection of boat-shaped plates of red salads and yellow salads and green salads, and two little wooden tubs with herrings and anchovies. Henslow stopped her as she was going, saying, Rien de plus? The waitress contemplated the array with a tragic air, her arms folded over her ample bosom. Que voulez-vous, monsieur? C'est l'armistice. The greatest fake about all this war business is the peace. I tell you, not till the hors d'oeuvre has been restored to its proper abundance and variety will I admit that the war is over. The waitress tittered. Things aren't what they used to be, she said, going back into the kitchen. Heinemann burst into the restaurant at that moment, slamming the door behind him so that the glass rang, and the fat woman and the hairy man started violently in their chairs. He tumbled into a place, grinning broadly. "'And what have you done to Walters?' 
Heinemann wiped his glasses meticulously. Oh, he died of drinking raspberry shrub, he said. Dis donc petit du vin de Bourgogne, he shouted towards the waitress in his nasal French. Then he added, Le Guy is coming in a minute, I just met him. The restaurant was gradually filling up with men and women of very various costumes, with a good sprinkling of Americans in uniform and out. God, I hate people who don't drink, cried Heinemann, pouring out wine. A man who doesn't drink just cumbers the earth. How are you going to take it in America when they have prohibition? Oh, don't talk about it. Here's Le Guy. I wouldn't have him know I belong to a nation that prohibits good liquor. Monsieur Le Guy, Monsieur Henslow, and Monsieur Andrews, he continued getting up ceremoniously. A little man with trolled moustaches and a small Van Dyke beard sat down at the fourth place. He had a faintly red nose and little twinkling eyes. How glad I am, he said, exposing his starched cuffs with a curious gesture, to have someone to dine with. When one begins to get old, loneliness is impossible. It is only youth that dares think. Uh, afterwards, one has only one thing to think about. Old age. There's always work, said Andrews. Slavery. Any work is slavery. What is the use of freeing your intellect if you sell yourself again to the first bidder? Rot, said Heinemann, pouring out from a new bottle. Andrews had begun to notice the girl who sat at the next table, in front of a pale young soldier in French blue who resembled her extraordinarily. She had high cheekbones and a forehead in which the modelling of the skull showed through the transparent, faintly olive skin. Her heavy chestnut hair was coiled carelessly at the back of her head. She spoke very carefully and pressed her lips together when she smiled. She ate quickly and neatly like a cat. The restaurant had gradually filled up with people. The waitress and the patron, a faint man with a wide red sash coiled tightly round his waist, moved with difficulty among the crowded tables. A woman at a table in the corner, with white dead skin and drugged staring eyes, kept laughing hoarsely, leaning her head in a hat with bedraggled white plumes against the wall. There was a constant jingle of plates and glasses, and an oily fume of food and women's clothes and wine. "'Do you want to know what I really did with your friend?' said Heinemann, leaning towards Andrews. I hope you didn't push him into the Seine. It was damn impolite, but hell, it was damn impolite of him not to drink. No use wasting time with a man who don't drink. I took him into a cafe and asked him to wait while I telephoned. I guess he's still waiting. One of the whoriest cafes on the whole boulevard, cliché. Heinemann laughed uproariously and started explaining it in his nasal French to Monsieur Le Guy. Andrews flushed with annoyance for a moment, but soon started laughing. Heinemann had started singing again. Oh, Sinbad was in bad in Tokyo and Rome, in bad in Trinidad, and twice as bad at home. Oh, Sinbad was in bad all around. Everybody clapped. The white-faced woman in the corner cried, Bravo! Bravo! in a shrill, nightmare voice. Heinemann bowed, his big, grinning face bobbing up and down like the face of a Chinese figure in porcelain. Lui est Saint-Bad, he cried, pointing with a wide gesture towards Henslow. Give him some more, Heinz, give them some more, said Henslow, laughing. Big brunettes with long stellettes on the shores of Italy, Dutch girls with golden curls beside the Zeder Zee. Everyone cheered again. Andrews kept looking at the girl at the next table, whose face was red from laughter. How oh, qu'il est drôle, celui-là! How oh, qu'il est drôle! Heinemann picked up a glass and waved it in the air before drinking it off. Several people got up and filled it from their bottles with white wine and red. The French soldier at the next table pulled an army canteen from under his chair and hung it round Heinemann's neck. Heinemann, his face crimson, bowed to all sides, more like a Chinese porcelain figure than ever, and started singing in all solemnity this time. Hulas and hulas would pucker up their lips, he fell for their ball-bearing hips, for they were pips. 
his chunky body swayed to the ragtime. The woman in the corner kept time with long white arms raised above her head. "'Bet she's a snake charmer,' said Henslow. "'Oh, wild woman loved that child. He could drive ten women wild. Oh, Sinbad was in bad all around.' Heineman waved his arms, pointed again to Henslow, and sank into his chair, saying in the tones of a Shakespearean actor, "'C'est lui, Sinbad!' The girl hid her face on the tablecloth, shaken with laughter. Andrews could hear a convulsed little voice saying, Oh, qu'il est rigolo! Heineman took off the canteen and handed it back to the French soldier. Merci, camarade, he said solemnely. Eh bien, Jean, c'est temps de ficher le camp, said the French soldier to the girl. They got up. He shook hands with the Americans. Andrews caught the girl's eye, and they both started laughing convulsively again. Andrews noticed how erect and supple she walked as his eyes followed her to the door. Andrews's party followed soon after. "'We've got to hurry if we want to get to the Lapin Agile before closing. "'And I've got to have a drink,' said Heineman, still talking in his stagey Shakespearean voice. "'Have you ever been on the stage?' asked Andrews. "'What stage, sir?' I am in the last stages now, sir. I am an artistic photographer and none other. Moki and I are going into the movies together when they decide to have peace. Who's Moki? Moki Hodge is the lady in the salmon-colored dress, said Henslow in a loud stage whisper in Andrews's ear. They have a lion cub named Boo Boo. Our firstborn, said Heineman with a wave of the hand. The streets were deserted. A thin ray of moonlight, bursting now and then through the heavy clouds, lit up low houses and roughly cobbled streets, and the flights of steps with rare, dim lamps bracketed in house walls that led up to the boot. There was a gendarme in front of the door at the La Agile. The street was full of groups that had just come out, American officers and YMCA women, with a sprinkling of the inhabitants of the region. "'Now, look, we're late,' groaned Heineman in a tearful voice. Never mind, Heinz, said Henslow. Leguy will take us to see de Clocheville like he did last time. N'est-ce pas, Leguy? Then Andrews heard him add, talking to a man he had not seen before. Come along, Aubrey. I'll introduce you later. They climbed further up the hill. There was a scent of wet gardens in the air, entirely silent except for the clatter of their feet on the cobbles. Heineman was dancing a sort of jig at the head of the procession. They stopped before a tall, cadaverous house, and started climbing a rickety wooden stairway. Talk about inside dope! I heard this from a man who's actually in the room when the peace conference meets. Andrews heard Aubrey's voice with a Chicago burr in the R's, behind him on the stairs. Fine, let's hear it, said Henslow. Did you say the peace conference took dope? shouted Heineman, whose puffing could be heard as he climbed the dark stairs ahead of them. Uh, shut up, Heinz. They stumbled over a raised doorstep into a large garret room with a tile floor, where a tall, lean man in a monastic-looking dressing gown of some brown material received them. The only candle made all their shadows dance fantastically on the slanting white walls as they moved about. One side of the room had three big windows, with an occasional cracked pane mended with newspaper, stretching from floor to ceiling. In front of them were two couches with rugs piled on them. On the opposite wall was a confused mass of canvases, piled one against the other, leaning helter-skelter against the slanting wall of the room. C'est le bon vin, le bon vin, c'est la chanson du vin, chanted Heineman. Everyone settled themselves on couches. The lanky man in the brown dressing gown brought a table out of the shadow, put some black bottles and heavy glasses on it, and drew up a camp-stool for himself. He lives that way. They say he never goes out. Stays here and paints, and when friends come in, he feeds them wine and charges them double, said Henslow. That's how he lives. The lanky man began taking bits of candle out of a drawer of the table and lighting them. Andrew saw that his feet and legs were bare below the frayed edge of the dressing gown. The candlelight lit up the men's flushed faces and the crude banana yellows and arsenic greens of the canvases along the walls, against which 
jars full of paint brushes cast blurred shadows i was going to tell you henny said aubrey the dope is that the president's going to leave the conference I'm going to call them all damn blackguards to their faces and walk out with the band playing the internationale god that's news cried andrews if he does that he'll recognize the soviets said henslow me for the first red cross mission that goes to save starving russia gee that's great i'll write you a postal from moscow andy if they haven't been abolished as delusions of the bourgeoisie hell no i've got five hundred dollars worth of russian bonds that girl vera gave me but worth five million ten million fifty million if the czar gets back i'm backing the little white father cried heineman anyway moki says he's alive that Savarov's got him locked up in a suite in the Ritz. And Moki knows. Moki knows a damn lot, I'll admit that, said Henslow. But just think of it, said Aubrey. That means world revolution with the United States at the head of it. What do you think of that? Moki doesn't think so, said Heinemann. And Moki knows. She just knows what a lot of reactionary warlords tell her, said Aubrey. This man I was talking with at the Crillon, I wish I could tell you his name. Heard it directly from, well, you know who. He turned to Henslow, who smiled knowingly. There's a mission in Russia at this minute making peace with Lenin. A goddamn outrage, cried Heinemann, knocking a bottle off the table. The lanky man picked up the pieces patiently without comment. The new era is opening, man, I swear it is, began Aubrey. The old order is dissolving. It is going down under a weight of misery and crime. This will be the first great gesture towards a newer and better world. There is no alternative. The chance will never come back. It is either for us to step courageously forward or slip into unbelievable horrors of anarchy and civil war. Peace or the Dark Ages again. Andrews had felt for some time an uncontrollable sleepiness coming over him. He rolled himself in a rug and stretched out on the empty couch. The voices arguing, wrangling, enunciating emphatic phrases dinned for a minute in his ears. He went to sleep. When Andrews woke up, he found himself staring at the cracked plaster of an unfamiliar ceiling. For some moments he could not guess where he was. Henslow was sleeping, wrapped in another rug, on the couch beside him. Except for Henslow's breathing, there was complete silence. Floods of silvery-gray light poured in through the wide windows, behind which Andrews could see a sky full of bright, dove-colored clouds. He sat up carefully. Sometime in the night he must have taken off his tunic and boots and puttees, which were on the floor beside the couch. The tables with the bottles had gone, and the lanky man was nowhere to be seen. Andrews went to the window in his stockinged feet. Paris way, a slate gray and dove color lay spread out like a Turkish carpet, with a silvery band of mist where the river was, out of which the Eiffel Tower stood up like a man wading. Here and there, blue smoke and brown spiraled up to lose itself in the faint canopy of brown fog that hung high above the houses. Andrews stood a long while, leaning against the window frame until he heard Henslow's voice behind him. Depuis le jour où je me suis donné. You look like Louise. Andrews turned round. Henslow was sitting on the edge of the bed with his hair in disorder, combing his little silky moustache with a pocket comb. Gee, I have a head, he said. My tongue feels like a nutmeg grater. Doesn't yours? No, I feel like a fighting cock. What do you say we go down to the Seine and have a bath in Benny Franklin's bathtub? Where's that? It sounds grand. Then we'll have the biggest breakfast ever. Oh, that's the right spirit. Where's everybody gone to? Old Hines has gone to his Moki, I guess, and Aubrey's gone to collect more dope at the Crillon. He says four in the morning when the drunks come home is the prime time for a newspaper man. And the monkish man? Ah, search me. The streets were full of men and girls hurrying to work. Everything sparkled, had an air of being just scrubbed. 
they passed bakeries from which came a rich smell of fresh baked bread from cafes came whiffs of roasting coffee they crossed through the markets that were full of heavy carts lumbering to and fro and women with net bags full of vegetables there was a pungent scent of crushed cabbage leaves and carrots and wet clay the mist was raw and biting along the quay and made the blood come into their cheeks and their hands stiff with cold the bathhouse was a huge barge with a house built on it in a lozenge shape they crossed to it by a little gangplank on which were a few geraniums in pots the attendant gave them two rooms side by side on the lower deck painted grey with steamed over windows through which andrews caught glimpses of hurrying green water he stripped his clothes off quickly the tub was of copper varnished with some white metal inside the water flowed in through two copper swan's necks when andrews stepped into the hot green water a little window in the partition flew open and henslow shouted into him talk about modern conveniences you can converse while you bathe andrews scrubbed himself jauntily with a square piece of pink soap splashing the water about like a small boy he stood up and lathered himself all over and then let himself slide into the water which splashed out over the floor do you think you're a performing seal shouted henslow it's all so preposterous cried andrews going off into convulsions of laughter she has a lion cub named boo boo and nicholas romanoff lives in the ritz and the revolution is scheduled for day after tomorrow at twelve noon i'd put it about the first of may answered henslow amid a sound of splashing gee it'd be great to be a people's commissary you could go and revolute the grand lama of tibet oh it's too deliciously preposterous cried andrews letting himself slide a second time into the bathtub End of section 12section 13 of three soldiers this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by m b three soldiers by john dos passos section 13 2 two mp's passed outside the window andrews watched the yellow pigskin revolver cases until they were out of sight he felt joyfully secure from them the waiter, standing by the door with a napkin on his arm, gave him a sense of security so intense it made him laugh. On the marble yellow table before him were a small glass of beer, a notebook full of ruled sheets of paper, and a couple of yellow pencils. The beer, the color of topaz in the clear gray light that streamed in through the window, threw a pale yellow glow with a bright center on the table. Outside was the boulevard with a few people walking hurriedly. An empty market wagon passed now and then, rumbling loud. On a bench, a woman in a black knitted shawl, with a bundle of newspapers on her knees, was counting sous with loving concentration. Andrews looked at his watch. He had an hour before going to the Scola Cantorum. He got to his feet, paid the waiter, and strolled down the center of the boulevard, thinking smilingly of pages he had written of pages he was going to write, filled with a sense of leisurely well-being. It was a grey morning with a little yellowish fog in the air. The pavements were damp, reflected women's dresses and men's legs, and the angular outlines of taxicabs. From a flower stand with violets and red and pink carnations, irregular blotches of colour ran down the brownish-grey of the pavement. Andrews caught a faint smell of violets in the smell of the fog as he passed the flower stand and remembered suddenly that spring was coming. He would not miss a moment of this spring, he told himself. He would follow it step by step from the first violets. Oh, how fully he must live now to make up for all the years he had wasted in his life. He kept on walking along the boulevard. He was remembering how he and the girl the soldier had called Jeanne had both kindled with uncontrollable laughter when their eyes had met that night in the restaurant. 
He wished he could go down the boulevard with a girl like that, laughing through the foggy morning. He wondered vaguely what part of Paris he was getting to, but he was too happy to care. How beautifully long the hours were in the early morning. At a concert at the Salle Gaveau the day before, he had heard Debussy's Nocturne and Les Sirenes. Rhythms from them were the warp of all his thoughts. Against the background of the grey street and the brownish fog that hung a veil at the end of every vista, he began to imagine rhythms of his own, modulations and phrases that grew brilliant and faded, that flapped for a while like gaudy banners above his head through the clatter of the street. He noticed that he was passing a long building with blank rows of windows, at the central door of which stood groups of American soldiers smoking. Unconsciously he hastened his steps, for fear of meeting an officer he would have to salute. He passed the men without looking at them. A voice detained him. Say, Andrews! When he turned he saw that a short man with curly hair, whose face, though familiar, he could not place, had left the group at the door and was coming towards him. Hello, Andrews. Your name's Andrews, ain't it? Yes. Andrews shook his hand, trying to remember. I'm Fuselli. Remember? The last time I saw you I was going up to the lines on a train with Chrisfield. Chris, we used to call him. At Coast, don't you remember? Of course I do. Well, what's happened to Chris? He's a corporal now, said Andrews. Gee, he is? I'll be goddamned. They was going to make me a corporal once. Fuselli wore stained olive drab breeches and badly rolled puttees. His shirt was open at the neck. From his blue denim jacket came a smell of stale grease that Andrews recognized. The smell of army kitchens. He had a momentary recollection of standing in line cold, dark mornings, and of the sound of food made slopping into mess kits. Why didn't they make you a corporal, Fuselli? Andrews said, after a pause, in a constrained voice. Hell, I got in wrong, I suppose. They were leaning against the dusty house wall. Andrews looked at his feet. The mud of the pavement, splashing up on the wall, made an even dado along the bottom on which Andrews scraped the toe of his shoe up and down. Well, how's everything? Andrews said, looking up suddenly. I've been in a labor battalion. That's how everything is. Oh, God, that's tough luck. Andrews wanted to go on. He had a sudden fear that he would be late, but he did not know how to break away. I got sick, said Fuselli, grinning. I guess I am yet. G.O. 42. It's a hell of a note the way they treat a feller. Like he was lower than the dirt. Were you at cause all the time? That's damned rough luck, Fuselli. Cause no sure is a hell of a hole. I guess you saw a lot of fighting. God, you must have been glad not to be in the goddamn medics. I don't know that I'm glad I saw fighting. Oh, yes, I suppose I am. You see, I had it a hell of a time before they found out. Court-martial was damn stiff. After the armistice, too. Oh, God, why can't they let a fellow go home? A woman in a bright blue hat passed them. Andrews caught a glimpse of a white, overpowdered face. Her hips trembled like jelly under the blue skirt with each hard clack of her high heels on the pavement. Gee, that looks like Jenny. I'm glad she didn't see me, Fuselli laughed. Ought to have seen her one night last week. We were so dead drunk we just couldn't move. Isn't that bad for what's the matter with you? I should give a damn now. What's the use? But God, man! Andrews stopped himself suddenly. Then he said in a different voice, What outfit are you in now? I'm on the permanent KP here. Fuselli jerked his thumb towards the door of the building. Not a bad job. Off two days a week. No drill. Good eats. At least you get all you want. But it surely has been hell emptying ash cans and shoveling coal. And now all they've done is dry me up. But you'll be going home soon now, won't you? They can't discharge you till they cure you. Damned if I know. Some guys say a guy never can be cured. 
Don't you find KP work pretty damn dull? No, no worse than anything else. What are you doing in Paris? School detachment. Oh, what's that? Men who wanted to study in the university, who managed to work it. Gee, I'm glad I ain't going to school again. Well, so long, Fuselli. So long, Andrews. Fuselli turned and slouched back to the group of men at the door. Andrews hurried away. As he turned the corner, he had a glimpse of Fuselli, with his hands in his pockets and his legs crossed, leaning against the wall behind the door of the barracks. 3. The darkness, where the rain fell through the vague halos of light around the street lamps, glittered with streaks of pale gold. Andrews's ears were full of the sound of racing gutters and spattering water spouts, and of the hard, unceasing beat of the rain on the pavements. It was after closing time. The corrugated shutters were drawn down in front of cafe windows. Andrews's cap was wet. Water trickled down his forehead and the sides of his nose, running into his eyes. His feet were soaked, and he could feel the wet patches growing on his knees where they received the water running off his overcoat. The street stretched wide and dark ahead of him, with an occasional glimmer of greenish reflection from a lamp. As he walked, splashing with long strides through the rain, he noticed that he was keeping pace with a woman under an umbrella, a slender person who was hurrying with small, resolute steps up the boulevard. When he saw her, a mad hope flamed suddenly through him. He remembered a vulgar little theater in the crude light of a spotlight. Through the paint and powder, a girl's golden-brown skin had shone with a firm brilliance that made him think of the wide, sun-scorched uplands and dancing figures on Greek vases. Since he had seen her two nights ago, he had thought of nothing else. He had feverishly found out her name. Naya Selikov. A mad hope flared through him that this girl he was walking beside was the girl whose slender limbs moved in an endless freeze through his thoughts. He peered at her with eyes blurred with rain. What an ass he was! Of course it couldn't be. It was too early. She was on stage at this minute. Other hungry eyes were staring at her slenderness. Other hands were twitching to stroke her golden-brown skin. Walking under the steady downpour that stung his face and ears, and sent a tiny cold trickle down his back, he felt a sudden dizziness of desire come over him. His hands, thrust to the bottom of his coat pockets, clutched convulsively. He felt that he would die, that his pounding blood vessels would burst. The bead curtains of rain rustled and tinkled about him, awakening his nerves, making his skin flash and tingle. In the gurgle of water in the gutters and water spouts, he could imagine he heard orchestras droning libidinous music. The feverish excitement of his senses began to create frenzied rhythms in his ears. Oh, ce pauvre poilu, qu'il doit être moui, said a small, tremulous voice beside him. He turned. The girl was offering him part of her umbrella. Oh, c'est un Américain, she said again, still speaking as if to herself. Mais ça ne vaut pas la peine. Mais oui, mais oui. He stepped under the umbrella beside her. But you must let me hold it. Bien. As he took the umbrella, he caught her eye. He stopped still in his tracks. But you're the girl at the Rat qui danse. And you were at the next table with the man who sang. How amusing. Et celui-là, oh, il était rigolo. She burst out laughing. Her head, encased in a little round black hat, bobbed up and down under the umbrella. Andrews laughed, too. Crossing the boulevard Saint-Germain, a taxi nearly ran them down and splashed a great wave of mud over them. She clutched his arm and then stood roaring with laughter. Oh, quelle horreur! Quelle horreur! she kept exclaiming. Andrews laughed and laughed. But hold the umbrella over us. You're letting the rain in on my best hat, she said again. 
Your name is Jeanne, said Andrews. Impertinent? You heard my brother call me that. He went back to the front last night, poor little chap. He's only nineteen. He's very clever. Oh, how happy I am that the war's over. You're older than he? Two years. I am the head of the family. It is a dignified position. Have you always lived in Paris? No, we are from Long. It's the war. Refugees? Don't call us that. We work. Andrews laughed. Are you going far? she asked, peering in his face. No, I live up here. Oh, my name is the same as yours. Jean? How funny. Where are you going? Rue Descartes, behind Saint Etienne. I live near you. Ah, oh, but you mustn't come. The concierge is a tigress. Etienne calls her Madame Clemenceau. Who, the saint? No, you silly. My brother. He's a socialist. He's a typesetter at L'Humanité. Really? I often read L'Humanité. Poor boy, he used to swear he'd never go in the army. He thought of going to America. That wouldn't do him any good now, said Andrews bitterly. What do you do? I? A gruff bitterness came into her voice. Why should I tell you? I, I work at a dressmaker's. Like Louise? You've heard Louise? Oh, how I cried. Why did it make you sad? Oh, I don't know. But I'm learning stenography. But here we are. The great bulk of the Pantheon stood up dimly through the rain beside them. In front, the tower of saint etienne du mont was still visible. The rain roared about them. Oh, how wet I am, said Jeanne. Look, they're giving Louise day after tomorrow at the Opera Comique. Won't you come with me? No, I should cry too much. I'll cry too. But it's not... C'est l'armistice, interrupted Andrews. They both laughed. All right. Meet me at the cafe at the end of the Boumiche at quarter past seven. But you probably won't come. I swear I will, cried Andrews eagerly. We'll see. She darted away down the street beside saint etienne du mont Andrews was left alone amid the seethe of the rain and the tumultuous gurgle of water spouts. He felt calm and tired. When he got to his room, he found he had no matches in his pocket. No light came from the window, through which he could hear the hissing clamor of the rain in the court. He stumbled over a chair. "'Are you drunk?' came Walters's voice, swathed in bedclothes. "'There are matches on the table. But where the hell's the table?' At last his hand, groping over the table, closed on the matchbox. The match's red and white flicker dazzled him. He blinked his eyes. The lashes were still full of raindrops. When he had lit a candle and set it amongst the music papers upon the table, he tore off his dripping clothes. I just met the most charming girl, Walters. Andrews stood naked beside the pile of his clothes, rubbing himself with a towel. Gee, I was wet. But she was the most charming person I've met since I've been in Paris. I thought you said you let the girls alone. Whores, I must have said. Well, any girl you could pick up on the street. Nonsense! I guess they're all that way in this damned country. God, it will do me good to see a nice, sweet, wholesome American girl. Andrews did not answer. He blew out the light and got into bed. But I've got a new job, Walters went on. I'm working in the school detachment office. Why the hell do that? You came here to take courses in the Sorbonne, didn't you? Sure, I go to most of them now. But in this army I like to be in the middle of things, see? Just so they can't put anything over on me. There's something in that. There's a damn lot in it, boy. The only way is to keep in right and not let the man higher up forget you. Why, we may start fighting again. These damn Germans ain't showing the right spirit at all. After all the president's done for them. I expect to get my sergeancy out of it anyway. Well, 
I'm going to sleep, said Andrews sulkily. John Andrews sat at a table outside the Café de Rohan. The sun had just set on a ruddy afternoon, flooding everything with violet-blue light and cold greenish shadow. The sky was bright lilac color, streaked with a few amber clouds. The lights were on in all the windows of the Magasin du Louvre opposite, so that the windows seemed bits of polished glass in the afterglow. In the colonnade of the Palais Royal, the shadows were deepening and growing colder. A steady stream of people poured in and out of the metro. Green buses stuffed with people kept passing. The roar of the traffic and the clatter of footsteps and the grumble of voices swirled like dance music about Andrews's head. He noticed all at once that the rabbit man stood in front of him, a rabbit dangling forgotten at the end of its rubber tube. Et ça va bien, le commerce? said Andrews. Quietly, quietly said the rabbit man, distractedly making the rabbit turn a somersault at his feet. Andrews watched the people going into the metro. The gentleman amuses himself in Paris? asked the rabbit man timidly. Oh, yes, and you? Quietly, the rabbit man smiled. Women are very beautiful at this hour of the evening, he said again in his very timid tone. There is nothing more beautiful than this moment of the evening in Paris. Poor Parisian women, the eyes of the rabbit man glittered. Excuse me, sir, he went on. I must try and sell some rabbits. Au revoir, said Andrews, holding out his hand. The rabbit man shook it with sudden vigor and went off, making a rabbit hop before him along the curbstone. He was hidden by the swiftly moving crowds. In the square, Flaring violet arc lights were flickering on, lighting up their net covered globes that hung like harsh moons above the pavement. Henslow sat down on a chair beside Andrews. How's Sinbad? Sinbad, old boy, is functioning. Aren't you frozen? How do you mean, Henslow? Overheated, you chump, sitting out here in polar weather. No, but I mean, how are you functioning? said Andrews, laughing. I'm going to Poland tomorrow. How? As a guard on a Red Cross supply train. I think you might make it if you want to come, if we beat it right over to the Red Cross before Major Smithers goes, or we might take him out to dinner. But, Henny, I'm staying. Why the hell stay in this hole? I like it. I'm getting a better course in orchestration than I imagined existed, and I met a girl the other day, and I'm crazy over Paris. If you go and get entangled, I swear I'll beat your head in with a Polish shillelagh. Of course you've met a girl. So have I. Lots. We can meet some more in Poland and dance polonaise with them. No, but this girl's charming. You've seen her. She was the girl who was with the poilu at the Rocky Danse the first night I was in Paris. We went to Louise together. Must have been a grand sentimental party. I swear. I may run after a Jane now and again, but I never let them interfere with the business of existence, muttered Henslow crossly. They were both silent. You'll be as bad as Heinz with his Moki and the lion cub named Boo Boo. By the way, it's dead. Well, where shall we have dinner? I'm dining with Jeanne. I'm going to meet her in half an hour. I'm awfully sorry, Henny. We might all dine together. A fat chance. No, I'll have to go and find that ass Aubrey and hear all about the peace conference. Heinz can't leave Moki because she's having hysterics on account of a boo-boo. I'll probably be driven to going to see Barrett in the end. You're a nice one. We'll have a grand seeing-off party for you tomorrow, Henny. <laughs> Look, I forgot. You're to meet Aubrey at the Crillon at five tomorrow, and he's going to take you to see Jean-Pierre Gros. Who the hell's Geneviève Rowe? Darned if I know. But Aubrey said you'd got to come. She is an intellectual, so Aubrey says. Oh, that's the last thing I want to meet. Well, you can't help yourself. So long. Andrew sat a while more at the table outside the cafe. A cold wind was blowing. The sky was blue-black, and the ashen-white arc lamps 
cast a mortuary light over everything. In the colonnade of the Palais Royal, the shadows were harsh and inky. In the square, the people were gradually thinning. The lights in the Magasin du Louvre had gone out. From the café behind him, a faint smell of fresh-cooked food began to saturate the cold air of the street. Then he saw Jeanne advancing across the ash-gray pavement of the square, slim and black under the arc-lights. He ran to meet her. The cylindrical stove in the middle of the floor roared softly. In front of it the white cat was rolled into a fluffy ball, in which ears and nose made tiny splashes of pink, like those at the tips of the petals of certain white roses. One side of the stove, at the table against the window, sat an old brown man with a bright red stain on each cheekbone, who wore formless corduroy clothes, the color of his skin. Holding the small spoon in a knotted hand, he was stirring slowly and continuously a liquid that was yellow and steamed in a glass. Behind him was the window with sleet beating against it in the leaden light of a wintry afternoon. The other side of the stove was a zinc bar, with yellow bottles and green bottles and a water spigot with a neck like a giraffe's, that rose out of the bar beside a varnished wood pillar that made the decoration of the corner, with a terracotta pot of ferns on top of it. From where Andrews sat on the padded bench at the back of the room, the fern fronds made a black lacework against the left-hand side of the window, while against the other was the brown silhouette of the old man's head and the slant of his cap. The stove hid the door, and the white cat, round and symmetrical, formed the center of the visible universe. On the marble table beside Andrews were some pieces of crisp bread with butter on them, a saucer of damson jam, and a bowl with coffee and hot milk from which the steam rose in a faint spiral. His tunic was unbuttoned, and he rested his head on his two hands staring through his fingers at a thick pile of ruled paper full of hastily drawn signs, some in ink and some in pencil, where now and then he made a mark with a pencil. At the other edge of the pile of papers were two books, one yellow and one white with coffee stains on it. The fire roared and the cat slept, and the old brown man stirred and stirred, rarely stopping for a moment to lift the glass to his lips. Occasionally, the scratching of sleet upon the windows became audible, or there was a distant sound of dishpans through the door in the back. The sallow-faced clock that hung above the mirror that backed the bar jerked out one jingly strike, a half hour. Andrews did not look up. The cat still slept in front of the stove, which roared with a gentle sing-song. The old man still stirred the yellow liquid in his glass. The clock was ticking uphill against the hour. Andrews's hands were cold. There was a nervous flutter in his wrists and in his chest. Inside of him was a great rift of light, infinitely vast and infinitely distant. Through it sounds poured from somewhere, so that he trembled with them to his fingertips. Sounds modulated into rhythms that washed back and forth and crossed each other like sea waves in a cove, sounds clotted into harmonies. Behind everything, the Queen of Sheba, out of Flaubert, held her fantastic hand with its long, gilded fingernails on his shoulder, and he was leaning forward over the brink of life. But the image was vague, like a shadow cast on the brilliance of his mind. The clock struck four. The white, fluffy ball of the cat unrolled very slowly. Its eyes were very round and yellow. It put first one leg and then the other out before it on the tiled floor, spreading wide the pinky-gray claws. Its tail rose up behind it, straight as the mast of a ship. With slow, processional steps, the cat walked towards the door. The old man drank down the yellow liquid and smacked his lips twice, loudly, meditatively. Andrews raised his head, his blue eyes looking straight before him without seeing anything. Dropping the pencil, 
he leaned back against the wall and stretched his arms out. Taking the coffee bowl between his two hands, he drank a little. It was cold. He piled some jam on a piece of bread and ate it, licking a little off his fingers afterwards. Then he looked towards the old brown man and said, On est bien ici, n'est-ce pas, Monsieur Moreau? Oui, on est bien ici, said the old man in a voice so gruff it seemed to rattle. Very slowly he got to his feet. Good, I'm going to the barge, he said. Then he called, Chipette? Oui, monsieur. A little girl in a black apron with her hair and two tight pigtails that stood out behind her tiny bullet head as she ran came through the door from the back part of the house. There, give that to your mother, said the old brown man, putting some coppers in her hand. Oui, monsieur. You'd better stay where it's warm, said Andrews, yawning. I have to work. It's only soldiers don't have to work, rattled the old brown man. When the door opened, a gust of raw air circled about the wine shop, and a roar of wind and hiss of sleet came from the slush-covered quay outside. The cat took refuge beside the stove, with its back up and its tail waving. The door closed and the old brown man's silhouette, slanted against the wind, crossed the grey oblong of the window. Andrews settled down to work again. But you work a lot, don't you, Monsieur Jean? said Chipette, putting her chin on the table beside the books and looking up into his eyes with little eyes like black beads. I wonder if I do. When I'm grown up, I shan't work a bit. I'll drive round in a carriage. Andrews laughed. Chipette looked at him for a minute, and then went into the other room, carrying away the empty coffee bowl. In front of the stove, the cat sat on its haunches, licking a paw rhythmically with a pink curling tongue like a rose petal. Andrews whistled a few bars, staring at the cat. What do you think of that, Minet? That's Lorraine de Saba. La Reine de Saba. The cat curled into a ball again with great deliberation and went to sleep. Andrews began thinking of Jeanne, and the thought gave him a sense of quiet well-being. Strolling with her in the evening, through the streets full of men and women walking significantly together, sent a languid calm through his jangling nerves, which he had never known in his life before. It excited him to be with her, but very suavely, so that he forgot that his limbs were swathed stiffly in an uncomfortable uniform, so that his feverish desire seemed to fly out of him until, with her body beside him, he seemed to drift effortlessly in the stream of the lives of all the people he passed, so languid from the quiet loves that streamed up about him that the hard walls of his personality seemed to have melted entirely into a mistiness of twilight streets. And for a moment, as he thought of it, a scent of flowers, heavy with pollen, and sprouting grass and damp moss and swelling sap, seemed to tingle in his nostrils. Sometimes, swimming in the ocean on a rough day, he had felt the same reckless exhilaration when, towards the shore, a huge, seething wave had caught him up and sped him forward on its crest. Sitting quietly in the empty wine-shop that grey afternoon, he felt his blood grumble and swell in his veins, as the new life was grumbling and swelling in the sticky buds of the trees, in the tender green quick under their rough bark, in the little furry animals of the woods, and in the sweet-smelling cattle that tramped into mud the lush meadows. In the premonition of spring was a restless wave of force that carried him and all of them with it tumultuously. The clock struck five. Andrews jumped to his feet, and still struggling into his overcoat, darted out of the door. A raw wind blew on the square. The river was a muddy grey-green, swollen and rapid. A hoarse, triumphant roaring came from it. The sleet had stopped, but the pavements were covered with slush, and in the gutters were large puddles which the wind ruffled. Everything, houses, bridges, river and sky, was in shades of cold grey-green, broken by one jagged, ochre-coloured rift across the sky, against which the bulk of Notre-Dame and the slender spire of the crossing 
rose dark and purplish. Andrews walked with long strides, splashing through the puddles, until, opposite the low building of the morgue, he caught a crowded green bus. Outside the Hotel Crillon were many limousines, painted olive drab, with numbers in white letters on the doors. The drivers, men with their olive drab coat collars turned up round their red faces, stood in groups under the portico. Andrews passed the sentry and went through the revolving doors into the lobby, which was vividly familiar. It had the smell he remembered having smelt in the lobbies of New York hotels, a smell of cigar smoke and furniture polish. On one side, a door led to a big dining room where many men and women were having tea, from which came the smell of pastry and rich food. On the expanse of red carpet in front of him, officers and civilians stood in groups talking in low voices. There was a sound of jingling spurs and jangling dishes from the restaurant, and near where Andrews stood shifting his weight from one foot to the other, sprawled in a leather chair, a fat man with a black felt hat over his eyes and a large watch-chain dangling limply over his bulbous paunch. He cleared his throat occasionally with a rasping noise and spat loudly into the spittoon beside him. At last Andrews caught sight of Aubrey, who was dapper with white cheeks and tortoise-shell glasses. "'Come along,' he said, seizing Andrews by the arm. "'You're late.' Then he went on whispering in Andrews's ear as they went out through the revolving doors. Great things happened in the conference today. I can tell you that, old man. They crossed the bridge towards the portico of the Chamber of Deputies with its high pediment and its grey columns. Down the river they could see faintly the Eiffel Tower, with a drift of mist athwart it, like a section of spider web spun between the city and the clouds. Do we have to go see these people, Aubrey? Yes, you can't back out now. Geneviève Rau wants to talk about American music. But what on earth can I tell her about American music? Wasn't there a man named McDowell who went mad or something? Andrews laughed. But you know I haven't any social graces. I suppose I'll have to say I think folk is a little tin god. You needn't say anything if you don't want to. They're very advanced, anyway. Oh, rats. They were going up a brown carpeted stair that had engravings on the landings, where there was a faint smell of stale food and dustpans. At the top landing, Aubrey rang the bell at a varnished door. In a moment a girl opened it. She had a cigarette in her hand. Her face was pale under a mass of reddish chestnut hair. Her eyes very large, a pale brown, as large as the eyes of women in those paintings of Artemisius and Berenikes found in tombs in the Fayum. She wore a plain black dress. Enfin, she said, and held out her hand to Aubrey. There's my friend Andrews. She held out her hand to him absently, still looking at Aubrey. Does he speak French? Good. This way. They went into a large room with a piano, where an elderly woman, with grey hair and yellow teeth, and the same large eyes as her daughter, stood before the fireplace. Maman, enfin les arrive, c'est monsieur. Geneviève was afraid you weren't coming, Madame Rowe said to Andrews, smiling. Monsieur Aubrey gave us such a picture of your playing that we have been excited all day. We adore music. I wish I could do something more to the point with it than adore it, said Geneviève Rowe hastily. Then she went on with a laugh. But I forget. Monsieur Andreffs? Monsieur Ronsard. She made a gesture with her hand from Andrews to a young Frenchman in a cutaway coat with small moustaches and a very tight vest who bowed towards Andrews. Now we'll have tea, said Geneviève Rau. Everybody talks sense until they've had tea. It's only after tea that anyone is ever amusing. She pulled open some curtains that covered the door into their adjoining room. I understand why Sarah Bernhardt is so fond of curtains, she said. They give an air of drama to existence. There is nothing more heroic than curtains. She sat at the head of an oak table where were china platters with very colored pastries, an old pewter kettle under which an alcohol lamp burned, a Dresden china teapot in pale yellows and greens, and cups and saucers and plates with a double-headed eagle design in dull vermilion. 
Tout ça, said Genevieve, waving her hand across the table. C'est Bosch, but we haven't any others, so they'll have to do. The older woman, who sat beside her, whispered something in her ear and laughed. Genevieve put on a pair of tortoise-shell spectacles and started pouring out tea. Debussy once drank out of that cup. It's cracked, she said, handing a cup to John Andrews. Do you know anything of Mussorgsky's you can play to us after tea? I can't play anything any more. Ask me three months from now. Oh, yes, but nobody expects you to do any tricks with it. You can certainly make it intelligible. That's all I want. I have my doubts. Andrews sipped his tea slowly, looking now and then at Jean Vieux who had suddenly begun talking very fast to Ronsard. She held a cigarette between the fingers of a long, thin hand. Her large, pale brown eyes kept their startled look of having just opened on the world. A little smile appeared and disappeared maliciously in the curve of her cheek away from her small, firm lips. The older woman beside her kept looking round the table with a jolly air of hospitality and showing her yellow teeth in a smile. Afterwards they went back to the sitting-room, and Andrew sat down at the piano. The girl sat very straight on a little chair beside the piano. Andrews ran his fingers up and down the keys. "'Did you say you knew Debussy?' he said. "'I? No, but he used to come to see my father when I was a little girl. I have been brought up in the middle of music. That shows how silly it is to be a woman. There is no music in my head. Of course I am sensitive to it, but so are the tables and chairs in this apartment after all they've heard.' Andrews started playing Schumann. He stopped suddenly. Can you sing? he said. No. I'd like to do the prose lyrique. I've never heard them. I once tried to sing Le Soir, she said. Wonderful. Do bring it out. But, good Lord, it's too difficult. What is the use of being fond of music if you aren't willing to mangle it for the sake of producing it? I swear I'd rather hear a man picking out Auprès de Mont Blanc on a trombone than Chrysler playing Paganini impeccably enough to make you ill. But there is a middle ground. He interrupted her by starting to play again. As he played, without looking at her, he felt that her eyes were fixed on him, that she was standing tensely behind him. Her hand touched his shoulder. He stopped playing. Oh, I am dreadfully sorry, she said. Nothing. I am finished. You were playing something of your own? Have you ever read Le Tentation de Saint Antoine? he asked in a low voice. Flaubert's? Yes. It's not his best work. A very interesting failure, though, she said. Andrews got up from the piano with difficulty, controlling a sudden growing irritation. They seem to teach everybody to say that, he muttered. Suddenly he realized that other people were in the room. He went up to Madame Rowe. "'You must excuse me,' he said. "'I have an engagement. "'Aubrey, don't let me drag you away. "'I am late. I "'I've got to run. "'You must come see us again.' "'Thank you,' mumbled Andrews. Geneviève Rowe went with him to the door. "'We must know each other better,' she said. "'I like you for going off in a huff.' Andrews flushed. "'I was badly brought up,' he said, pressing her thin, cold hand. "'And you French must always remember that we are barbarians. Some are repentant barbarians. I am not.' She laughed, and John Andrews ran down the stairs and out into the grey-blue streets, where the lamps were blooming into primrose colour. He had a confused feeling that he had made a fool of himself, which made him writhe with helpless anger. He walked with long strides through the streets of the Rive Gauche, full of people going home from work, towards the little wine-shop on the Quai de la Tournelle. It was a Paris Sunday morning. Old women in black shawls were going into the church of saint etienne du Mont. Each time the leather doors opened, it let a little whiff of incense out into the smoky morning air. Three pigeons walked about the cobblestones, putting their coral feet one before the other with an air of importance. The pointed façade of the church and its slender tower and cupola cast a bluish shadow on the square in front of it, 
into which the shadows the old women trailed behind them vanished as they hobbled towards the church. The opposite side of the square and the railing of the Pantheon and its tall brownish-gray flank were flooded with dull orange-colored sunlight. Andrews walked back and forth in front of the church, looking at the sky and the pigeons and the façade of the library of Sainte Genevieve, and at the rare people who passed across the end of the square, noting forms and colors and small comical aspects of things with calm delight, savoring everything almost with complacency. His music, he felt, was progressing now that, undisturbed, he lived all day long in the rhythm of it. His mind and his fingers were growing supple. The hard moulds that had grown up about his spirit were softening. As he walked back and forth in front of the church waiting for Jeanne, he took an inventory of his state of mind. He was very happy. Eh bien? Jeanne had come up behind him. They ran like children hand in hand across the sunny square. I have not had any coffee yet, said Andrews. Oh, how late you must get up! But you can't have any till we get to the Porte Mayo, Jean. Why not? Because I say you can't. But that's cruelty. It won't be long. But I'm dying with hunger. I, I will die in your hands. Oh, can't you understand? Once we get to the Porte Mayo, we'll be far from your life and my life. The day will be ours. One must not tempt fate. You funny girl. The metro was not crowded. Andrews and Jeanne sat opposite each other without talking. Andrews was looking at the girl's hands, limp on her lap. Small, overworked hands with places at the tips of the fingers where the skin was broken and scarred, with chipped, uneven nails. Suddenly she caught his glance. He flushed, and she said jauntily, Well, we'll all be rich some day, like princes and princesses in fairy tales. They both laughed. As they were leaving the train at the terminus, he put his arm timidly round her waist. She wore no corsets. His fingers trembled at the litheness of the flesh under her clothes. Feeling a sort of terror go through him, he took away his arm. Now, she said quietly as they emerged into the sunlight and the bare trees of the broad avenue, you can have all the café au lait you want. You'll have some, too. Why be extravagant? I've had my petit déjeuner. But I'm going to be extravagant all day. We might as well start now. I don't know exactly why, but I am very happy. We'll eat brioche. But, my dear, it's only profiteers who can eat brioche nowadays. You just watch us. They went into a patisserie. An elderly woman with a lean yellow face and thin hair waited on them, casting envious glances up through her eyelashes as she piled the rich brown brioche on a piece of tissue paper. You'll pass the day in the country? she asked in a little wistful voice as she handed Andrews the change. Yes, he said, how well you guessed. As they went out of the door they heard her muttering, Oh, la jeunesse, la jeunesse. They found a table in the sun at a café opposite the gate, from which they could watch people and automobiles and carriages coming in and out. Beyond, a grass-grown bit of the fortifications gave an 1870 look to things. "'How jolly it is at the Port Mayo!' cried Andrews. She looked at him and laughed. "'But how gay he is today!' "'No, I always like it here. It's the spot in Paris where you always feel well. When you go out you have all the fun of leaving town. When you go in you have all the fun of coming back to town. But aren't you eating any brioche?' I've eaten one. You eat them. You are hungry. Jeanne, I don't think I've ever been so happy in my life. It is almost worth having been in the army for the joy your freedom gives you. That frightful life. How is Etienne? He is in Mayence. He's bored. Jeanne, we must live very much, we who are free to make up for all the people who are still bored. A lot of good it'll do them, she cried, laughing. It's funny, Jeanne. I threw myself into the army. I was so sick of being free and not getting anywhere. 
now i've learnt that life is to be used not just held in the hand like a box of bonbons that nobody eats she looked at him blankly i mean i don't get enough out of life he said let's go they got to their feet what do you mean she said slowly one takes what one gives that is all there's no choice but look there's the malmaison train we must run giggling and breathless they climbed on the trailer squeezing themselves on the back platform where everyone was pushing and exclaiming the car began to joggle its way through neuilly their bodies were pressed together by the men and women about them andrews put his arm firmly around jeanne's waist and looked down at her pale cheek that was pressed against his chest her little round black straw hat with a bit of a red flower on it was just under his chin i can't see a thing she gasped still giggling i'll describe the landscape said andrews why we are crossing the seine already oh how pretty it must be an old gentleman with a pointed white beard who stood beside them laughed benevolently but don't you think the Seine's pretty? Jeanne looked up at him impudently. Without a doubt, without a doubt, it was the way you said it, said the old gentleman. You are going to Saint Germain? he asked Andrews. No, to Malmaison. Oh, you should go to Saint Germain. Monsieur Reinach's prehistoric museum is there. It's very beautiful. You should not go home to your country without seeing it. Are there monkeys in it? asked Jeanne no said the old gentleman turning away i adore monkeys said jeanne the car was going along a broad empty boulevard with trees and grass plots and rows of low storehouses and little dilapidated rooming houses along either side many people had got out and there was plenty of room but andrews kept his arm round the girl's waist the constant contact with her body made him feel very languid how good it smells said jeanne it's the spring i want to lie on the grass and eat violets oh how good you were to bring me out like this jeanne you must know lots of fine ladies you could have brought out because you are so well educated how is it you are only an ordinary soldier good god i wouldn't be an officer why it must be rather nice to be an officer does Etienne want to be an officer? But he's socialist, that's different. Well, I suppose I must be a socialist, too. But let's talk of something else. Andrews moved over to the other side of the platform. They were passing little villas with gardens on the road where yellow and pale purple crocuses bloomed. Now and then there was a scent of violets in the moist air. The sun had disappeared under soft, purplish-gray clouds. There was occasionally a rainy chill in the wind. Andrew suddenly thought of Geneviève Rogue, curious how vividly he remembered her face, her wide, open eyes, and her way of smiling without moving her firm lips. A feeling of annoyance went through him. How silly of him to go off rudely like that! And he became very anxious to talk to her again. Things he wanted to say to her came to his mind. Well, are you asleep? said Jeanne, tugging at his arm. Here we are. Andrews flushed furiously. Oh, how nice it is here! How nice it is here! Jeanne was saying. Why, it is eleven o'clock, said Andrews. We must see the palace before lunch, cried Jeanne, and she started running up a lane of linden trees, where the fat buds were just bursting into little crinkling fans of green. New grass was sprouting in the wet ditches on either side. Andrews ran after her, his feet pounding hard in the moist gravel road. When he caught up to her, he threw his arms around her recklessly and kissed her panting mouth. She broke away from him and strode demurely, arranging her hat. Monster, she said, I trimmed this hat especially to come out with you and you do your best to wreck it. Poor little hat said Andrews, but it is so beautiful today, and you are very lovely, Jeanne. The great Napoleon must have said that to the Empress Josephine, and you know what he did to her, said Jeanne, almost solemnly. 
but she must have been awfully bored with him long before. No, said Jeanne, that's how women are. They went through big iron gates into the palace grounds. Later they sat at a table in the garden of a little restaurant. The sun, very pale, had just showed itself, making the knives and forks and the white wine in their glasses gleam faintly. Lunch had not come yet. They sat looking at each other silently. Andrews felt weary and melancholy. He could think of nothing to say. Jeanne was playing with some tiny white daisies with pink tips to their petals, arranging them in circles and crosses on the tablecloth. Aren't they slow? said Andrews. But it's nice here, isn't it? Jeanne smiled brilliantly. But how glum he looks now! She threw some daisies at him. Then, after a pause, she added mockingly, It's hunger, my dear. Good Lord, how dependent men are on food. Andrews drank down his wine at a gulp. He felt that if he could only make an effort, he could lift off the stifling melancholy that was settling down on him like a weight that kept growing heavier. A man in khaki with his face and neck scarlet staggered into the garden dragging beside him a mud-encrusted bicycle. He sank into an iron chair, letting the bicycle fall with a clatter at his feet. "'Hi! Hi!' he called in a hoarse voice. A waiter appeared and contemplated him suspiciously. The man in khaki had hair as red as his face, which was glistening with sweat. His shirt was torn and he had no coat. His breeches and puttees were invisible for mud. "'Give me a beer,' croaked the man in khaki. The waiter shrugged his shoulders and walked away. "'You demande une bière,' said Andrews. "'Mais, monsieur, I'll pay. Get it for him.' The waiter disappeared. "'Thank ye, Yank!' roared the man in khaki. The waiter brought a tall, narrow, yellow glass. The man in khaki took it from his hand, drank it down at a draught, and handed back the empty glass. Then he spat, wiped his mouth on the back of his hand, got with difficulty to his feet, and shambled towards Andrews's table. "'I presume the lady and you don't mind, Yank, if I parleys with you a bit, do yous?' "'No, come along.' Where did you come from? The man in khaki dragged an iron chair behind him to a spot near the table. Before sitting down, he bobbed his head in the direction of Jeanne, with an air of solemnity, tugging at the same time at a lock of his red hair. After some fumbling, he got a red-bordered handkerchief out of his pocket and wiped his face with it, leaving a long black smudge of machine oil on his forehead. I'm a bearer of important secret messages, Yank he said, leaning back in the little iron chair. I'm a dispatch rider. You look all in. Not a bit of it. Or just a little hold-up, that's all. In a good little lane. Some buggers tried to do me in. What do you mean? I guess they had a little information, that's all. I'm carrying important messages from our headquarters in Rouen to your president. I was going through a bloody ticket past this side. I don't know how you pronounce the bloody town. I was on my bike making about thirty for the road, and was all a murk when I saw four buggers standing across the road. Looked to me suspicious like, so I just jammed the juice into the bike and made for the middle one. He dodged all right. Then they started shooting, and a bloody bullet buggered the bike. It was being born with a call that saved me. I picked myself up out of the ditch and lost him in the woods. Then I got to another bloody town and commandeered this old sweatin' machine. How many kills is there to Paris, Yank? Fifteen or sixteen, I think. What's he saying, Jean? Some men tried to stop him on the road. He's a dispatch rider. Isn't he ugly? Is he English? Irish. You bet you, miss. Here, Londe, that's me. You picked a good looker this time, Yank. But wait till I get to Paris. I clean up a good hundred pound on this job in bonuses. What part you come from, Yank? Virginia. I live in New York. I've been in Detroit. Going back there to get in the automobile business soon as I clean up a few more bonuses. Europe's dead and stinkin', Yank. Ain't no place for a young fella. It's dead and stinkin', that's what it is. 
Oh, it's pleasanter to live here than in America. Say, do you often get held up that way? Ain't happened to me before, but it has to pals of mine. Who do you think it was? Oh, I don't know. Uns or some of these bloody secret agents around the peace conference. But I got to go. That despatch won't keep. All right, the beer's on me. Thank you, Yank. The man got to his feet, shook hands with Andrews and Jeanne, jumped on the bicycle, and rode out of the garden to the road, threading his way through the iron chairs and tables. Wasn't he a funny customer? cried Andrews, laughing. What a wonderful joke things are. The waiter arrived with the omelette that began their lunch. Gives you an idea of how the old lava's bubbling in the volcano. There's nowhere on earth a man can dance so well as on a volcano. But don't talk that way, said Jeanne, laying down her knife and fork. It's terrible. We will waste our youth to no purpose. Our fathers enjoyed themselves when they were young. And if there had been no war, we should have been so happy, Etienne and I. My father was a small manufacturer of soap and perfumery. Etienne would have had a splendid situation. I should never have had to work. We had a nice house. I should have been married. But this way, Jeanne, don't you have more freedom? She shrugged her shoulders. Later she burst out. But what's the good of freedom? What can you do with it? What one wants is to live well and have a beautiful house and be respected by people. Oh, life was so sweet in France before the war. In that case it's not worth living, said Andrews in a savage voice, holding himself in. They went on, eating silently. The sky became overcast. A few drops splashed on the tablecloth. We'll have to take coffee inside, said Andrews. And you think it is funny that people should shoot at a man on a motorcycle going through a wood? All that seems to me terrible, terrible, said Jeanne. Look out, here comes the rain. They ran into the restaurant through the first hissing sheet of the shower and sat at a table near a window, watching the raindrops dance and flicker on the green iron tables. A scent of wet earth and the mushroom-like odor of sodden leaves came in borne on damp gusts through the open door. A waiter closed the glass doors and bolted them. "'He wants to keep out the spring. He can't,' said Andrews. They smiled at each other over their coffee cups. They were in sympathy again. When the rain stopped, they walked across wet fields by a footpath full of little clear puddles that reflected the blue sky and the white and amber-tinged clouds where the shadows were light purplish-gray. They walked slowly, arm in arm, pressing their bodies together. They were very tired, they did not know why, and stopped often to rest leaning against the damp boles of trees. Beside a pond, pale blue and amber and silver from the reflected sky, they found under a big beech tree a patch of wild violets, which Jeanne picked greedily, mixing them with the little crimson-tipped daisies in the tight bouquet. At the suburban railway station they sat silent, side by side on a bench, sniffing the flowers now and then, so sunk in languid weariness that they could hardly summon strength to climb into a seat on top of a third-class coach which was crowded with people coming home from a day in the country. Everybody had violets and crocuses and twigs with buds on them. In people's stiff, citified clothes lingered a smell of wet fields and sprouting woods. All the girls shrieked and threw their arms round the men when the train went through a tunnel or under a bridge. Whatever happened, everybody laughed. When the train arrived in the station, it was almost with reluctance that they left it, as if they felt from that moment their workaday lives began again. Andrews and Jeanne walked down the platform without touching each other. Their fingers were stained and sticky from touching buds and crushing young sappy leaves and grass stalks. The air of the city seemed dense and unbreathable after the scented moisture of the fields. They dined at a little restaurant on the Quai Voltaire, and afterwards walked slowly towards the Place Saint-Michel, feeling the wine and the warmth of the food sending new vigor into their tired bodies. Andrews had his arm round her, and they talked in low, intimate voices, hardly moving their lips, 
looking long at the men and women they saw sitting twined in each other's arms on benches, at the couples of boys and girls that kept passing them, talking slowly and quietly, as they were, bodies pressed together as theirs were. "'How many lovers there are?' said Andrews. "'Are we lovers?' asked Jeanne, with a crazy little laugh. "'I wonder. Have you ever been crazily in love, Jeanne?' "'I don't know. There is a boy in La named Marcelin. But I was a little fool then. The last news of him was from Verdun. "'Have you had many? Like I am. How sentimental we are!' she cried, laughing. "'No, I wanted to know. I know so little of life,' said Andrews. "'I have amused myself, as best I could,' said Jeanne, in a serious tone. "'But I am not frivolous. There have been very few men I have liked, so I have had few friends. Do you want to call them lovers? But lovers are what married women have on the stage. All that sort of thing is very silly.' Not so very long ago, said Andrews, I used to dream of being romantically in love, with people climbing up the ivy on castle walls and fiery kisses on balconies in the moonlight. Like at the Opera Comique, cried Jeanne, laughing. That was all very silly. But even now I want so much more of life than life can give. They leaned over the parapet and listened to the hurrying swish of the river, now soft and now loud where the reflections of the lights on the opposite bank writhed like golden snakes. Andrews noticed that there was someone beside them. The faint greenish glow from the lamp on the quay enabled him to recognize the lame boy he had talked to months ago on the boot. "'I wonder if you'll remember me,' he said. "'You are the American who was in the restaurant, Place du Tert. I don't remember when, but it was long ago.' They shook hands. "'But you are alone,' said Andrews. "'Yes, I am always alone,' said the lame boy firmly. "'Au revoir,' said Andrews. "'Good luck,' said the lame boy. Andrews heard his crutch tapping on the pavement as he went away along the quay. "'Jeanne,' said Andrews suddenly, "'you'll come home with me, won't you?' "'But you have a friend living with you.' He's gone to Brussels. He won't be back till tomorrow. I suppose one must pay for one's dinner, said Jeanne maliciously. Good God, no! Andrews buried his face in his hands. The sing-song of the river pouring through the bridges filled his ears. He wanted desperately to cry. Bitter desire that was like hatred made his flesh tingle, made his hands ache to crush her hands in them. Come along, he said gruffly. I didn't mean to say that, she said in a gentle, tired voice. You know, I'm not a very nice person. The greenish glow of the lamp lit up the contour of one of her cheeks as she tilted her head up and glimmered in her eyes. A soft, sentimental sadness suddenly took hold of Andrews. He felt as he used to feel when, as a very small child, his mother used to tell him Br'er Rabbit stories and he would feel himself drifting helplessly on the stream of her soft voice, narrating, drifting towards something unknown and very sad, which he could not help. They started walking again, past the Pont Neuf, towards the glare of the Place Saint-Michel. Three names had come into Andrews's head. Arsino, Berenike, Artemisia. For a little while he puzzled over them, and then he remembered that Geneviève Roux had the large eyes and the wide, smooth forehead and the firm little lips the women had in the portraits that were sewn on the mummy cases in the Fayum. But those patrician women of Alexandria had not had chestnut hair with a glimpse of burnished copper in it. They might have dyed it, though. "'Why are you laughing?' asked Jeanne. "'Because things are so silly.' Perhaps you mean people are silly, she said, looking up at him out of the corners of her eyes. You're right. They walked in silence till they reached to Andrews's door. You go up first and see that there's no one there, said Jeanne in a businesslike tone. 
Andrews's hands were cold. He felt his heart thumping while he climbed the stairs. The room was empty. A fire was ready to light in the small fireplace. Andrews hastily tidied up the table and kicked under the bed some soiled clothes that lay in a heap in a corner. A thought came to him. How like his performances in his room at college when he had heard that a relative was coming to see him. He tiptoed downstairs. Bien, tu peux venir, Jeanne, he said. She sat down rather stiffly in the straight-backed armchair beside the fire. How pretty the fire is, she said. Jeanne, I think I'm crazily in love with you, said Andrews in an excited voice. Like at the Opera Comique, she shrugged her shoulders. The room's nice, she said. Oh, but what a big bed. You're the first woman who's been up here in my time, Jeanne. Oh, but this uniform is frightful. Andrews thought suddenly of all the tingling bodies restrained into the rigid attitudes of automatons in uniforms like this one, of all the hideous farce of making men into machines. Oh, if some gesture of his could only free them all for life and freedom and joy. The thought drowned everything else for the moment. But you pull the button off, cried Jeanne, laughing hysterically. I'll just have to sew it on again. Never mind, if you knew how I hated them. What white skin you have, like a woman's. I suppose that's because you are blonde, said Jeanne. The sound of the door being shaken vigorously woke Andrews. He got up and stood in the middle of the floor for a moment, without being able to collect his wits. The shaking of the door continued, and he heard Walters's voice crying, Andy! Andy! Andrews felt shame creeping up through him like nausea. He felt a passionate disgust towards himself and Jeanne and Walters. He had an impulse to move furtively as if he had stolen something. He went to the door and opened it a little. Say, Walters, old man, he said, I can't let you in. I've got a girl with me. I'm sorry. I thought you wouldn't get back till tomorrow. You're kidding, aren't you? came Walters' voice out of the dark hall. No. Andrews shut the door decisively and bolted it again. Jeanne was still asleep. Her black hair had come undone and spread over the pillow. Andrews pulled the covers up about her carefully. Then he got into the other bed, where he lay awake a long time, staring at the ceiling. End of section 13。section 14 of three soldiers。this librivox recording is in the public domain。recording by m b。three soldiers by john dos passos。section 14。four。People walked along the boulevard, looking curiously through the railing at the line of men in olive drab that straggled round the edge of the courtyard. The line moved slowly, past a table where an officer and two enlisted men were poring over big lists of names and piles of palely tinted banknotes and silver francs that glittered white. Above the men's heads, a thin haze of cigarette smoke rose into the sunlight. There was a sound of voices and of feet shuffling on the gravel. The men who had been paid went off jauntily, the money jingling in their pockets. The men at the table had red faces and tense, serious expressions. They pushed the money into the soldiers' hands with a rough jerk and pronounced the names as if they were machines clicking. Andrews saw that one of the men at the table was Walters. He smiled and whispered hello as he came up to him. Walters kept his eyes fixed on the list. While Andrews was waiting for the man ahead of him to be paid, he heard two men in the line talking. Wasn't that a hell of a place? Do you remember the lad that died in the barracks one day? Sure, I was in the medics there too. There was a hell of a sergeant in that company tried to make the kid get up, and the loot came and said he'd court-martial him, and then they found out that he'd cashed in his checks. What'd he die of? Heart failure, I guess. I don't know, though. He never did take to the life. 
No. That place caused was enough to make any guy cash in his checks. Andrews got his money. As he was walking away, he strolled up to the two men he had heard talking. Were you fellows in Cosne? Sure. Did you know a fellow named Fuselli? I don't know. Sure you do, said the other man. You remember Dan Fuselli. The little wop thought he was going to be corporal. He had another thing coming. They both laughed. Andrews walked off, vaguely angry. There were many soldiers on the Boulevard Montparnasse. He turned into a side street, feeling suddenly furtive and humble, as if he would hear any minute the harsh voice of a sergeant shouting orders at him. The silver in his breeches pocket jingled with every step. Andrews leaned on the balustrade of the balcony, looking down into the square in front of the Opera Comique. He was dizzy with the beauty of the music he had been hearing. He had a sense somewhere in the distances of his mind of the great rhythm of the sea. People chattered all about him on the wide, crowded balcony, but he was only conscious of the blue-gray mistiness of the night where the lights made patterns in green gold and red gold. And compelling his attention from everything else, the rhythm swept through him like sea waves. I thought you'd be here, said Geneviève Rau in a quiet voice beside him. Andrews felt strangely tongue-tied. It's nice to see you, he blurted out, after looking at her silently for a moment. Of course you love Pelea. It is the first time I've heard it. Why haven't you been to see us? It's two weeks. We've been expecting you. I didn't know. Oh, I'll certainly come. I don't know anyone at present I can talk music to. You know me. Anyone else, I should have said. Are you working? Yes. But this hinders frightfully. Andrews yanked at the front of his tunic. Still, I expect to be free very soon. I'm putting in an application for discharge. I suppose you will feel you can do so much better. You will be much stronger now that you have done your duty. No, by no means. Tell me, what was that you played at our house? The three green riders on wild asses, said Andrews, smiling. What do you mean? It's a prelude to the Queen of Sheba, said Andrews. If you didn't think the same as Monsieur Emile Faguet and everyone else about Saint Antoine, I'd tell you what I mean. Oh, that was very silly of me. But if you pick up all the silly things people say accidentally, well, you must be angry most of the time. In the dim light he could not see her eyes. There was a little glow on the curve of her cheek coming from under the dark of her hat to her rather pointed chin. Behind it he could see other faces of men and women crowded on the balcony talking, lit up crudely by the gold glare that came out through the French windows of the lobby. I have always been tremendously fascinated by the place in La Tentation where the Queen of Sheba visited Antoine, that's all, said Andrews gruffly. Is that the first thing you've done? It made me think a little of Borodin. The first that's at all pretentious. It's probably just a steal from everything I've ever heard. No, it's good. I suppose you had it in your head all through those dreadful and glorious days at the front. Is it for piano or orchestra? All that's finished is for piano. I hope to orchestrate it eventually. Oh, but it's really silly to talk this way. I don't know enough. I need years of hard work before I can do anything. And I have wasted so much time. That is the most frightful thing. One has so few years of youth. That's the bell. We must scuttle back to our seats. Till the next intermission. She slipped through the glass doors and disappeared. Andrews went back to his seat, very excited, very full of unquiet exultation. The first strains of the orchestra were pain, he felt them so acutely. After the last act, they walked in silence down a green street, hurrying to get away from the crowds of the boulevard. When they reached the Avenue de l'Opera, she said, Did you say you were going to stay in France? Yes, indeed, if I can. 
I am going tomorrow to put in an application for discharge in France. What will you do then? I shall have to find a job of some sort that will let me study at the Scola Cantorum, but I have enough money to last a little while. You are courageous. I forgot to ask if you would rather take the metro. No, let's walk. They went under the arch of the Louvre. The air was full of a fine, wet mist, so that every street lamp was surrounded by a blur of light. My blood is full of the music of Debussy, said Geneviève Rau, spreading out her arms. It's no use trying to say what one feels about it. Words aren't much good anyway, are they? That depends. They walked silently along the quay. The mist was so thick that they could not see the Seine, but whenever they came near a bridge they could hear the water rustling through the arches. France is stifling, said Andrews all of a sudden. It stifles you very slowly, with beautiful silk bands. America beats your brains out with a policeman's billy. What do you mean? she said, letting pique chill her voice. You know so much in France. You have made the world so neat. But you seem to want to stay here, she said with a laugh. It's that there's nowhere else. There is nowhere except Paris where one can find out things about music, particularly. But I am one of those people who is not made to be contented. Only sheep are contented. I think I have been happier this month in Paris than ever before in my life. It seems six so much has happened in it. Poissac is where I am happiest. Where is that? We have a country house there very old and very tumble-down. They say that Rabelais used to come to the village. But our house is from later, from the time of Henri IV. Poissac is not very far from Tours. An ugly name, isn't it? But to me it is very beautiful. The house has orchards all around it, and yellow roses with flushed centers poke themselves in my window, and there is a little tower like Montaigne's. When I get out of the army, I shall go somewhere in the country and work and work. Music should be made in the country, when the sap is rising in the trees. D'après nature, as the rabbit man said. Who's the rabbit man? A very pleasant person, said Andrews, bubbling with laughter. You shall meet him some day. He sells little stuffed rabbits that jump outside the Café de Rouen. Here we are. Thank you for coming home with me. But how soon? Are you sure it is the house? We can't have got there as soon as this. Yes, it's my house, said Geneviève Rowe, laughing. She held out her hand to him, and he shook it eagerly. The latch key clicked in the door. Why don't you have a cup of tea with us here tomorrow? she said. With pleasure. The big varnished door with its knocker in the shape of a ring closed behind her. Andrews walked away with a light step, feeling jolly and exhilarated. As he walked down the mist-filled quay towards the Place Saint-Michel, his ears were filled with the lisping gurgle of the river past the piers of the bridges. Walters was asleep. On the table in his room was a card from Jeanne. Andrews read the card, holding it close to the candle. "'How long it is since I saw you,' she said. "'I shall pass the Café de Rouen, Wednesday at seven, along the pavement opposite the Magasin du Louvre.' It was a card of Malmaison. Andrews flushed. Bitter melancholy throbbed through him. He walked languidly to the window and looked out into the dark court. A window below his spilled a warm golden haze into the misty night, through which he could make out vaguely some pots of ferns standing on the wet flagstones. From somewhere came a dense smell of hyacinths. Fragments of thought slipped one after another through his mind. He thought of himself washing windows long ago at training camp, and remembered the way the gritty sponge scraped his hands. He could not help feeling shame when he thought of those days. 
Well, that's all over now, he told himself. He wondered, in a half-irritated way, about Geneviève Rowe. What sort of a person was she? Her face, with its wide eyes and pointed chin, and the reddish chestnut hair, unpretentiously coiled above the white forehead, was very vivid in his mind, though when he tried to remember what it was like in profile, he could not. She had thin hands, with long fingers that ought to play the piano well. When she grew old, would she be yellow-toothed and jolly, like her mother? He could not think of her old. She was too vigorous. There was too much malice in her passionately restrained gestures. The memory of her faded, and there came to his mind Jeanne's overworked little hands, with calloused places, and the tips of the fingers grimy and scarred from needlework. But the smell of hyacinths that came up from the mist-filled courtyard was like a sponge wiping all impressions from his brain. The dense, sweet smell in the damp air made him feel languid and melancholy. He took off his clothes slowly and got into bed. The smell of the hyacinths came to him very faintly, so that he did not know whether or not he was imagining it. The major's office was a large white-painted room, with elaborate mouldings and mirrors on all four walls, so that while Andrews waited, cap in hand, to go up to the desk, he could see the small round major with his pink face and bald head repeated to infinity in two directions in the grey brilliance of the mirrors. "'What do you want?' said the major, looking up from some papers he was signing. Andrews stepped up to the desk. On both sides of the room a skinny figure in olive drab, repeated endlessly, stepped up to endless mahogany desks, which faded into each other in an endless, dusty perspective. "'Would you mind okaying this application for discharge, Major?' "'How many dependents?' muttered the Major through his teeth, pouring over the application. "'None. It's for discharge in France to study music.' "'Won't do.' You need an affidavit that you can support yourself, that you have enough money to continue your studies. You want to study music, eh? Do you think you've got talent? Needs a very great deal of talent to study music. Yes, sir. But is there anything else I need except the affidavit? No, it'll go through in short order. We're glad to release men. We're glad to release any man with a good military record. Williams! Yes, sir? A sergeant came over from a small table by the door. Show this man what he needs to get discharged in France. Andrews saluted. Out of the corner of his eye he saw the figures in the mirror, saluting down an endless corridor. When he got out on the street in front of the great white building where the major's office was, a morose feeling of helplessness came over him. There were many automobiles of different sizes and shapes, Limousines, runabouts, touring cars, lined up all along the curb, all painted olive drab and neatly stenciled with numbers in white. Now and then a personage came out of the white marble building, Petit's and Sam Brown belt gleaming, and darted into an automobile, or a noisy motorcycle stopped with a jerk in front of the wide door to let out an officer in goggles and mud-splattered trench coat, who disappeared immediately through revolving doors. Andrews could imagine him striding along halls, where from every door came an imperious clicking of typewriters, where papers were piled high on yellow, varnished desks, where sallow-faced clerks in uniform loafed in rooms, where the four walls were covered from floor to ceiling with card catalogues. And every day they were adding to the paper, piling up more little drawers with index cards. It seemed to Andrews that the shiny white marble building would have to burst with all the paper stored up within it, and would flood the broad avenue with avalanches of index cards. "'Button your coat!' snarled a voice in his ear. Andrews looked up suddenly. An M.P. with a raw-looking face in which was a long, sharp nose had come up to him. Andrews buttoned up his overcoat and said nothing. "'You can't hang around here this way,' the M.P. called after him. Andrews flushed and walked away without turning his head. He was stinging with humiliation. An angry voice inside him kept telling him that he was a coward, 
that he should make some futile gesture of protest. Grotesque pictures of revolt flamed through his mind, until he remembered that when he was very small the same tumultuous pride had seethed and ached in him whenever he had been reproved by an older person. Helpless despair fluttered about within him like a bird beating against the wires of a cage. Was there no outlet, no gesture of expression? Would he have to go on this way day after day, swallowing the bitter gall of indignation that every new symbol of his slavery brought to his lips? He was walking in an agitated way across the Jardin des Tuileries, full of the little children and women with dogs on leashes and nursemaids with starched white caps, when he met Geneviève Rowe and her mother. Geneviève was dressed in pearl grey, with an elegance a little too fashionable to please Andrews. Madame Rowe wore black. In front of them a black and tan terrier ran from one side to the other, on little nervous legs that trembled like steel springs. "'Isn't it lovely this morning?' cried Geneviève. "'I didn't know you had a dog.' "'Oh, we never go out without Santo. A protection to two lone women, you know,' said Madame Rowe, laughing. "'Viens, Santo. Dis bonjour, monsieur.' "'He usually lives at Poissac,' said Geneviève. The little dog barked furiously at Andrews, a shrill bark like a child squalling. He knows he ought to be suspicious of soldiers. I imagine most soldiers would change with him if they had a chance. Viens, Santo. Viens, Santo. Will you change lives with me, Santo? You look as if you've been quarreling with somebody, said Jean Fievreau lightly. I have. I'm going to write a book on slave psychology. It would be very amusing, said Andrews in a gruff, breathless voice. "'But we must hurry, dear, or we'll be late to the tailor's,' said Madame Rowe. She held out her black-gloved hands to Andrews. "'We'll be in at tea-time this afternoon. You might play me some more of the Queen of Sheba,' said Geneviève. "'I'm afraid I shan't be able to. But you never can tell. Thank you.' He was relieved to have left them. He had been afraid he would burst out into some childish tirade. What a shame old Henslow hadn't come back yet. He could have poured out all his despair to him. He had often enough before, and Henslow was out of the army now. Wearily, Andrews decided that he would have to start scheming and intriguing again, as he had schemed and intrigued to come to Paris in the first place. He thought of the white marble building, and the officers with shiny puttees going in and out, and the typewriters clicking in every room and the understanding of his helplessness before all that complication made him shiver. An idea came to him. He ran down the steps of a metro station. Aubrey would know someone at the Crillon who could help him. But when the train reached the Concorde station, he could not summon the willpower to get out. He felt a harsh repugnance to any effort. What was the use of humiliating himself and begging favors of people? It was hopeless anyway. In a fierce burst of pride, a voice inside of him was shouting that he, John Andrews, should have no shame, that he should force people to do things for him, that he, who lived more acutely than the rest, suffering more pain and more joy, who had the power to express his pain and his joy so that it would impose itself on others, should force his will on those around him. More of the psychology of slavery, said Andrews to himself, suddenly smashing the soap bubble of his egoism. The train had reached the Porte Mayot. Andrews stood in the sunny boulevard in front of the metro station, where the plane trees were showing tiny gold-brown leaves, sniffing the smell of a flower stall in front of which a woman stood, with a deft, abstracted gesture tying up bunch after bunch of violets. He felt a desire to be out in the country, to be away from houses and people. There was a line of men and women buying tickets for Saint-Germain. Still indecisive, he joined it, and at last, almost without intending it, found himself jolting through Neuilly in the green trailer of the electric car that waggled like a duck's tail when the car went fast. He remembered his last trip on that same car with Jeanne, and wished mournfully that he might have fallen in love with her 
that he might have forgotten himself and the army and everything in crazy, romantic love. When he got off the car at Saint-Germain, he had stopped formulating his thoughts. Soggy despair throbbed in him like an infected wound. He sat for a while at the café opposite the chateau, looking at the light red walls and the strong stone-bordered windows, and the jaunty turrets and chimneys that rose above the classic balustrade with its big urns on the edge of the roof. The park, through the tall iron railings, was full of russet and pale lines, all mist of new leaves. Had they really lived more vividly, the people of the Renaissance? Andrews could almost see men with plumed hats and short cloaks and elaborate brocaded tunics, swaggering with a hand at the sword hilt about the quiet square in front of the gate of the chateau. And he thought of the great, sudden wind of freedom that had blown out of Italy, before which dogmas and slaveries had crumbled to dust. In contrast, the world today seemed pitifully arid. Men seemed to have shrunk in stature before the vastness of the mechanical contrivances they had invented. Michelangelo, da Vinci, Aretino, Cellini, would the strong figures of men ever so dominate the world again? Today everything was congestion, the scurrying of crowds. Men had become ant-like. Perhaps it was inevitable that the crowds should sink deeper and deeper in slavery. Whichever one, tyranny from above or spontaneous organization from below, there could be no individuals. He went through the gates into the park, laid out with a few flower beds where pansies bloomed. Through the dark ranks of elm trunks was brilliant sky, with here and there a moss-green statue standing out against it. At the head of an alley, he came out on a terrace. Beyond the strong curves of the pattern of the iron balustrade was an expanse of country, pale green, falling to blue towards the horizon, patched with pink and slate-colored houses and carved with railway tracks. At his feet the Seine shone like a curved sword-blade. He walked with long strides along the terrace and followed a road that turned into the forest forgetting the monotonous treadmill of his thoughts, in the flush that the fast walking sent through his whole body, in the rustling silence of the woods, where the moss on the north side of the boles of the trees was emerald, and where the sky was soft grey through a lavender lacework of branches. The green, gnarled woods made him think of the last act of Pelea. With his tunic unbuttoned and his shirt open at the neck, and his hands stuck deep in his pockets, he went along whistling like a schoolboy. After an hour he came out of the woods on a high road where he found himself walking beside a two-wheeled cart that kept pace with him exactly, try as he would to get ahead of it. After a while a boy leaned out. Hey, l'Américain! Vous voulez monter? Where are you going? Conflans saint honorine Where's that? The boy flourished his whip vaguely towards the horse's head. All right, said Andrews. These are potatoes, said the boy. Make yourself comfortable. Andrews offered him a cigarette, which he took with muddy fingers. He had a broad face, red cheeks, and chunky features. Reddish-brown hair escaped spikily from under a mud-spattered beret. Where did you say you were going? Conflans saint honorine Silly all these saints, aren't they? Andrews laughed. Where are you going? the boy asked. I don't know. I was taking a walk. The boy leaned over to Andrews and whispered in his ear. Deserter? No, I had a day off and wanted to see the country. I just thought, if you were a deserter I might be able to help you. Must be silly to be a soldier. Dirty life. But you like the country. So do I. You can't call this country. I'm not from this part. I'm from Brittany. There we have real country. It's stifling near Paris here. So many people, so many houses. It seems mighty fine to me. That's because you're a soldier. Better than barracks, huh? Dirty life, that. I'll never be a soldier. I'm going into the Navy, Merchant Marine. 
and then if I have to do service, I'll do it on the sea. I suppose it is pleasanter. There's more freedom, and the sea. We Breton, you know, we all die of the sea or of liquor. They laughed. Have you been long in this part of the country? asked Andrews. Six months. It's very dull, this farming work. I'm head of a gang in a fruit orchard, but not for long. I have a brother shipped on a sailing vessel. When he comes back to Bordeaux, I'll ship out on the same boat. Where to? South America, Peru. How should I know? I'd like to ship on a sailing vessel, said Andrews. You would? It seems very fine to me to travel and see new countries. And perhaps I shall stay over there. Where? How should I know, if I like it, that is? Life is very bad in Europe. It is stifling, I suppose, said Andrews slowly. All these nations, all these hatreds. But still, it is very beautiful. Life is very ugly in America. Let's have something to drink. There's a bistro. The boy jumped down from the cart and tied the horse to a tree. They went into a small wine shop with a counter and one square oak table. "'But won't you be late?' said Andrews. "'I don't care. I like talking, don't you?' "'Yes, indeed.' They ordered wine of an old woman in a green apron, who had three yellow teeth that protruded from her mouth when she spoke. "'I haven't had anything to eat,' said Andrews. "'Wait a minute.' The boy ran out to the cart and came back with a canvas bag, from which he took half a loaf of bread and some cheese. My name's Marcel, the boy said when they had sat for a while sipping wine. Mine is Jean, Jean André. Ha! <laughs> I have a brother named Jean, and my father's name is André. That's pleasant, isn't it? But it must be a splendid job working in a fruit orchard, said Andrews, munching bread and cheese. It's well paid, but you get tired of being in one place all the time. It's not as it is in Brittany. Marcel paused. He sat, rocking a little on the stool, holding on to the seat between his legs. A curious brilliance came into his grey eyes. There, he went on in a soft voice, it is so quiet in the fields, and from every hill you look at the sea. I like that, don't you? He turned to Andrews with a smile. You are lucky to be free, said Andrews bitterly. He felt as if he would burst into tears. But you will be demobilized soon. The butchery is over. You will go home to your family. That will be good, huh? I wonder. It's not far enough away. Restless. What do you expect? A fine rain was falling. They climbed in on the potato sacks and the horse started a jog trot. Its lanky brown shanks glistened a little from the rain. Do you come out this way often? asked Marcel. I shall. It's the nicest place near Paris. Some Sunday you must come out and I'll take you round. The castle is very fine. And then there is Malmaison, where the great emperor lived with the empress Josephine. Andrew suddenly remembered Jeanne's card. This was Wednesday. He pictured her dark figure among the crowd of the pavement in front of the Café de Rouen. Of course it had to be that way. Despair, so helpless as to be almost sweet, came over him. And girls, he said to Marcel, are they pretty round here? Marcel shrugged his shoulders. It's not women that we lack, if a fellow has money, he said. Andrews felt a sense of shame. He did not exactly know why. My brother writes that in South America the women are very brown and very passionate, added Marcel with a wistful smile. But traveling and reading books, that's what I like. But look, if you want to take the train back to Paris. Marcel pulled up the horse to a standstill. If you want to take the train, cross that field by the footpath and keep right along the road, to the left, till you come to the river. There's a ferryman. The town's Herblay, and there's a station. And any Sunday before noon, I'll be at Trois Rue des Eveques. Rui, you must come and we'll take a walk together. They shook hands, 
and Andrews strode off across the wet fields. Something strangely sweet and wistful that he could not analyze lingered in his mind from Marcel's talk. Somewhere, beyond everything, he was conscious of the great free rhythm of the sea. Then he thought of the major's office that morning, and of his own skinny figure in the mirrors, repeated endlessly, standing helpless and humble before the shining mahogany desk. Even out here in these fields where the wet earth seemed to heave with the sprouting of new growth he was not free. In those office buildings, with white marble halls full of the clank of officers' heels, in index cards and piles of typewritten papers, his real self, which they had power to kill if they wanted to, was in his name and his number, on lists with millions of other names and other numbers. This sentient body of his, full of possibilities and hopes and desires, was only a pale ghost that depended on the other self, that suffered for it and cringed for it. He could not drive out of his head the picture of himself, skinny in an ill-fitting uniform, repeated endlessly in the two mirrors of the Major's white-painted office. All of a sudden, through bare poplar trees, he saw the Seine. He hurried along the road, splashing now and then in a shining puddle, until he came to a landing place. The river was very wide, silvery, streaked with pale green and violet, and straw color from the evening sky. Opposite were bare poplars, and behind them clusters of buff-colored houses climbing up a green hill to a church, all repeated upside down in the color-streaked river. The river was very full and welled up above its banks, the way the water stands up above the rim of a glass filled too full. From the water came an indefinable rustling, flowing sound that rose and fell with quiet rhythm in Andrews's ears. Andrews forgot everything in the great wave of music that rose impetuously through him, poured with the hot blood through his veins, with the streaked colors of the river and the sky through his eyes, with the rhythm of the flowing river through his ears. Five. So I came without, said Andrews, laughing. What fun, cried Genevieve. But anyway, they couldn't do anything to you. Chartres is so near. It's at the gates of Paris. They were alone in the compartment. The train had pulled out of the station and was going through suburbs where the trees were in leaf in the gardens and fruit trees foamed above the red brick walls among the box-like villas. Anyway, said Andrews, it was an opportunity not to be missed. That must be one of the most amusing things about being a soldier, avoiding regulations. I wonder whether Damocles didn't really enjoy his sword, don't you think so? They laughed. But Mother was very doubtful about my coming with you this way. She's such a dear. She wants to be very modern and liberal, but she always gets frightened at the last minute. And my aunt will think the world's end has come when we appear. They went through some tunnels, and when the train stopped at Sèvres, had a glimpse of the Seine Valley, where the blue mist made a patina over the soft pea-green of new leaves. Then the train came out on wide plains, full of the glaucous shimmer of young oats and the golden green of fresh sprinkled wheat fields, where the mist on the horizon was purplish. The train's shadow, blue, sped along beside them over the grass and fences. How beautiful it is to go out of the city this way in the early morning. Has your aunt a piano? Yes, a very old and tinkly one. It would be amusing to play you all I have done at the Queen of Sheba. You say the most helpful things. It is that I'm interested. I think you will do something some day. Andrew shrugged his shoulders. They sat silent their ears filled up by the jerking rhythm of wheels over rails, now and then looking at each other almost furtively. Outside, fields and hedges and patches of blossom, and poplar trees faintly powdered with green, unrolled like a screen before them, behind the nicker of telegraph poles and the festooned wires on which the sun gave glints of red copper. 
Andrews discovered all at once that the coppery glint on the telegraph wires was the same as the glint in Genevieve's hair. Berenike, Artemisia, Arsino, the names lingered in his mind. So that as he looked out of the window at the long curves of the telegraph wires that seemed to rise and fall as they glided past, he could imagine her face with its large pale brown eyes and its small mouth and broad smooth forehead suddenly stilled into the encaustic painting on the mummy case of some alexandrian girl tell me she said when did you begin to write music andrews brushed the light disordered hair off his forehead why i think i forgot to brush my hair this morning he said you see i was so excited by the idea of coming to chartres with you they laughed but my mother taught me to play the piano when i was very small he went on seriously she and i lived alone in an old house belonging to her family in virginia how different all that was from anything you have ever lived it would not be possible in europe to be as isolated as we were in virginia mother was very unhappy she had led a dreadfully thwarted life that unrelieved hopeless misery that only a woman can suffer she used to tell me stories and i used to make up little tunes about them and about anything the great success he laughed was i remember to a dandelion i can remember so well the way mother pursed her lips up as she leaned over the writing desk she was very tall and as it was dark in our old sitting-room had to lean far over to see she used to spend hours making beautiful copies of tunes i made up my mother is the only person who has ever really had any importance in my life but i lack technical training terribly do you think it is so important said Genevieve, leaning towards him to make herself heard above the clatter of the train well, perhaps it is i don't know i think it always comes sooner or later if you feel intensely enough but it is frightful to feel all you want to express getting away beyond you an idea comes into your head and you feel it grow stronger and stronger and you can't grasp it you have no means to express it it's like standing on a street corner and seeing a gorgeous procession go by without being able to join it or like opening a bottle of beer and having it foam all over you without having a glass to pour it into genevieve burst out laughing but you can drink from the bottle can't you she said her eyes sparkling i'm trying to said andrews here we are there's the cathedral no it's hidden cried Genevieve. They got to their feet. As they left the station, Andrews said, But after all, it's only freedom that matters. When I'm out of the army... Yes, I suppose you are right. For you, that is. The artist should be free from any sort of entanglement. I don't see what difference there is between an artist and any other sort of workman, said Andrews savagely. No, but look... From the square where they stood, above the green blur of a little park, they could see the cathedral, creamy yellow and rust color, with the sober tower and the gaudy tower and the great rose window between, the whole pile standing nonchalantly, knee-deep in the packed roofs of the town. They stood shoulder to shoulder, looking at it without speaking. In the afternoon, they walked down the hill towards the river that flowed through a quarter of tottering, peak-gabled houses and mills, from which came a sound of grinding wheels. Above them, towering over gardens full of pear-trees in bloom, the apse of the cathedral bulged against the pale blue sky. On a narrow and very ancient bridge, they stopped and looked at the water, full of a shimmering of blue and green and grey from the sky and from the vivid new leaves of the willow trees along the bank. Their senses glutted with the beauty of the day and the intricate magnificence of the cathedral, languid with all they had seen and said, they were talking of the future with quiet voices. It's all in forming a habit of work, Andrews was saying. You have to be a slave to get anything done. It's all a question of choosing your master, don't you think so? Yes, I suppose all the men who have left their imprint on people's lives have been slaves in a sense, 
said Genevieve slowly. Everyone has to give up a great deal of life to live anything deeply. But it's worth it. She looked Andrews full in the eyes. Yes, I think it's worth it, said Andrews. But you must help me. Now I am like a man who has come up out of a dark cellar. I am almost too dazzled by the gorgeousness of everything. But at least I am out of the cellar. Look, a fish jumped, cried Genevieve. I wonder if we could hire a boat anywhere. Don't you think it would be fun to go out in a boat? A voice broke in on Genevieve's answer. Let's see your pass, will you? Andrews turned round. A soldier with a round brown face and red cheeks stood beside him on the bridge. Andrews looked at him fixedly. A little zigzag scar above his left eye showed white on his heavily tanned skin. Let's see your pass, the man said again. He had a high-pitched, squeaky voice. Andrews felt the blood thumping in his ears. Are you an MP? Yes. Well, I'm in the Sorbonne detachment. What the hell's that? said the MP, laughing thinly. What does he say? asked Genevieve, smiling. Uh, nothing. I'll have to go to see the officer and explain, said Andrews in a breathless voice. You go back to your aunt's, and I'll come as soon as I've arranged it. No, I'll come with you. Please go back. It may be serious. I'll come as soon as I can, said Andrews harshly. She walked up the hill with swift, decisive steps, without turning round. Tough luck, buddy, said the M.P. She's a good looker. I'd like to have a half hour with her myself. Look here, I'm in the Sorbonne School Detachment in Paris, and I came down here without a pass. Is there anything I can do about it? They'll fix you up, don't worry, cried the M.P. shrilly. You ain't a member of the general staff in disguise, are you? School Detachment. Gee, but won't Bill Huggis laugh when he hears that? You pulled the best one yet, buddy. But come along, he added in a confidential tone. If you come quiet, I won't put the handcuffs on you. How do I know you're an M.P.? You'll know soon enough. They turned down a narrow street between grey stucco walls leprous with moss and water stains. At a chair inside the window of a small wine shop, a man with a red M.P. badge sat smoking. He got up when he saw them pass and opened the door with one hand on his pistol holder. "'I got one bird, Bill,' said the man, shoving Andrews roughly in the door. "'Good for you, handsome. Is he quiet?' "'Hm,' handsome grunted. "'Sit down there. If you move, you'll get a bullet in your guts.' The M.P. stuck out a square jaw. He had a sallow skin, puffy under his eyes that were grey and lusterless. "'He says he's in some goddamn school detachment.' First time that's been pulled, ain't it? School detachment. Do you mean an OTC? Bill sank laughing into his chair by the window, spreading his legs out over the floor. Ain't that rich? said Handsome, laughing shrilly again. Got any papers on you? You must have some sort of papers. Andrews searched his pockets. He flushed. I ought to have a school pass. You sure ought. Gee, this guy's simple, said Bill, leaning far back in the chair and blowing smoke through his nose. Look at his dog tag, handsome. The man strode over to Andrews and jerked open the top of his tunic. Andrews pulled his body away. I haven't got any on. I forgot to put any on this morning. <laughs> no tag, no insignia. Yes, I have. Infantry. <sighs> no papers. No papers. I bet he's been out a hell of a time, said Handsome meditatively. Better put the cuffs on him, said Bill in the middle of a yawn. Let's wait a while. When's the loot coming? Not till night. Sure? Yes, ain't no train. How about a sidecar? No, I know he ain't coming, snarled Bill. Well, what do you say we have a little liquor, Bill? But this bloke's got money. You'll set us up to a glass of cognac, won't you, school detachment? Andrews sat very stiff in his chair, staring at them. Yes, he said. Order up what you like. 
Keep an eye on him, handsome. You never can tell what this quiet kind's likely to pull off on you. Bill Huggis strode out of the room with heavy steps. In a moment he came back, swinging a bottle of cognac in his hand. Told the madame you'd pay, skinny, said the man as he passed Andrews's chair. Andrews nodded. The two MPs drew up to the table beside which Andrews sat. Andrews could not keep his eyes off them. Bill Huggis hummed as he pulled the cork out of the bottle. It's the smile that makes you happy, it's the smile that makes you sad. Handsome watched him, grinning. Suddenly they both burst out laughing. And the damn fool thinks he's in a school battalion, said Handsome in his shrill voice. It'll be another kind of battalion you'll be in, Skinny, cried Bill Huggis. He stifled his laughter with a long drink from the bottle. He smacked his lips. Not so goddamn bad, he said. Then he started humming again. It's the smile that makes you happy, it's the smile that makes you sad. Have some, Skinny, said Handsome, pushing the bottle towards Andrews. No thanks, said Andrews. You won't be getting good cognac where you're going, Skinny, not by a damn sight, growled Bill Huggis in the middle of a laugh. All right, I'll take a swig. An idea suddenly came into Andrews's head. Gee, the bastard can drink cognac, cried Handsome. Got enough money to buy us another bottle? Andrews nodded. He wiped his mouth absently with the handkerchief. He had drunk the raw cognac without tasting it. Get another bottle, handsome, said Bill Huggis carelessly. A purplish flush had appeared in the lower part of his cheeks. When the other man came back, he burst out laughing. <laughs> the last cognac this skinny guy from the detachment will get for many a day. Better drink up strong, skinny. They don't have that stuff down on the farm. <laughs> School detachment. I'll be goddamned. He leaned back in his chair, shaking with laughter. Handsome's face was crimson. Only the zigzag scar over his eye remained white. He was swearing in a low voice as he worked the cork out of the bottle. Andrews could not keep his eyes off the men's faces. They went from one to the other in spite of him. Now and then, for an instant, he caught a glimpse of the yellow and brown squares of the wallpaper and the bar with a few empty bottles behind it. He tried to count the bottles. One, two, three. But he was staring in the lusterless gray eyes of Bill Huggis, who lay back in his chair, blowing smoke out of his nose, now and then reaching for the cognac bottle, all the while humming faintly under his breath. It's the smile that makes you happy, it's the smile that makes you sad. Handsome sat with his elbows on the table and his chin in his beefy hands. His face was flushed crimson, but the skin was softly molded, like a woman's. The light in the room was beginning to grow gray. Handsome and Bill Huggis stood up. A young officer, with clearly marked features and a campaign hat worn a little on one side, came in, stood with his feet wide apart in the middle of the floor. Andrews went up to him. I'm in the Sorbonne detachment, lieutenant, stationed in Paris. Don't you know enough to salute, said the officer, looking him up and down. One of you men teach him how to salute, he said slowly. Handsome made a step towards Andrews and hit him with his fist between the eyes. There was a flash of light and the room swung round, and there was a splitting crash as his head struck the floor. He got to his feet. The fist hit him in the same place, blinding him. The three figures and the bright oblong of the window swung round. A chair crashed down with him, and a hard rap on the back of his skull brought momentary blackness. That's enough. Let him be, he heard a voice far away at the end of a black tunnel. A great weight seemed to be holding him down as he struggled to get up, blinded by tears and blood. Rending pains darted like arrows through his head. There were handcuffs on his wrists. Get up! snarled a voice. He got to his feet. Faint light came through the streaming tears in his eyes. His forehead flamed as if hot coals were being pressed against it. Prisoner, attention, shouted the officer's voice. March! Automatically, Andrews lifted one foot and then the other. He felt in his face the cool air of the street. 
On either side of him were the hard steps of the MPs. Within him, a nightmare voice was shrieking, shrieking. End of section 14「Section 15 of Three Soldiers」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by M. B. Three Soldiers by John Dos Passos. Section 15. Part 6. Under the Wheels. 1. The uncovered garbage cans clattered as they were thrown one by one into the truck. Dust and a smell of putrid things hung in the air about the men as they worked. A guard stood by with his legs wide apart and his rifle butt on the pavement between them. The early mist hung low, hiding the upper windows of the hospital. From the door beside which the garbage cans were ranged came a thick odor of carbolic. The last garbage can rattled into place on the truck. The four prisoners and the guard clambered on, finding room as best they could among the cans, from which dripped bloody bandages, ashes, and bits of decaying food and the truck rumbled off towards the incinerator, through the streets of Paris that sparkled with the gaiety of early morning. The prisoners wore no tunics. Their shirts and breeches had dark stains of grease and mud. On their hands were torn canvas gloves. The guard was a sheepish, pink-faced youth who kept gritting apologetically, and had trouble keeping his balance when the truck went round corners. How many days do they keep a guy on this job, Happy? asked a boy with mild blue eyes and a creamy complexion and reddish curly hair. Damned if I know, kid. As long as they please, I guess, said the bull-necked man next him, who had a lined prize-fighter's face with a heavy protruding jaw. Then, after looking at the boy for a minute, with his face twisted into an astonished sort of grin, he went on, Say, kid, how in the hell did you get here? Robin the Cradle, I call it, to send you here, kid. I stole a Ford, the boy answered cheerfully. Like hell you did? I sold it for five hundred francs. Happy laughed and caught hold of an ash can to keep from being thrown out of the jolting truck. Can you beat that guard? he cried. Ain't that something? The guard sniggered. Didn't send me to Leavenworth because I was so young went on the kid placidly. "'How old are you, kid?' asked Andrews, who was leaning against the driver's seat. Seventeen, said the boy, blushing and casting his eyes down. "'He must have lied like hell to get in this goddamn army,' boomed the deep voice of the truck driver, who had leaned over to spit a long squirt of tobacco juice. The truck driver jammed the brakes on. The garbage cans banged against each other. The kid cried out in pain. Hold your horses, can't you? You nearly broke my leg. The truck driver was swearing in a long string of words. God damn these dreamin', sky-gazin' sons of French bastards. Why don't they get out of your way? Get out and crank her up, Happy. Guess a feller'd be lucky if he'd break his leg or something. Don't you think so, Skinny? said the fourth prisoner in a low voice. It'll take more than a broken leg to get you out of this labor battalion, hoggin' back. Won't it, guard? said Happy as he climbed on again. The truck jolted away, trailing a haze of cinder dust and a sour stench of garbage behind it. Andrews noticed all at once that they were going down the quay along the river. Notre Dame was rosy in the misty sunlight, the color of lilacs in full bloom. He looked at it fixedly a moment, and then away. He felt very far from it like a man looking at the stars from the bottom of a pit. "'My mate, he's gone to Leavenworth for five years,' said the kid when they had been silent some time, listening to the rattle of the garbage cans as the trucks jolted over the cobbles. "'Helped you steal the Ford, did he?' asked Happy. "'Ford nothing. He sold an ammunition train. He was a railroad man. He was a mason. That's why he only got five years.' I guess five years in Leavenworth's enough for anybody, muttered Hoggenback, scowling. He was a square-shouldered dark man who always hung his head when he worked. 
We didn't meet up till we got to Paris. We was on a hell of a party together at the Olympia. That's where they picked us up. Took us to the Bastille. Ever been in the Bastille? I have, said Hoggenback. Ain't no joke, is it? Christ, said Hoggenback. His face flushed a furious red. He turned away and looked at the civilians walking briskly along the early morning streets, at the waiters in shirt-sleeves swabbing off the café tables, at the women pushing handcarts full of bright-colored vegetables over the cobblestones. "'I guess they ain't nobody gone through with what we guys go through with,' said Happy. "'It'd be better if the old war was still a-goin', to my way of thinking. They'd chuck us into the trenches, then. Ain't so low as this.' "'Look lively!' shouted the truck-driver as the truck stopped in a dirty yard full of cinder piles. Ain't got all day. Five more loads to get yet. The guard stood by with angry face and stiff limbs, for he feared there were officers about, and the prisoners started unloading the garbage cans. Their nostrils were full of the stench of putrescence. Between their lips was a gritty taste of cinders. The air in the dark mess-shack was thick with steam from the kitchen at one end. The men filed past the counter, holding out their mess-kits, into which the K.P.s splashed the food. Occasionally someone stopped to ask for a larger helping in an ingratiating voice. They ate packed together at long tables of roughly planed boards, stained from the constant spilling of grease and coffee, and still wet from a perfunctory scrubbing. Andrews sat at the end of a bench, near the door through which came the glimmer of twilight, eating slowly, surprised at the relish with which he ate the greasy food, and at the exhausted contentment that had come over him almost in spite of himself. Hoggenback sat opposite him. Funny, he said to Hoggenback, it's not really as bad as I thought it would be. What do you mean, this labor battalion? Hell, a fellow can put up with anything. That's one thing you learn in the army. I guess people would rather put up with things than make an effort to change them. Huh, <laughs> you're goddamn right. Got a butt? Andrews handed him a cigarette. They got to their feet and walked out into the twilight, holding their mess kits in front of them. As they were washing their mess kits in a tub of greasy water where bits of food floated in a thick scum, Hoggenback suddenly said in a low voice, but it all piles up, buddy. Some day there'll be an accountant. Do you believe in religion? No. Neither do I. I come of folks as done their own accountant. My father and my grandfather before him. A fellow can't eat his bile day after day, day after day. I'm afraid he can, Hoggenback, broke in Andrews. They walked towards the barracks. God damn it, no, cried Hoggenback aloud. There comes a point where you can't eat your bile any more, where it don't do no good to cuss. Then you runs amuck. Hanging his head, he went slowly into the barracks. Andrews leaned against the side of the building, staring up at the sky. He was trying desperately to think, to pull together a few threads of his life in this moment of respite from the nightmare. In five minutes the bugle would din his ears and he would be driven into the barracks. A tune came to his head that he played with eagerly for a moment, and then, as memory came to him, tried to efface with a shudder of disgust. There's the smile that makes you happy, there's the smile that makes you sad. It was almost dark. Two men walked slowly by in front of him. Sarge, may I speak to you? came a voice in a whisper. The sergeant grunted. I think there's two guys trying to break loose out of here. Who? If you're wrong, it'll be the worst for you, remember that. Surly and Watson. I heard him talking about it behind the latrine. Damn fools. They was saying they'd rather be dead than keep up this life. They did, did they? Don't talk so loud, Sarge. It wouldn't do for any of the fellows to know I was talking to you. Say, Sarge, the voice became whining, don't you think I've nearly served my time down here? What do I know about that? Taint my job. 
but sarge i used to be company clerk with my old outfit don't you need a guy round the office andrews strode past them into the barracks dull fury possessed him he took off his clothes and got silently into his blankets hoggenback and happy were talking beside his bug never you mind said hoggenback somebody'll get that guy sooner or later get him nothin the fellers in that camp was so damn skeered they jumped if you snapped your fingers at him it's the discipline i'm tellin you it gets a fellow in the end said happy andrews lay without speaking listening to their talk aching in every muscle from the crushing work of the day they court-martialed that guy a fella told me went on hoggenback and what do you think they did to him retired on half pay he was a major God, if I ever get out of this army, I'll be so goddamn glad, began Happy. Hoggenback interrupted. Then you'll forget all about the raw deal they gave you and tell everybody how fine you liked it. Andrews felt the mocking notes of the bugle outside stabbing his ears. A non-com's voice roared, Quiet! from the end of the building, and the lights went out. Already Andrews could hear the deep breathing of men asleep. He lay awake, staring into the darkness, his body throbbing with the monotonous rhythms of the work of the day. He seemed still to hear the sickening whine in the man's voice as he talked to the sergeant outside in the twilight. And shall I be reduced to that? he was asking himself. Andrews was leaving the latrine when he heard a voice call softly, Skilly! Yes, he said. Come here, I want to talk to you. It was the kid's voice. There was no light in the ill-smelling shack that served for a latrine. Outside they could hear the guard humming softly to himself as he went back and forth before the barracks door. Let's you and me be buddies, Skinny. Sure, said Andrews. Say, what do you think the chance is of cutting loose? Pretty damn poor, said Andrews. Couldn't you just make a noise like a hoop and roll away? They giggled softly. Andrews put his hand on the boy's arm. But kid, it's too risky. I got in this fix by taking a risk. I don't feel like beginning over again, and if they catch you it's desertion. Leavenworth for twenty years or life. That'd be the end of everything. Well, what the hell's this? Oh, I don't know. They've got to let us out some day. Shh! Shh! Kid put his hand suddenly over Andrews' mouth. They stood rigid so that they could hear their hearts pounding. Outside there was a brisk step on the gravel. The sentry halted and saluted. The steps faded into the distance, and the sentry's humming began again. They put two fellas in the jug for a month for talking like we are. In solitary, whispered Kid. But Kid, I haven't got the guts to try anything now. Sure you have, Skinny. You and me's got more guts than all the rest of them put together. God, if people had guts, you couldn't treat them like they were curs. Look, if I can ever get out of this, I've got a hunch I can make a good thing writing movie scenarios. I want to get on in the world, Skinny. But, kid, you won't be able to go back to the States. I don't care. New Rochelle's not the whole world. They got the movies in Italy, ain't they? Sure. Let's go to bed. All right. Look, you and me are buddies from now on, Skinny. Andrews felt the kid's hand press his arm. In the dark, airless bunk, in the lowest of three tiers, Andrews lay awake a long time, listening to the snores and the heavy breathing about him. Thoughts fluttered restlessly in his head, but in his blank hopelessness he could only frown and bite his lips and roll his head from side to side on the rolled-up tunic he used for a pillow listening with desperate attention to the heavy breathing of the men who slept above him and beside him. When he fell asleep, he dreamed that he was alone with Geneviève Rowe in the concert hall of the Scola Cantorum, and that he was trying desperately hard to play some tune for her on the violin, a tune he kept forgetting. And in the agony of trying to remember, the tears streamed down his cheeks. Then he had his arms round Geneviève's shoulders and was kissing her, kissing her, until he found that it was a wooden board he was kissing, 
a wooden board on which was painted a face with broad forehead and great pale brown eyes and small tight lips and all the while a boy who seemed to be both chrisfield and the kid kept telling him to run or the m p s would get him then he sat frozen in icy terror with a bottle in his hand while a frightful voice behind him sang very loud there's the smile that makes you happy there's the smile that makes you sad the bugle woke him and he sat up with such a start that he hit his head hard against the bunk above him he lay back cringing from the pain like a child but he had to hurry desperately to get his clothes on in time for roll call it was with a feeling of relief that he found that mess was not ready and that men were waiting in line outside the kitchen shack stamping their feet and clattering their mess kits as they moved about through the chilly twilight of the spring morning andrews found he was standing behind hoggenback how'd she come in skinny whispered hoggenback in his low mysterious voice oh we're all in the same boat said andrews with a laugh wish it'd sink muttered the other man do you know he went on after a pause I kind of thought an educated guy like you'd be able to keep out of a mess like this. I wasn't brought up without education, but I guess I didn't have enough. I guess most of them can. I don't see that it's much to the point. A man suffers as much if he doesn't know how to read and write as if he had a college education. I don't know, Skinny. A fellow who's led a rough life can put up with an awful lot. I'm a lumberman by trade, and my dad's cleaned up a pretty thing in war contracts just a short time ago. He could have got me in the engineers if I hadn't gone off and enlisted. Why did you? Oh, I was restless like. I guess I wanted to see the world. I didn't care about the goddamn war, but I wanted to see what things was like over here. Well, you've seen, said Andrews, smiling. In the neck, said Hoggenback, as he pushed out his cup for coffee. In the truck that was taking them to work, Andrews and the kid sat side by side on the jouncing backboard and tried to talk above the rumble of the exhaust. Like Paris? asked the kid. <laughs> Not this way, said Andrews. Say, one of the guys said you could parlay French real well. I want you to teach me. A guy's got to know languages to get along in this country. But you must know some. <laughs> Bedroom French, said the kid, laughing. Well, but if I want to write a movie scenario for an Italian firm, I can't just write Voulez-vous coucher avec moi over and over again. But you'll have to learn Italian, kid. I'm going to. Say, ain't they taking us a hell of a ways today, Skinny? We're going to Passy Wharf to unload rock, said somebody in a grumbling voice. No, it's a cement. Cement for the stadium we're presenting the French nation. Ain't you read in the Stars and Stripes about it? I'd present him with a swift kick, and a hell of a lot of other people, too. So we have to sweat unloading cement all day, muttered Hoggenback, to give these goddamn frogs a stadium? Oh, if it weren't that, it'd be something else. But ain't we got folks at home to work for, cried Hoggenback? Mightn't all this sweat be doing some good for us? Building a stadium? My God. Pile out there! Quick! rasped a voice from the driver's seat. Through the haze of choking white dust, Andrews got now and then a glimpse of the grey-green river, with its tugboats sporting their white cockades of steam, and their long trailing plumes of smoke, and its blunt-nosed barges and its bridges where people walked jauntily back and forth, going about their business, going where they wanted to go. The bags of cement were very heavy, and the unaccustomed work sent racking pains through his back. The biting dust stung under his fingernails and in his mouth and eyes. All the morning a sort of refrain went through his head. People have spent their lives doing only this. People have spent their lives doing only this. As he crossed and recrossed the narrow plank from the barge to the shore, he looked at the black water speeding seaweeds and took extraordinary care not to let his foot slip. He did not know why, for one half of him was thinking how wonderful it would be to drown, to forget in eternal black silence the hopeless struggle. 
Once he saw the kid standing before the sergeant in charge in an attitude of complete exhaustion, and caught a glint of his blue eyes as he looked up appealingly, like a child begging out of a spanking. The sight amused him, and he said to himself, If I had pink cheeks and Cupid's bow lips, I might be able to go through life on my blue eyes. And he pictured the kid, a fat, cherubic old man, stepping out of a white limousine, the way people do in movies, and looking about him with those same mild blue eyes. But soon he forgot everything in the agony of the heavy cement bags, bearing down on his back and hips. In the truck on the way back to the mess, the kid, looking fresh and smiling among the sweating men, like ghosts from the white dust, talked hoarsely above the clatter of the truck, sidled up very close to Andrews. Do you like swimming, Skinny? Yes, I'd give a lot to get some of this cement dust off me, said Andrews without interest. I once won a boy's swimming race at Coney, said the kid. Andrews did not answer. Were you in the swimming team or anything like that, Skinny, when you went to school? No. It would be wonderful to be in the water, though. I used to swim way out in Chesapeake Bay at night when the water was phosphorescent. Andrews suddenly found the kid's bright blue eyes, bright as flames from excitement, staring into his. God, I'm an ass, he muttered. He felt the kid's fist punch him softly in the back. Sergeant said they was going to work as late as hell tonight, the kid was saying aloud to the men round him. I'll be dead if they do, muttered Hogenback. And you, a lumberjack! It ain't that. I could carry their bloody bags two at a time if I wanted to. A fella gets so goddamn mad, that's all. So goddamn mad. Doesn't he, Skinny? Hogenback turned to Andrews and smiled. Andrews nodded his head. After the first two or three bags Andrews carried in the afternoon, it seemed as if every one would be the last he could possibly lift. His back and thighs throbbed with exhaustion. His face and the tips of his fingers felt raw from the biting cement dust. When the river began to grow purple with evening, he noticed that two civilians, young men with buff-colored coats and canes, were watching the gang at work. They says they're newspaper reporters, writing up how fast the army's being demobilized, said one man in an awed voice. <laughs> they come to the right place. Tell them we're leaving for home now, loading our barracks bags on the steamer. The newspaper men were giving out cigarettes. Several men grouped around them. One shouted out, We're the guys does the light work. Blackjack Pershing's own pet labor battalion. They like us so well they just can't let us go. Damn jackasses, muttered Hogenback, as with his eyes to the ground he passed Andrews. I could tell them some things that make their goddamn ears buzz. Why don't you? What the hell's the use? I ain't got the education to talk up to guys like that. The sergeant, a short, red-faced man with a mustache clipped very short, went up to the group round the newspaper men. Come on, fellas, we've got a hell of a lot of this cement to get in before it rains, he said in a kindly voice. The sooner we get it in, the sooner we get off. Listen to that bastard. Ain't he just too sweet for pie when there's company, muttered Hogenback on his way back from the barge with a bag of cement. The kid brushed past Andrews without looking at him. Do what I do, Skinny, he said. Andrews did not turn round, but his heart started thumping very fast. A dull sort of terror took possession of him. He tried desperately to summon his willpower to keep from cringing, but he kept remembering the way the room had swung round when the MP had hit him, and heard again the cold voice of the lieutenant saying, One of you men teach him how to salute. Time dragged out interminably. At last, coming back to the edge of the wharf, Andrews saw that there were no more bags in the barge. He sat down on the plank, too exhausted to think. Blue-gray dusk was closing down on everything. The Passy Bridge stood out, purple against a great crimson afterglow. The kid sat down beside him and threw an arm trembling with excitement round his shoulders. The guards look in the other way. They won't miss us till they get to the truck. Come on, Skinny, he said in a low, quiet voice. Holding on to the plank, he let himself down into the speeding water. 
Andrews slipped after him, hardly knowing what he was doing. The icy water closing about his body made him suddenly feel awake and vigorous. As he was swept by the big rudder of the barge, he caught hold of the kid, who was holding on to a rope. They worked their way without speaking round to the outer side of the rudder. The swift river tugging savagely at them made it hard to hold on. "'Now they can't see us,' said the kid between clenched teeth. "'Can you work your shoes and pants off?' Andrews started struggling with one boot, the kid helping to hold him up with his free hand. "'Mine are off,' he said. "'I was all fixed.' He laughed, though his teeth were chattering. "'All right, I've broken the laces,' said Andrews. "'Can you swim under water?' Andrews nodded. "'We want to make for that bunch of barges the other side of the bridge. "'The barge people will hide us.' "'How do you know they will?' "'The kid had disappeared. "'Andrews hesitated a moment, then let go his hold "'and started swimming with the current for all his might. "'At first he felt strong and exultant, "'but very soon he began to feel the icy grip of the water bearing him down. "'His arms and legs seemed to stiffen.' More than against the water, he was struggling against paralysis within him, so that he thought that every moment his limbs would go rigid. He came to the surface and gasped for air. He had a second's glimpse of figures like toy soldiers, gesticulating wildly on the deck of the barge. The report of a rifle snapped through the air. He dove again, without thinking, as if his body were working independently of his mind. The next time he came up, his eyes were blurred from the cold. There was a taste of blood in his mouth. The shadow of the bridge was just above him. He turned on his back for a second. There were lights on the bridge. A current swept him past one barge and then another. Certainty possessed him that he was going to be drowned. A voice seemed to sob in his ears grotesquely. And so John Andrews was drowned in the Seine. Drowned in the Seine. In the Seine. Then he was kicking and fighting in a furious rage against the coils about him that wanted to drag him down and away. The black side of a barge was slipping upstream beside him with lightning speed. How fast those barges go, he thought. Then suddenly he found that he had hold of a rope, that his shoulders were banging against the bow of a small boat, while in front of him, against the dull purple sky, towered the rudder of the barge. A strong, warm hand grasped his shoulder from behind, and he was being drawn up and up, over the bow of the boat that hurt his numbed body like blows, out of the clutching coils of the water. "'Help me! Help me! I'm a deserter!' he said over and over again in French. A brown and red face with a bristly white beard, a bulbous, mullioned sort of face, hovered over him in the middle of a pinkish mist. Two. Oh, qu'il est propre! Oh, qu'il a la peau blanche! Women's voices were shrilling behind the mist. A coverlet that felt soft and fuzzy against his skin was being put about him. He was very warm and torpid, but somewhere in his thoughts a black crawling thing like a spider was trying to reach him, trying to work its way through the pinkish veils of torpor. After a long while he managed to roll over and look about him. Mais reste tranquille, came the woman's shrill voice again. And the other one? Did you see the other one? he asked in a choked whisper. Yes, it's all right. I'm drying it by the stove, came another woman's voice, deep and growling, almost like a man's. Maman's drying your money by the stove. It's all safe. How rich they are, these Americans. And to think I nearly threw it overboard with the trousers said the other woman again. John Andrews began to look about him. He was in a low, dark cabin. Behind him, in the direction of the voices, a yellow light flickered. Great, disheveled shadows of heads moved about on the ceiling. Through the close smell of the cabin came a warmth of food cooking. He could hear the soothing hiss of frying grease. But didn't you see the kid? he asked in English, dazedly trying to pull himself together, to think coherently. Then he went on in French, in a more natural voice. There was another one with me. We saw no one. Rosaline, ask the old man, said the older woman. No, he didn't see anyone, 
came the girl's shrill voice. She walked over to the bed and pulled the coverlet round Andrews with an awkward gesture. Looking up at her, he had a glimpse of the bulge of her breasts and her large teeth that glinted in the lamplight, and very vague in the shadow, a mop of snaky red hair. Qui parle bien français, she said, beaming at him. Heavy steps shuffled across the cabin as the older woman came up to the bed and peered in his face. You va mieux, she said with a knowing air. She was a broad woman with a broad, flat face and a swollen body swathed in shawls. Her eyebrows were very bushy, and she had thick grey whiskers that came down to a point on either side of her mouth, as well as a few bristling hairs on her chin. Her voice was deep and growling, and seemed to come from far down inside her huge body. Steps creaked somewhere, and the old man looked at him through spectacles placed on the end of his nose. Andrews recognized the irregular face full of red knobs and protrusions. "'Thanks very much,' he said. All three looked at him silently for some time. Then the old man pulled a newspaper out of his pocket, unfolded it carefully, and fluttered it above Andrews's eyes. In the scant light, Andrews made out the name Libertaire. "'That's why,' said the old man, looking at Andrews fixedly through his spectacles. "'I'm a sort of socialist,' said Andrews. "'Socialists are good for nothings,' snarled the old man, every red protrusion on his face seeming to get redder. "'But I have great sympathy for anarchist comrades,' went on Andrews, feeling a certain liveliness of amusement go through him and fade again. "'Lucky you caught hold of my rope instead of getting on to the next barge. He'd have given you up for sure. Sont des royalistes, ces salauds là "'We must give him something to eat.' Hurry, maman. Don't worry, he'll pay, won't you, my little American? Andrews nodded his head. All you want, he said. No, if he says he's a comrade, he shan't pay. Not a sou, growled the old man. We'll see about that, cried the old woman, drawing her breath in with an angry whistling sound. It's only that living's so dear nowadays, came the girl's voice. Oh, I'll pay anything I've got said Andrews peevishly, closing his eyes again. He lay a long while on his back without moving. A hand shoved in between his back and the pillow roused him. He sat up. Rosaline was holding a bowl of broth in front of him that steamed in his face. Mange ça, she said. He looked into her eyes, smiling. Her rusty hair was neatly combed. A bright green parrot with a scarlet splash on its wings balanced itself unsteadily on her shoulder, looking at Andrews out of angry eyes, hard as gems. <laughs> Il est jaloux, Coco, said Rosaline with a shrill little giggle. Andrews took the bowl in his two hands and drank some of the scalding broth. It's too hot, he said, leaning back against the girl's arm. The parrot squawked out a sentence that Andrews did not understand. Andrews heard the old man's voice answer from somewhere behind them. Nom de Dieu! The parrot squawked again. Rosaline laughed. It's the old man who taught him that, she said. Poor Coco, he doesn't know what he's saying. What does he say? asked Andrews. Les bourgeois à la lanterne! Nom de Dieu! It's from a song, said Rosaline. Oh, qu'il est malin, ce Coco! Rosaline was standing with her arms folded beside the bunk. The parrot stretched out his neck and rubbed it against her cheek, closing and unclosing his gem-like eyes. The girl formed her lips into a kiss and murmured in a dreamy voice, Tu m'aime, Coco, n'est-ce pas, Coco? Bon, Coco. Could I have something more? I'm awfully hungry, said Andrews. Oh, I was forgetting, cried Rosaline running off with the empty bowl. In a moment she came back without the parrot, with the bowl in her hand full of a brown stew of potatoes and meat. Andrews ate it mechanically, and handed back the bowl. Thank you, he said. I'm going to sleep. He settled himself back into the bunk. Rosaline drew up the covers about him and tucked them in round his shoulders. Her hand seemed to linger a moment as it brushed past his cheek. But Andrews had already sunk into a torpor again, 
feeling nothing but the warmth of the food within him and a great stiffness in his arms and legs. When he woke up the light was grey instead of yellow, and the swishing sound puzzled him. He lay listening to it for a long time, wondering what it was. At last the thought came with a sudden warm spurt of joy that the barge must be moving. He lay very quietly on his back, looking up at the faint silvery light on the ceiling of the bunk, thinking of nothing, with only a vague dread in the back of his head that someone would come to speak to him, to question him. After a long time he began to think of Geneviève Rowe. He was having a long conversation with her about his music, and in his imagination she kept telling him that he must finish the Queen of Sheba, and that she would show it to Monsieur Gibier, who was a great friend of a certain concert director who might get it played. How long ago it must have been since they had talked about that. A picture floated through his mind of himself and Geneviève standing shoulder to shoulder, looking at the cathedral at Chartres, which stood up nonchalantly above the tumultuous roofs of the town, with its sober tower and its gaudy towers, and the great rose windows between. Inexorably his memory carried him forward, moment by moment over that day, until he writhed with shame and revolt. Good God! Would he have to go on all his life remembering that? Teach him how to salute, the officer had said, and Handsome had stepped up and hit him. Would he have to go on all his life remembering that? We tied up the uniform with some stones and threw it overboard, said Rosaline, jabbing him in the shoulder to draw his attention. That was a good idea. Are you going to get up? It's nearly time to eat. How you have slept! But I haven't anything to put on, said Andrews, laughing, and waved a bare arm above the bedclothes. Wait, I'll find something of the old man's. Say, do all Americans have skin so white as that? Look! She put her brown hand, with its grimed and broken nails, on Andrews's arm, that was white, with a few silky yellow hairs. It's because I'm blonde, said Andrews. There are plenty of blonde Frenchmen, aren't there? Rosaline ran off giggling and came back in a moment with a pair of corduroy trousers and a torn flannel shirt that smelled of pipe tobacco. That'll do for now, she said. It's warm today for April. Tonight we'll buy you some clothes and shoes. Where are you going? By God, I don't know. We're going to Havre, for cargo. She put both hands to her head and began rearranging her straggly, rusty-colored hair. Oh, my hair, she said. It's the water, you know. You can't keep respectable looking on these filthy barges. Say, American, why don't you stay with us a while? You can help the old man run the boat. He found suddenly that her eyes were looking into his with trembling eagerness. I don't know what to do, he said carelessly. I wonder if it's safe to go on deck. She turned away from him petulantly and led the way up the ladder. "'Oh, la la camarade!' cried the old man, who was leaning with all his might against the long tiller of the barge. "'Come up and help me.' The barge was the last of a string of four that were describing a wide curve in the midst of a reach of silvery river full of glittering patches of pale pea-green lavender, hemmed in on either side by frail blue roots of poplars. The sky was a mottled luminous grey with occasional patches, the colour of robin's eggs. Andrews breathed in the dank smell of the river and leaned against the tiller when he was told to, answering the old man's curt questions. He stayed with the tiller when the rest of them went down to the cabin to eat. The pale colours and swishing sound of the water and the blue-green banks slipping by and unfolding on either hand were as soothing as his deep sleep had been. Yet they seemed only a veil covering other realities, where men stood interminably in line, and marched with legs made all the same length on the drill field, and wore the same clothes and cringed before the same hierarchy of polished belts and polished puttees and stiff visored caps that had its homes in vast offices crammed with index cards and card catalogues. A world full of the tramp of marching, where cold voices kept saying, Teach him how to salute. Like a bird in a net, Andrews's mind struggled to free itself from the obsession. 
then he thought of his table in his room in paris with its piled sheets of ruled paper and he felt he wanted nothing in the world except to work it did not matter what happened to him if he could only have time to weave into designs the tangled skein of music that seethed through him as the blood seethed through his veins there he stood leaning against the long tiller watching the blue-green poplars glide by here and there reflected in the etched silver mirror of the river feeling the moist river wind flutter his ragged shirt thinking of nothing after a while the old man came up out of the cabin his face purplish puffing clouds of smoke out of his pipe all right young fellow go down and eat he said andrews lay flat on his belly on the deck with his chin resting on the back of his two hands the barge was tied up along the river bank among many other barges beside him a small fuzzy dog barked furiously at a yellow mongrel on the shore it was nearly dark and through the pearly mist of the river came red oblongs of light from the taverns along the bank a slip of a new moon shrouded in haze was setting behind the poplar trees amid the round of despairing thoughts the memory of the kid intruded itself he had sold a ford for five hundred francs and gone on a party with a man who'd stolen an ammunition train and he wanted to write for the italian movies no war could down people like that andrews smiled looking into the black water funny the kid was dead probably and he john andrews was alive and free and he lay there moping still whimpering over old wrongs for god's sake be a man he said to himself he got to his feet at the cabin door rosaline was playing with the parrot give me a kiss coco she was saying in a drowsy voice just a little kiss just a little kiss for rosaline poor rosaline the parrot which andrews could hardly see in the dusk leaned towards her fluttering his feathers making little clucking noises rosaline caught sight of andrews oh i thought you'd gone to have a drink with the old man she cried no i stayed here do you like it this life rosaline put the parrot back on his perch where he swayed from side to side squawking in protest les bourgeois à la lanterne nom de dieu they both laughed oh it must be a wonderful life this barge seems like heaven after the army but they pay you well you americans seven francs a day that's luxury that and be ordered around all day long but you have no expenses it's clear gain you men are funny the old man's like that too it's nice here all by ourselves isn't it jean andrews did not answer he was wondering what Geneviève Rowe would say when she found out he was a deserter. "'I hate it. It's cold and dirty and miserable in winter,' went on Rosaline. "'I'd like to see them at the bottom of the river, all these barges. "'And Paris women, did you have a good time with them?' "'I only knew one. I go very little with women.' "'All the same. Love's nice, isn't it?' They were sitting on the rail at the bow of the barge. Rosaline had sidled up so that her leg touched Andrews's leg along its whole length. The memory of Geneviève Rowe became more and more vivid in his mind. He kept thinking of things she had said, of the intonations of her voice, of the blundering way she poured tea, and of her pale brown eyes wide open on the world, like the eyes of a woman in an encaustic painting from a tomb in the Fayum. Mother's talking to the old woman at the creamery. They're great friends. She won't be home for two hours yet, said Rosaline. She's bringing my clothes, isn't she? But you're all right as you are. But they're your father's. What does that matter? I must go back to Paris soon. There is somebody I must see in Paris. A woman? Andrews nodded. But it's not so bad this life on the barge. I'm just lonesome and sick of the old people. That's why I talk nastily about it. 
We could have good times together if you stayed with us a little. She leaned her head on his shoulder and put a hand awkwardly on his bare forearm. How cold these Americans are, she muttered, giggling drowsily. Andrews felt her hair tickle his cheek. No, it's not a bad life on the barge, honestly. The only thing is, there's nothing but old people on the river. It isn't life to be always with old people. I want to have a good time. She pressed her cheek against his. He could feel her breath heavy in his face. After all, it's lovely in summer to drowse on the deck that's all warm with the sun and see the trees and the fields and the little houses slipping by on either side. If there weren't so many old people, all the boys go away to the cities. I hate old people. They're so dirty and slow. We mustn't waste our youth, must we? Andrews got to his feet. What's the matter? she cried sharply. Rosaline, Andrews said in a low, soft voice, I can only think of going to Paris. Oh, the Paris woman, said Rosaline scornfully. But what does that matter? She isn't here now. I don't know. Perhaps I shall never see her again anyway, said Andrews. You're a fool. You must amuse yourself when you can in this life. And you a deserter. Why, they may catch you and shoot you at any time. Oh, I know. You're right. You're right. But I'm not made like that, that's all. She must be very good to you, your little Paris girl. I've never touched her. Rosaline threw her head back and laughed raspingly. But you aren't sick, are you? she cried. Perhaps I remember too vividly, that's all. Anyway, I'm a fool, Rosaline, because you're a nice girl. There were steps on the plank that led to the shore. A shawl over her head and a big bundle under her arm, the old woman came up to them, panting wheezily. She looked from one to the other, trying to make out their faces in the dark. It's a danger. Like that. Youth, she muttered between hard, short breaths. Did you find the clothes? asked Andrews in a casual voice. Yes, that leaves you forty-five francs out of your money, when I've taken out for your food and all that. Does that suit you? Thank you very much for your trouble. You paid for it. Don't worry about that, said the old woman. She gave him the bundle. Here are your clothes and the forty-five francs. If you want, I'll tell you exactly what each thing cost. I'll put them on first, he said with a laugh. He climbed down the ladder into the cabin. Putting on new, unfamiliar-shaped clothes made him suddenly feel strong and joyous. The old woman had bought him corduroy trousers, cheap cloth shoes, a blue cotton shirt, woolen socks, and a second-hand blue serge jacket. When he came up on deck, she held up a lantern to look at him. Doesn't he look fine? Altogether French, she said. Rosaline turned away without answering. A little later she picked up the perch and carried the parrot that swayed sleepily on the crosspiece down the ladder. Le bourgeois à la lanterne, nom de Dieu, came the old man's voice singing on the shore. He's drunk as a pig, muttered the old woman. If only he doesn't fall off the gangplank. A swaying shadow appeared at the end of the plank standing out against the haze of the light from the houses behind the poplar trees. Andrews put out a hand to catch him as he reached the side of the barge. The old man sprawled against the cabin. "'Don't bawl me out, dearie,' he said, dangling an arm around Andrews's neck and a hand beckoning vaguely towards his wife. "'I've found a comrade for the little American.' "'What's that?' said Andrews sharply. His mouth suddenly went dry with terror. He felt his nails pressing into the palms of his cold hands. "'I've found another American for you,' said the old man in an important voice. "'Here he comes.' Another shadow appeared at the end of the gangplank. "'Les bourgeois à la lanterne! Nom de Dieu!' shouted the old man. Andrews backed away cautiously towards the other side of the bridge. All the little muscles of his thighs were trembling. A hard voice was saying in his head, Drown yourself! 
Drown yourself. Then they won't get you. The man was standing on the end of the plank. Andrews could see the contour of the uniform against the haze of light behind the poplar trees. God, if only I had a pistol, he thought. Say, buddy, where are you? came an American voice. The man advanced towards him across the deck. Andrews stood with every muscle taut. Gee, you've taken off your uniform. Say, I'm not an MP. I'm AWOL, too. Shake. He held out his hand. Andrews took the hand doubtfully, without moving from the edge of the barge. Say, buddy, it's a damn fool thing to take off your uniform. Ain't you got any? If they pick you up like that, it's life, kid. I can't help it. It's done now. God, you still think I'm an MP, don't you? I swear I ain't. Maybe you are. God, it's hell, this life. A fellow can't put his trust in nobody. What division are you from? Hell, I came to warn you this bastard frog's got soused, and has been blabbing in the gin mill there how he was an anarchist and all that, and how he had an American deserter who was an anarchist and all that, and I said to myself, that guy'll get nabbed if he ain't careful. So I cottoned up to the old frog and said I'd go with him to see the camarade, and I think we'd better both of us make tracks out of this burg. It's damn decent. I'm sorry I was so suspicious. I was scared green when I first saw you. You were goddamn right to be. But why did you take your uniform off? Come along, let's beat it. I'll tell you about that. Andrews shook hands with the old man and the old woman. Rosaline had disappeared. Good night, thank you, he said, and followed the other man across the gangplank. As they walked away along the road, they heard the old man's voice roaring, Les bourgeois à la longue terme, nom de Dieu. My name's Eddie Chambers, said the American. Mine's John Andrews. How long have you been out? Two days. Eddie let the air out through his teeth in a whistle. I got away from a labor battalion in Paris. They'd pick me up in Chartres without a pass. Gee, I've been out a month and more. Was you infantry too? Yes. I was in the school detachment in Paris when I was picked up. But I never could get word to them. They just put me to work without a trial. Ever been in a labor battalion? No, thank God, they ain't got my number yet. They were walking fast along a straight road across a plain under a clear, star-powdered sky. I've been out eight weeks yesterday. What do you think of that? said Eddie. Must have been plenty of money to go on. <laughs> I've been flat fifteen days. How do you work it? I don't know, I just work it, though. You see, it was this way. The gang I was with went home when I was in hospital, and the damn skunks put me in Class A and was going to send me to the Army of Occupation. God, it made me sick, going out to a new outfit where I didn't know anybody, and all the rest of my bunch home walking down Water Street with brass bands and reception committees and girls throwing kisses at them and all that. Where are yous going? Paris. Gee, I wouldn't. Risky. But I've got friends there. I can get hold of some money. Looks like I hadn't got a friend in the world. I wish I'd gone to that goddamn outfit now. I ought to have been in the engineers all the time anyway. What did you do at home? Carpenter. But gosh, man, with a trade like that, you can always make a living anywhere. You're goddamn right, I could. But a guy has to live underground like a rabbit at this game. If I could get to a country where I could walk around like a man, I wouldn't give a damn what happened. If the army ever moves out of here in the goddamn MPs, I'll set up a business in one of these here little towns. I can parley pretty well. I'd just as soon marry a French girl and get to be a regular frog myself. After the raw deal they've given me in the army, I don't want to have nothing more to do with their damn country. <laughs> Democracy. He cleared his throat and spat angrily on the road before him. They walked on silently. Andrews was looking at the sky, picking out constellations he knew among the glittering masses of stars. Why don't you try Spain or Italy, he said after a while. Don't know the lingo. No, I'm going to Scotland. But how can you get there? 
crossing on the car ferries to England from Havre. I've talked to guys as done it. But what'll you do when you get there? How should I know? Live around best I can? What can a fella do when he don't dare show his face in the street? Anyway, it makes you feel as if you had some guts in you to be out on your own this way, cried Andrews boisterously. Wait till you've been at it two months, boy, and you'll think what I'm telling you. The army's hell when you're in it, but it's a hell of a lot worse when you're out of it, at the wrong end. It's a great night, anyway, said Andrews. Looks like we ought to be finding a haystack to sleep in. It'd be different, burst out Andrews suddenly, if I didn't have friends here. Oh, you've met up with a girl, have you? asked Eddie ironically. Yes. The thing is, we really get along together besides all the rest. Eddie snorted. I bet you ain't even kissed her, he said. Gee, I've had buddies as met up with that friendly kind. I know a guy married one and found out after two weeks. Oh, it's silly to talk about it. I can't explain it. It gives you confidence in anything to feel there's someone who will always understand anything you do. I suppose you're going to get married. I don't see why. That would spoil everything. Eddie whistled softly. They walked along briskly without speaking for a long time, their steps ringing on the hard road, while the dome of the sky shimmered above their heads. And from the ditches came the sing-song shrilling of toads. For the first time in months Andrews felt himself bubbling with a spirit of joyous adventure. The rhythm of the three green horsemen that was to have been the prelude to the Queen of Sheba began rollicking through his head. But, Eddie, this is wonderful. It's us against the universe, he said in a boisterous voice. You wait, said Eddie. When Andrews walked by the MP at the Gare Saint-Lazare, his eyes were cold with fear. The MP did not look at him. He stopped on the crowded pavement a little way from the station and stared into a mirror in a shop window. Unshaven, with a check cap on the side of his head and his corduroy trousers, he looked like a young workman who had been out of work for a month. Gee, clothes do make a difference, he said to himself. He smiled when he thought how shocked Walters would be when he turned up in that rig, and started walking with leisurely stride across Paris, where everything bustled and jingled with early morning where from every café came a hot smell of coffee and fresh bread steamed in the windows of the bakeries. He still had three francs in his pocket. On a side street the fumes of coffee roasting attracted him into a small bar. Several men were arguing boisterously at the end of the bar. One of them turned a ruddy, tow-whiskered face to Andrews and said, Et toi, tu vas chômer le premier mai? I'm on strike already answered Andrews, laughing. The man noticed his accent, looked at him sharply a second, and turned back to the conversation, lowering his voice as he did so. Andrews drank down his coffee and left the bar, his heart pounding. He could not help glancing back over his shoulder now and then to see if he was being followed. At a corner he stopped with his fists clenched and leaned a second against a house wall. "'Where's your nerve? Where's your nerve?' he was saying to himself. He strode off suddenly, full of bitter determination not to turn around again. He tried to occupy his mind with plans. Let's see, what should he do? First he'd go to his room and look up old Henslow and Walters. Then he would go see Genevieve. Then he'd work, work, forget everything in his work, until the army should go back to America and there should be no more uniforms on the streets. And as for the future, what did he care about the future? When he turned the corner into the familiar street where his room was, a thought came to him. Suppose he should find MPs waiting for him there. He brushed it aside angrily and strode fast up the sidewalk, catching up to a soldier who was slouching along in the same direction, with his hands in his pockets and eyes on the ground. Andrews stopped suddenly as he was about to pass the soldier and turned. The man looked up. It was Chrisfield. Andrews held out his hand. Chrisfield seized it eagerly and shook it for a long time. Jesus Christ! I thought you was a Frenchman, Andy. I guess you got your discharge then. God, I'm glad. 
I'm glad I look like a Frenchman, anyway. Been on leave long, Chris? Two buttons were off the front of Chrisfield's uniform. There were streaks of dirt on his face, and his puttees were clothed with mud. He looked Andrews seriously in the eyes and shook his head. No, I done flew the coop, Andy, he said in a low voice. Since when? I've been out a couple of weeks. I'll tell you about it, Andy. I was coming to see you now. I'm broke. Well, look, I'll be able to get hold of some money tomorrow. I'm out, too. What do you mean? I haven't got a discharge. I'm through with it all. I've deserted. God damn! That's funny that you and me should both do it, Andy. But why the hell did you do it? Oh, it's too long to tell here. Come up to my room. There are maybe fellows there. Ever been at the chinks? No. I'm staying there. There's other fellows who's AWOL, too. The chink's got a gin mill. Where is it? Eight. Rue de Petit Jardins. Where's that? Way back at that garden where the animals are. Look, I can find you there tomorrow morning and I'll bring some money. I'll wait for you, Andy. At nine. It's a bar. You won't be able to get in without me. The kids is pretty scared of plainclothes men. I think it'll be perfectly safe to come up to my place now. Now I'm going to get the hell out of here. But, Chris, why did you go AWOL? Oh, I don't know. A guy who's in the Paris detachment got your address for me. But, Chris, did they say anything to him about me? No, nothing. That's funny. Well, Chris, I'll be there tomorrow if I can find the place. Man, you've got to be there. Oh, I'll turn up, said Andrews with a smile. They shook hands nervously. Say, Andy, said Chrisfield, still holding on to Andrews's hand. I went AWOL because the sergeant... God damn it, it's weighing on my mind awful these days. There's a sergeant that knows. What do you mean? I told you about Anderson. I know you ain't told anybody, Andy. Chrisfield dropped Andrews's hand and looked at him in the face with an unexpected sideways glance. Then he went on through clenched teeth. I swear to God I ain't told another living soul. And the sergeant in Company D knows. For God's sake, Chris, don't lose your nerve like that. I ain't lost my nerve. I tell you, that guy knows. Chrisfield's voice rose, suddenly shrill. Look, Chris, we can't stand out here talking in the street like this. It isn't safe. But maybe you'll be able to tell me what to do. You think, Andy. Maybe tomorrow you'll have thought up something we can do. So long. Chrisfield walked away hurriedly. Andrews looked after him a moment, and then went in through the court to the house where his room was. At the foot of the stairs, an old woman's voice startled him. Mais, Monsieur André! Que vous avez l'air étranger. How funny you look dressed like that. The concierge was smiling at him from her cubbyhole beside the stairs. She sat knitting with a black shawl round her head, a tiny old woman with a hooked bird-like nose and eyes sunk in depressions full of little wrinkles like a monkey's eyes. Y yes, at the town where I was demobilized, I couldn't get anything else, stammered Andrews. Oh, you're demobilized, are you? That's why you've been away so long. Monsieur Valters said he didn't know where you were. It's better that way, isn't it? Yes, said Andrews, starting up the stairs. Monsieur Valters is in now, went on the old woman, talking after him. And you've got in just in time for the first of May. Oh, yes, the strike, said Andrews, stopping halfway up the flight. It'll be dreadful, said the old woman. I hope you won't go out. Young folks are so likely to get into trouble. Oh, but all your friends have been worried about your being away so long. Have they? said Andrews. He continued up the stairs. Au revoir, monsieur. Au revoir, madame. End of section 15 Section 16 of Three Soldiers this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by M.B.
Three Soldiers by John Dos Passos. Section sixteen. Three. No, nothing could make me go back now. It's no use talking about it. But you're crazy, man. You're crazy. One man alone can't buck the system like that, can he, Henslow? Walters was talking earnestly, leaning across the table beside the lamp. Henslow, who sat very stiff on the edge of a chair, nodded with compressed lips. Andrews lay at full length on the bed, out of the circle of light. "'Honestly, Andy,' said Henslow, with tears in his voice, "'I think you'd better do what Walters says. "'It's no use being heroic about it.' "'I'm not being heroic, Henny,' cried Andrews, sitting up on the bed. He drew his feet under him, tailor fashion, and went on talking very quietly. "'Look, it's a purely personal matter. "'I've got to a point where I don't give a damn what happens to me. "'I don't care if I'm shot or if I live to be eighty. I'm sick of being ordered round. One more order shouted at my head is not worth living to be eighty. To me, that's all. For God's sake, let's talk about something else. But how many orders have you had shouted at your head since you got in this school detachment? Not one. You can put through your discharge application, probably. Walters got to his feet, letting the chair crash to the floor behind him. He stopped to pick it up. Look here. Here's my proposition, he went on. I don't think you're marked AWOL in the school office. Things are so damn badly run there. You can turn up and say you've been sick and draw your back pay, and nobody'll say a thing. Or else I'll put it right up to the guy who's top sergeant. He's a good friend of mine. We can fix it up on the records some way, but for God's sake don't ruin your whole life on account of a little stubbornness and some damn fool anarchistic ideas or other a fellow like you ought to have more sense than to pick up. He's right, Andy, said Henslow in a low voice. Please don't talk any more about it. You've told me all that before, said Andrews sharply. He threw himself back on the bed and rolled over towards the wall. They were silent a long time. A sound of voices and footsteps drifted up from the courtyard. But... Look here, Andy, said Henslow, nervously stroking his mustache. You care much more about your work than any abstract idea of asserting your right of individual liberty. Even if you don't get caught. I think the chances of getting caught are mighty slim if you use your head. But even if you don't, you haven't enough money to live on for long over here. You, you haven't. Don't you think I've thought of all that? I'm not crazy, you know. I've figured up the balance perfectly sanely. The only thing is, you fellows can't understand. <laughs> Have you ever been in a labor battalion? Have you ever had a man you've been chatting with five minutes before deliberately knock you down? Good God, you don't know what you're talking about, you two. I've got to be free, now. I don't care at what cost. Being free is the only thing that matters. Andrews lay on his back, talking towards the ceiling. Henslow was on his feet, striding nervously about the room. "'As if anyone was ever free,' he muttered. "'All right, quibble, quibble. You can argue anything away if you want to. Of course, cowardice is the best policy, necessary for survival. The man who's got most will to live is the most cowardly. Go on!' Andrews's voice was shrill and excited, breaking occasionally like a half-grown boy's voice. Andy, what on earth's got hold of you? God, I hate to go away this way, added Henslow after a pause. I'll pull through all right, Henny. I'll probably come to see you in Syria, disguised as an Arab sheikh. Andrews laughed excitedly. If I thought I'd do any good, I'd stay. But there's nothing I can do. Everybody's got to settle their own affairs, in their own damn fool way. So long, Walters. Walters and Henslow shook hands absently. Henslow came over to the bed and held out his hand to Andrews. Look, old man, you will be as careful as you can, won't you? And write me, care American Red Cross, Jerusalem. I'll be damned anxious, honestly. Don't you worry, we'll go traveling together yet, said Andrews, sitting up and taking Henslow's hand. 
They heard Henslow's steps fade down the stairs and then ring for a moment on the pavings of the courtyard. Walters moved his chair over beside Andrews's bed. Now look, let's have a man-to-man -man talk, Andrews. Even if you want to ruin your life, you haven't a right to. There's your family, and haven't you any patriotism? Remember, there is such a thing as duty in the world. Andrews sat up and said in a low, furious voice, pausing between each word, I can't explain it, but I shall never put a uniform on again. So for Christ's sake, shut up! All right, do what you goddamn please. I'm through with you. Walters suddenly flashed into a rage. He began undressing silently. Andrews lay a long while flat on his back in the bed, staring at the ceiling. Then he too undressed, put the light out, and got into bed. The Rue des Petits Jardins was a short street in a district of warehouses. A grey, windowless wall shut out the light along all of one side. Opposite was a cluster of three old houses, leaning together as if the outer ones were trying to support the beetling mansard roof of the centre house. Beside them rose a huge building with rows and rows of black windows. When Andrews stopped to look about him, he found the street completely deserted. The ominous stillness that had brooded over the city during all the walk from his room near the Pantheon seemed here to culminate in sheer desolation. In the silence he could hear the light padding noise made by the feet of a dog that trotted across the end of the street. The house with the mansard roof was number eight. The front of the lower story had once been painted in chocolate color, across the top of which was still decipherable the sign Charbon, Bois, Lomang. On the grimed window beside the door was painted in white Débit de Boisson. Andrews pushed on the door which opened easily. Somewhere in the interior a bell jangled, startlingly loud after the silence of the street. On the wall opposite the door was a speckled mirror with a crack in it the shape of a star, and under it a bench with three marble-top tables. The zinc bar filled up the third wall. In the fourth was a glass door pasted up with newspapers. Andrews walked over to the bar. The jangling of the bell faded to silence. He waited, a curious uneasiness gradually taking possession of him. Anyways, he thought, he was wasting his time. He ought to be doing something to arrange his future. He walked over to the street door. The bell jangled again when he opened it. At the same moment, a man came out through the door the newspapers were pasted over. He was a stout man in a dingy white shirt stained to a brownish color around the armpits and caught in very tightly at the waist by the broad elastic belt that held up his yellow corduroy trousers. His face was flabby, of a greenish color. Black eyes looked at Andrews fixedly through barely open lids, so that they seemed long slits above the cheekbones. That's the chink, thought Andrews. Well, said the man, taking his place behind the bar with his legs far apart. "'A beer, please,' said Andrews. "'There isn't any. "'A glass of wine, then.' The man nodded his head, and keeping his eyes fastened on Andrews all the while, strode out of the door again. A moment later, Crisfield came out, with rumpled hair, yawning, rubbing an eye with the knuckles of his fist. "'Lousy! "'I just woke up, Andy.' Come along in back. Andrews followed him through a small room with tables and benches, down a corridor where the reek of ammonia bit into his eyes, and up a staircase littered with dirt and garbage. Crisfield opened a door directly on the stairs, and they stumbled into a large room with a window that gave on the court. Crisfield closed the door carefully and turned to Andrews with a smile. I was right smart as scared you wouldn't find it, Andy. So this is where you live? Mm-hmm. A bunch of us lives here. A wide bed without coverings, where a man in olive drab slept rolled in a blanket, was the only furniture of the room. Three of us sleeps in that bed, said Crisfield. Who's that? 
cried the man in the bed, sitting up suddenly. All right, Al. He's a buddy of mine, said Chrisfield. He's taken off his uniform. Jesus, you got guts, said the man in the bed. Andrews looked at him sharply. A piece of toweling, splotched here and there with dried blood, was wrapped round his head, and a hand, swathed in bandages, was drawn up to his body. The man's mouth took on a twisted expression of pain as he let his head gradually down to the bed again. "'Gosh, what did you do to yourself?' cried Andrews. "'I tried to hop afraid at Marseilles.' "'Needs practice to do that sort of thing,' said Chrisfield, who sat on the bed pulling his shoes off. "'I'm going to get back to bed, Andy. I'm just dead tired. I took cabbages all night at the market. They give you a job there without asking no questions. Have a cigarette.' Andrews sat down on the end of the bed and threw a cigarette towards Chrisfield. "'Have one?' he asked Al. "'No, I couldn't smoke. I'm almost crazy with this hand. One of the wheels went over it. I cut what was left of the little finger with a razor.' Andrews could see the sweat rolling down his cheek as he spoke. "'Christ, that poor bugger's been having a time, Andy. We was as scared to get a doctor, and we all didn't know what to do. I got some pure alcohol and washed it in that. It's not infected.' I guess it'll be all right. Where are you from, Al? asked Andrews. Frisco. Oh, I'm going to try and sleep. I haven't slept a wink for four nights. Why don't you get some dope? Oh, we all ain't had a cent to spare for anything, Andy. Oh, if we had kale, we could live like kings. Not, said Al, in the middle of a nervous little giggle. Look, Chris, said Andrews. I'll have with you. I've got five hundred francs. Jesus, God, man, don't kid about anything like that. Here's two hundred and fifty. It's not so much as it sounds. Andrews handed him five fifty-franc notes. Say, how did you come to bust loose? said Al, turning his head towards Andrews. I got away from a labor battalion one night, that's all. Tell me about it, buddy. I don't feel my hand so much when I'm talking to somebody. I'd be home now if it wasn't for a gin mill in Alsace. Say, don't you think that big headgear they sport up there is awful good looking? Got my goat every time I saw one. I was coming back from leave at Grenoble, and I went through Strasbourg, some town. My outfit was in Koblenz. That's where I met up with Chris here. Anyway, we was raising hell round Strasbourg and I went into a gin mill, down a flight of steps. Gee, everything in that town's plum picturesque, just like a kid I used to know at home whose folks were Italian used to talk about when he said how he wanted to come overseas. Well, I met up with a girl down there who said she'd just come down to a place like that to look for her brother who was in the Foreign Legion. Andrews and Chrisfield laughed. What are you laughing at? went on Al in an eager, taut voice. Honest to God, I'm going to marry her if ever I get out of this. She's the best little girl I ever met up with. She was a waitress in a restaurant, and when she was off duty she used to wear that there Alsatian costume. Hell, I just stayed on. Every day I thought I'd go away the next day. Anyway, the war was over. I weren't a damn bit of use. Hasn't a fellow got any rights at all? Then the MPs started cleaning up Strasbourg after AWOLs. And I beat it out of there, and Christ, it don't look as if I'd ever be able to get back. Say, Andy, said Chrisfield suddenly, let's go down after some booze. All right. Say, Al, you don't want me to get you anything at the drug store. No, I don't want to do anything but lay low and bathe it with alcohol now and then against infection. Anyways, it's the first of May. You'd be crazy to go out. You might get pulled. They say there's riots going on. "'Gosh, I forgot it was the first of May,' cried Andrews. "'They're running a general strike to protest against the war with Russia, and—' "'A guy told me,' said Al in a shrill voice, "'there might be a revolution.' "'Come along, Andy,' said Chris from the door. "'On the stairs, Andrews felt Chrisfield's hand squeezing his arm hard. "'Say, Andy,' Chris put his lips close to Andrews's ear, and spoke in a rasping whisper. You're the only one that knows. 
You know that. You and that sergeant. Don't you say anything so that the guys here can catch on, do you hear? All right, Chris, I won't. But man alive, you oughtn't to lose your nerve about it. You aren't the only one who ever shot and... Shut your face, do you hear? muttered Chrisfield savagely. They went down the stairs in silence. In the room next to the bar they found the chink reading a newspaper. Is he French? whispered Andrews. I don't know what he is. He ain't a white man, I'll wager that, said Chris. But he's square. Do you know anything about what's going on? asked Andrews in French, going up to the chink. Where? the chink got up, flashing a glance at Andrews out of the corners of his slit-like eyes. Outside, in the streets, in Paris, anywhere where people are out in the open and can do things. What do you think about the revolution? The chink shrugged his shoulders. Anything's possible, he said. Do you think they really can overthrow the army and the government in one day like that? Who? broke in Chrisfield. Why, the people, Chris. The ordinary people like you and me, who are tired of being ordered round, who are tired of being trampled down by other people just like them who've had the luck to get in right with the system. Do you know what I'll do when the revolution comes? broke in the chink with sudden intensity, slapping himself on the chest with one hand. I'll go straight to one of those jewelry stores, Rue Royale, and fill my pockets and come home with my hands full of diamonds. What good will that do you? What good? I'll bury them back there in the court and wait. I'll need them in the end. Do you know what it'll mean, your revolution? Another system. When there's a system, there are always men to be bought with diamonds. That's what the world's like. But they won't be worth anything. It'll only be work that is worth anything. Huh, we'll see, said the chink. Do you think that it could happen, Andy, and there'd be a revolution, and there wouldn't be any more armies, and we'd be able to go round like we are civilians? I don't think so. Fellows like us ain't got it in em to buck the system, Andy. Many a system's gone down before. It will happen again. They're fighting the Guard Republican now before the Guard de l'Est said the chink in an expressionless voice. What do you want down there? You'd better stay in the back. You never know what the police may put over on us. Give us two bottles of Van Blank, chink, said Chrisfield. When'll you pay? Right now. This guy's giving me fifty francs. Rich, are you? said the chink with hatred in his voice, turning to Andrews. Won't last long at that rate. Wait here. He strode into the bar, closing the door carefully after him. A sudden jangling of the bell was followed by a sound of loud voices and stamping feet. Andrews and Chrisfield tiptoed into the dark corridor, where they stood a long time, waiting, breathing the foul air that stung their nostrils with the stench of plaster damp and rotting wine. At last the chink came back with three bottles of wine. "'Well, you're right,' he said to Andrews. They were putting up barricades on the Avenue Magenta. On the stairs they met a girl sweeping. She had untidy hair that straggled out from under a blue handkerchief tied under her chin, and a pretty-colored fleshy face. Chrisfield caught her up to him and kissed her as he passed. "'We all calls her the dog-faced girl,' he said to Andrews in explanation. "'She does our work. I liked to have a fight with Slippery over her yesterday. Didn't I, Slippery?' When he followed Chrisfield into the room, Andrews saw a man sitting on the window ledge smoking. He was dressed as a second lieutenant, but his puttees were brilliantly polished, and he smoked through a long amber cigarette holder. His pink nails were carefully manicured. "'This is slippery, Andy,' said Chrisfield. "'This guy's an old buddy of mine. We was bunkies together a hell of a time, wasn't we, Andy?' "'You bet we were.' "'So you've taken your uniform off, have you?' Mighty foolish, said Slippery. Suppose they nab you. It's all up now, anyway. I don't intend to get nabbed, said Andrews. We got booze, said Chrisfield. Slippery had taken dice from his pocket and was throwing them meditatively on the floor between his feet, snapping his fingers with each throw. I'll shoot you one of them bottles, Chris, he said. Andrews walked over to the bed. 
Al was stirring uneasily, his face flushed and his mouth twitching. Hello, he said. What's the news? They say they're putting up barricades near the Gare de l'Est. It may be something. God, I hope so. God, I wish they'd do everything here like they did in Russia. Then we'd be free. We couldn't go back to the States for a while, but there wouldn't be no MPs to hunt us like we were criminals. I'm going to sit up a while and talk. Al giggled hysterically for a moment. Have a swig of wine? asked Andrews. Sure, it may help a bit. Thanks. He drank greedily from the bottle, spilling a little over his chin. Say, is your face badly cut up, Al? No, it's just scotched. Skin's off. Looks like beefsteak, I reckon. Ever been to Strasbourg? No. Man, that's the town. And the girls in that costume? Whee! Say, you're from San Francisco, aren't you? Sure. Well, I wonder if you knew a fellow I knew at training camp. A kid named Fuselli from Frisco? Knew him? Jesus, man, he's the best friend I've got. You don't know where he is now, do you? I saw him here in Paris two months ago. Well, I'll be damned. God, that's great. Al's voice was staccato from excitement. So you knew Dan at training camp. The last letter from him was about a year ago. Dan had just got to be corporal. He's a damn clever kid, Dan is, and ambitious, too. One of the guys always makes good. God, I'd hate to see him this way. Do you know, we used to see a hell of a lot of each other in Frisco, and he always used to tell me how he'd make good before I did. He was goddamn right, too. Said I was too soft about girls. Did you know him real well? Yes. I even remember that he used to tell me about a fellow he knew who was called Al. He used to tell me about how you two used to go down to the harbor and watch the big liners come in at night, all aflare with lights through the Golden Gate. And he used to tell you he'd go over to Europe in one when he'd made his pile. That's why Strasbourg made me think of him, broke in Al, tremendously excited, because it was so picturesque-like. But honest, I've tried hard to make good in this army. I've done everything a fellow could. And all I did was get into a cushy job in the regimental office. But Dan! God, he may even be an officer by this time. No, he's not that, said Andrews. Look here, you ought to keep quiet with that hand of yours. Damn my hand! Oh, it'll heal all right if I forget about it. You see, my foot slipped when they shunted a car I was just climbing into, and I guess I ought to be glad I wasn't killed. But, gee, when I think that if I hadn't been a fool about that girl, I might have been home by now. The chink says they're putting up barricades on the Avenue Magenta. That means business, kid. Business nothing, shouted Slippery from where he and Chris Field leaned over the dice on the tile floor in front of the window. One tank and a few husky Senegalese will make your goddamn socialists run so fast they won't stop till they get to Dijon. You guys ought to have more sense. Slippery got to his feet and came over to the bed, jingling the dice in his hand. It'll take more than a handful of socialists paid by the Bosch to break the army. If it could be broke, don't you think people would have done it long ago? Shut up a minute. I thought I heard something, said Crisfield, suddenly going to the window. They held their breath. The bed creaked as Al stirred uneasily in it. No. Warn't nothing. I thought I'd heard people singing. The Internationale, cried Al. Shut up, said Crisfield in a low, gruff voice. Through the silence of the room, they heard steps on the stairs. All right, it's only Smitty, said Slippery, and he threw the dice down on the tiles again. The door opened slowly to let in a tall, stoop-shouldered man with a long face and long teeth. Who's the frog? he said in a startled way, with one hand on the doorknob. All right, Smitty. It ain't a frog. It's a guy Chris knows. He's taken his uniform off. Lo, buddy, said Smitty, shaking Andrews's hand. God, you look like a frog. That's good, said Andrews. There's hell to pay, broke out Smitty breathlessly. You know Gus Evans and the little black-haired guy goes round with him? They've been picked up. I seen him myself with some MPs at Place de la Bastille. And a guy I talked to under the bridge where I slept last night 
said a guide to him. They were going to clean the A-walls out of Paris if they had to search through every house in the place. If they come here, they'll get something they ain't looking for, muttered Chrisfield. I'm going down to Nice. Getting too hot around here, said Slippery. I've got travel orders in my pocket now. How did you get them? Easy as pie, said Slippery, lighting a cigarette and puffing affectedly towards the ceiling. I met up with a guy, a second loot, in the Knickerbocker bar. We get strung together and goes on a party with two girls I know. In the morning, I get up bright and early, and now I've got five thousand francs, a leave clip and a silver cigarette case, and Lieutenant J. B. Franklin's running around saying how he was robbed by a Paris whore, or more likely, keeping damn quiet about it. That's my system. But gosh darn it, I don't see how you can go around with a guy and drink with him and then rob him, cried Hal from the bed. No different from cleaning a guy up at craps. Well? And suppose that feller I knew was only a bloody private. Don't you think he'd have turned me over to the MPs like Winkin? No, I don't think so, said Al. They're just like you and me. Scared to death they'll get in wrong, but they won't light on a fellow unless they have to. That's a goddamn lie, cried Chrisfield. They like riding you. A doughboy's less than a dog to em. I'd shoot any one of em like I'd shoot a nigger. Andrews was watching Chrisfield's face. It suddenly flushed red. He was silent abruptly. His eyes met Andrews's eyes with a flash of fear. They're all sorts of officers, like they're all sorts of us, Al was insisting. But you damn fools, quit arguing, cried Smitty. What the hell are we going to do? It ain't safe here no more, that's how I look at it. They were silent. At last Chrisfield said, What you going to do, Andy? I hardly know. I think I'll go out to Saint-Germain to see a boy I know there who works on a farm, to see if it's safe to take a job there. I won't stay in Paris. Then there's a girl here that I want to look up. I must see her. Andrews broke off suddenly and started walking back and forth across the end of the room. You better be damn careful. They'll probably shoot you if they catch you, said Slippery. Andrews shrugged his shoulders. Well, I'd rather be shot than go to Leavenworth for twenty years. God, I would, cried Al. How do you fellows eat here? asked Slippery. We buy stuff, and the dog-faced girl cooks it for us. Got anything for this noon? I'll see if I can buy some stuff, said Andrews. It's safer for me to go out than for you. All right. Here's twenty francs, said Slippery, handing Andrews a bill with an offhand gesture. Chrisfield followed Andrews down the stairs. When they reached the passage at the foot of the stairs, he put his hand on Andrews's shoulder and whispered, Say, Andy! Do you think there's anything in that revolution business? I had never thought they could buck the system that away. They did in Russia. Then we'd be free, civilians like we all was before the draft. But that ain't possible, Andy. That ain't possible, Andy. We'll see, said Andrews, as he opened the door to the bar. He went up excitedly to the chink who sat behind the row of bottles along the bar. Well, what's happening? Where? By the Garde l'Est, where they were putting up barricades? Barricades, shouted a young man in a red sash who was drinking at a table. Why, they tore down some of the iron guards round the trees, if you call that barricades. But they're cowards. Whenever the cops charge, they run. They're dirty cowards. Do you think anything's going to happen? What can happen when you've got nothing but a bunch of dirty cowards? What do you think about it, said Andrews, turning to the chink. The chink shook his head without answering. Andrews went out. When he came back, he found Al and Chrisfield alone in their room. Chrisfield was walking up and down, biting his fingernails. On the wall opposite the window was a square of sunshine reflected from the opposite wall of the court. For God's sake, beat it, Chris. I'm all right, Al was saying in a weak, whining voice, his face twisted up by pain. What's the matter? cried Andrews, putting down a large bundle. Slippery's seen an MP nosing around in front of the gin mill. Good God! 
The trouble is, Al's too sick. Honest to God, I'll stay with you, Al. No, if you know somewhere to go, beat it, Chris. I'll stay here with Al and talk French to the MPs if they come. We'll fool them somehow. Andrews felt suddenly amused and joyous. Honest to God, Andy, I'd stay if it weren't that that sergeant knows, said Chrisfield in a jerky voice. Beat it, Chris. There may be no time to waste. So long, Andy. Chrisfield slipped out of the door. It's funny, Al, said Andrews, sitting on the edge of the bed and unwrapping the package of food. I'm not a damn bit scared any more. I think I'm free of the army, Al. How's your hand? I don't know. Oh, how I wish I was in my old bunk at Koblenz. I weren't made for bucking against the world this way. If we had old Dan with us, funny that you know Dan, he'd have made a million ideas for getting out of this fix. But I'm glad he's not here. He'd bowl me out so for not having made good. He's a powerful ambitious kid, is Dan. But it's not the sort of thing a man can make good in, Al, said Andrews slowly. They were silent. There was no sound in the courtyard, only very far away the clatter of a patrol of cavalry over cobblestones. The sky had become overcast, and the room was very dark. The moldy plaster peeling off the walls had streaks of green in it. The light from the courtyard had a greenish tinge that made their faces look pale and dead, like the faces of men that have long been shut up between damp prison walls. And Fuseli had a girl named Mabe, said Andrews. Oh, she married a guy in the naval reserve. They had a grand wedding, said Al. End of section 16「Section 17 of Three Soldiers」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by M.B. Three Soldiers by John Dos Passos Section 17 4. At last I've got to you. John Andrews had caught sight of Genevieve on a bench at the end of the garden, under an arbor of vines. Her hair flamed bright in a splotch of sun as she got to her feet. She held out both her hands to him. How good-looking you are like that, she cried. He was conscious only of her hands in his hands, and of her pale brown eyes, and of the bright sun splotches and the green shadows fluttering all about them. "'So you are out of prison,' she said, and demobilized. "'How wonderful! Why didn't you write? I have been very uneasy about you. How did you find me here?' "'Your mother said you were here.' "'And how do you like it, my Poissac?' She made a wide gesture with her hand. They stood silent a moment, side by side, looking about them. In front of the arbor was a parterre of rounded box-bushes edging beds where disorderly roses hung in clusters of pink and purple and apricot color, and beyond it a brilliant emerald lawn full of daisies sloped down to an old gray house with, at one end, a squat round tower that had an extinguisher-shaped roof. Beyond the house were tall, lush-green poplars, through which glittered patches of silver-gray river and of yellow sandbanks. From somewhere came a drowsy scent of mown grass. "'How brown you are!' she said again. "'I thought I had lost you. You might kiss me, Jean.' The muscles of his arms tightened about her shoulders. Her hair flamed in his eyes. The wind that rustled through broad grape leaves made a flutter of dancing light and shadow about them. How hot you are with the sun, she said. I love the smell of the sweat on your body. You must have run very hard coming here. Do you remember one night in the spring when we walked home from Pelea and Melesang? How I should have liked to have kissed you then like this. Andrews's voice was strange, hoarse, as if he spoke with difficulty. There is the chateau très froid et très profond, she said with a little laugh. And your hair! 
Je les tiens dans la droite, je les tiens dans la bouche. Toute ta chevelure, toute ta chevelure mélissante est tombée de la tour. Do you remember? How wonderful you are. They sat side by side on the stone bench without touching each other. It's silly, burst out Andrews excitedly. We should have faith in our own selves. We can't live a little rag of romance without dragging in literature. We are drugged with literature so that we can never live at all of ourselves. Jean, how did you come down here? Have you been demobilized long? I walked almost all the way from Paris. You see, I am very dirty. How wonderful! But I'll be quiet. You must tell me everything from the moment you left me in Chartres. I'll tell you about Chartres later, said Andrews gruffly. It has been superb, one of the biggest weeks of my life, walking all day under the sun, with the road like a white ribbon in the sun over the hills and along river banks, where there were yellow irises blooming, and through woods full of blackbirds, and with the dust in a little white cloud round my feet, and all the time walking towards you, walking towards you. And La Reine de Saba? How is it coming? I don't know. It's a long time since I thought of it. Have you been here long? Hardly a week. But what are you going to do? I have a room overlooking the river in a house owned by a very fat woman with a very red face and a tuft of hair on her chin. Madame Boncourt. Of course. You must know everybody. It's so small. And you're going to stay here a long time? Almost forever, and work and talk to you. May I use your piano now and then? How wonderful! Geneviève Rowe jumped to her feet. Then she stood looking at him, leaning against one of the twisted stems of the vines, so that the broad leaves fluttered about her face. A white cloud, bright as silver, covered the sun, so that the hairy young leaves and the wind-blown grass of the lawn took on a silvery sheen. Two white butterflies fluttered for a second about the arbor. "'You must always dress like that,' she said after a while. Andrews laughed. "'A little cleaner, I hope,' he said. "'But there can't be much change. I have no other clothes and ridiculously little money.' "'Who cares for money?' cried Geneviève. Andrews fancied he detected a slight affectation in her tone, but he drove the idea from his mind immediately. "'I wonder if there is a farm round here where I could get work.' "'But you couldn't do the work of a farm laborer," cried Geneviève, laughing. "'You just watch me. "'It'll spoil your hands for the piano.' "'I don't care about that.' But all that's later, much later. Before anything else, I must finish a thing I'm working on. There is a theme that came to me when I was first in the army, when I was washing windows at the training camp. How funny you are, Jean! Oh, it's lovely to have you about again. But you're awfully solemn today. Perhaps it's because I made you kiss me. But, Geneviève, it's not in one day that you can unbend a slave's back. But with you, in this wonderful place. Oh, I've never seen such sappy richness of vegetation. And think of it, a week's walking, first across those grey rolling uplands, and then at Blois down into the haze of richness of the Loire. Do you know Vendôme? I came by a funny little town, from Vendôme to Blois. And you see my feet. And what wonderful cold baths I've had on the sand banks of the Loire. No, after a while, the rhythm of legs all being made the same length on drill fields, the hopeless caged dullness will be buried deep in me by the gorgeousness of this world of yours. He got to his feet and crushed a leaf softly between his fingers. You see, the little grapes are already forming. Look up there, she said, as she brushed the leaves aside just above his head. These grapes here are the earliest. But I must show you my domain and my cousins and the hen-yard and everything she took his hand and pulled him out of the arbor they ran like children hand in hand round the box-bordered paths what i mean is this 
he stammered, following her across the lawn. If I could once manage to express all that misery in music, I could shove it far down into my memory. I should be free to live my own existence in the midst of this carnival of summer. At the house she turned to him. You see the very battered ladies over the door, she said. They are said to be by a pupil of Jean Goujon. They fit wonderfully in the landscape, don't they? Did I ever tell you about the sculptures in the hospital where I was when I was wounded? No, but I want you to look at the house now. See, that's the tower, all that's left of the old building. I live here, and right under the roof there's a haunted room I used to be terribly afraid of. I'm still afraid of it. You see, this Henri Quart part of the house was just a fourth of the house as planned. This lawn would have been the court. We dug up the foundations where the roses are. There are all sorts of traditions as to why the house was never finished. You must tell me them. I shall, later. But now you must come and meet my aunts and my cousins. Please, not just now, Genevieve. I don't feel like talking to anyone except you. I have so much to talk to you about. But it's nearly lunchtime, Jean. We can have all that after lunch. No, I can't talk to anyone else just now. I must go and clean myself up a little anyway. Just as you like. But you must come this afternoon and play to us. Two or three people are coming to tea. It would be very sweet of you if you'd play to us, Jean. But can't you understand? I can't see you with other people now. Just as you like, said Genevieve, flushing, her hand on the iron latch of the door. Can't I come to see you tomorrow morning? Then I shall feel more like meeting people, after talking to you a long while. You see, I... He paused, with his eyes on the ground. Then he burst out in a low, passionate voice. Oh, if only I could get it out of my mind! Those tramping feet, those voices shouting orders. His hand trembled when he put it in Genevieve's hand. She looked in his eyes calmly with her wide brown eyes. How strange you are today, Jean. Anyway, come back early tomorrow. She went in the door. He walked round the house, through the carriage gate, and went off with long strides down the road along the river that led under linden trees to the village. Thoughts swarmed teasingly through his head, like wasps about a rotting fruit. So at last he had seen Genevieve, and had held her in his arms and kissed her. And that was all. His plans for the future had never gone beyond that point. He hardly knew what he had expected, but in all the sunny days of walking, in all the furtive days in Paris, he had thought of nothing else. He would see Genevieve and tell her all about himself. He would unroll his life like a scroll before her eyes. Together they would piece together the future. A sudden terror took possession of him. She had failed him. Floods of denial seethed through his mind. It was that he had expected so much. He had expected her to understand him without explanation, instinctively. He had told her nothing. He had not even told her he was a deserter. What was it that had kept him from telling her? Puzzle as he could, he could not formulate it. Only, far within him, the certainty lay like an icy weight. She had failed him. He was alone. What a fool he had been to build his whole life on a chance of sympathy. No, it was rather this morbid playing at phrases that was at fault. He was like a touchy old maid thinking imaginary results. Take life at its face value, he kept telling himself. They loved each other anyway, somehow. It did not matter how. And he was free to work. Wasn't that enough? But how could he wait until tomorrow to see her? to tell her everything, to break down all the silly little barriers between them so that they might look directly into each other's lives. The road turned inland from the river between garden walls at the entrance to the village. Through half-open doors, Andrews got glimpses of neatly cultivated kitchen gardens and orchards where silver-leaved boughs swayed against the sky. 
Then the road swerved again into the village, crowded into a narrow paved street by the white and cream-coloured houses, with green or grey shutters and pale red-tiled roofs. At the end, stained golden with lichen, the mauve grey tower of the church held up its bells against the sky in a belfry of broad pointed arches. In front of the church, Andrews turned down a little lane towards the river again, to come out in a moment on a quay shaded by skinny acacia trees. On the corner house, a ramshackle house with roofs and gables projecting in all directions, was a sign, Rendez-vous de la Marine. The room he stepped into was so low, Andrews had to stoop under the heavy brown beams as he crossed it. The stairs went up from a door behind a worn billiard table in the corner. Madame Boncard stood between Andrews and the stairs. She was a flabby, elderly woman with round eyes and a round, very red face and a curious smirk about the lips. Monsieur perd un petit peu d'avance, n'est-ce pas, monsieur? All right, said Andrews, reaching for his pocket book. Shall I pay you a week in advance? The woman smiled broadly. Si, monsieur, désir. It's that life is so dear nowadays. People like us can barely get along. I know that only too well, said Andrews. Monsieur est étranger? began the woman in a wheedling tone when she had received the money. Yes, I was only demobilized a short time ago. Aha! Monsieur est démobilisé. Monsieur remplira le petit feuille pour la police, n'est-ce pas? The woman brought from behind her back a hand that held a narrow printed slip. All right, I'll fill it out now, said Andrews, his heart thumping. Without thinking what he was doing, he put the paper on the edge of the billiard table and wrote, John Brown, aged twenty-three, Chicago, Illinois, Etats-Unis, Musician. Holder of passport number 1,432,286. Merci, monsieur. A bientôt, monsieur. Au revoir, monsieur. The woman's singing voice followed him up the rickety stairs to his room. It was only when he had closed the door that he remembered that he had put down for a passport number his army number. And why did I write John Brown as a name, he asked himself. John Brown's body lies a-mouldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, but his soul goes marching on. He heard the song so vividly that he thought for an instant someone must be standing beside him singing it. He went to the window and ran his hand through his hair. Outside the Loire rambled in great loops towards the blue distance silvery reach upon silvery reach, with here and there the broad gleam of a sandbank. Opposite were poplars and fields patched in various greens, rising to hills tufted with dense, shadowy groves. On the bare summit of the highest hill a windmill waved lazy arms against the marbled sky. Gradually John Andrews felt the silvery quiet settle about him. He pulled a sausage and a piece of bread out of the pocket of his coat, took a long swig of water from the pitcher on the washstand, and settled himself at the table before the window in front of a pile of ruled sheets of music paper. He nibbled the bread and the sausage meditatively for a long while. Then he wrote Arbeit und Rhythmus in a large careful hand at the top of the paper. After that he looked out of the window without moving watching the plumed clouds sail like huge, slow ships against the slate-blue sky. Suddenly he scratched out what he had written and scrawled above it, The Body and Soul of John Brown. He got to his feet and walked about the room with clenched hands. How curious that I should have written that name! How curious that I should have written that name! he said aloud. He sat down at the table again, and forgot everything in the music that possessed him. The next morning he walked out early along the river, trying to occupy himself until it should be time to go see Genevieve. The memory of his first days in the army, spent washing windows at the training camp, was very vivid in his mind. 
he saw himself again standing naked in the middle of a wide bare room while the recruiting sergeant measured and prodded him and now he was a deserter was there any sense to it at all had his life led in any particular direction since he had been caught haphazard in the treadmill or was it all chance a toad hopping across a road in front of a steamroller he stood still and looked about him beyond a clover field was the river with its sandbanks and its broad silver reaches a boy was wading far out in the river catching minnows with a net andrews watched his quick movements as he jerked his net through the water and that boy too would be a soldier the lithe body would be thrown into a mould to be made the same as other bodies the quick movements would be standardized into the manual at arms the inquisitive petulant mind would be battered into servility the stockade was built not one of the sheep would escape and those that were not sheep they were deserters every rifle muzzle held death for them they would not live long and yet other nightmares had been thrown off the shoulders of men every man who stood up courageously to die loosened the grip of the nightmare andrews walked slowly along the road kicking his feet into the dust like a schoolboy at a turning he threw himself down on the grass under some locust trees the heavy fragrance of their flowers and the grumbling of the bees that hung drunkenly on the white racemes made him feel very drowsy a cart passed pulled by heavy white horses an old man with his back curved like the top of a sunflower stalk hobbled after using the whip as a walking stick andrew saw the old man's eyes turned on him suspiciously a faint pang of fright went through him did the old man know he was a deserter the cart and the old man had already disappeared round the bend in the road andrews lay a long while listening to the jingle of the harness thin into the distance leaving him again to the sound of the drowsy bees among the locust blossoms when he sat up again he noticed that through a break in the hedge beyond the slender black trunks of the locusts he could see rising above the trees the extinguisher-shaped roof of the tower of genevieve Rau's house he remembered the first day he had seen genevieve and the boyish awkwardness with which she poured tea would he and genevieve ever find a moment of real contact all at once a bitter thought came to him or is it that she wants a tame pianist as an ornament to a clever young woman's drawing-room he jumped to his feet and started walking fast towards the town again he would go to see her at once and settle all that forever the village clock had begun to strike the clear notes vibrated crisply across the fields ten walking back to the village he began to think of money his room was twenty francs a week he had in his purse a hundred and twenty-four francs after fishing in all his pockets for silver he found three francs and a half more a hundred and twenty-seven francs fifty if he could live on forty francs a week he would have three weeks in which to work on the body and soul of john brown only three weeks and then he must find work in any case he would write to henslow to send him money if he had any this was no time for decency everything depended on his having money and he swore to himself that he would work for three weeks that he would throw the idea that flamed within him into shape on paper whatever happened he racked his brains to think of someone in america he could write to for money a ghastly sense of solitude possessed him and would genevieve fail him too genevieve was coming out by the front door of the house when he reached the carriage gate beside the road she ran to meet him good morning i was on my way to fetch you she seized his hand and pressed it hard how sweet of you but jean you're not coming from the village I've been walking. How early you must get up. You see, the sun rises just opposite my window and shines in on my bed. That makes me get up early. She pushed him in the door ahead of her. They went through the hall to a long high room that had a grand piano and many old high-backed chairs, and in front of the French windows that opened on the garden a round table of black mahogany littered with books. 
two tall girls in muslin dresses stood beside the piano. "'These are my cousins. Here he is at last. Monsieur Andrews, ma cousine Berthe, et ma cousine Jeanne. Now you've got to play to us. We are bored to death with everything we know.' "'All right. But I have a great deal to talk to you about later.' Andrew said in a low voice. Geneviève nodded understandingly. "'Why don't you play us La Reine de Saba, Jean?' "'Oh, do play that,' twittered the cousins. "'If you don't mind, I'd rather play some Bach.' "'There's a lot of Bach in that chest in the corner,' cried Geneviève. "'It's ridiculous. Everything in the house is jammed with music.' They leaned over the chest together, so that Andrews felt her hair brush against his cheek and the smell of her hair in his nostrils. The cousins remained by the piano. "'I must talk to you alone soon,' whispered Andrews. "'All right,' she said, her face reddening as she leaned over the chest. On the top of the music was a revolver. "'Look out, it's loaded,' she said when he picked it up. He looked at her inquiringly. "'I have another in my room. You see, Mother and I are often alone here, and then... I like firearms, don't you? I hate them, muttered Andrews. Here's tons of Bach. Fine. Look, Geneviève, he said suddenly, lend me that revolver for a few days. I'll tell you why I want it later. Certainly. Be careful, because it's loaded, she said in an offhand manner, walking over to the piano with two volumes under each arm. Andrews closed the chest and followed her, suddenly bubbling with gaiety. He opened a volume haphazard. To a friend, to dissuade him from starting on a journey, he read. Oh, I used to know that. He began to play, putting boisterous vigor into the tunes. In a pianissimo passage, he heard one cousin whisper to the other, Qu'il a l'air intéressant. Farouche, n'est-ce pas? Genre révolutionnaire answered the other cousin, tittering. Then he noticed that Madame Ro was smiling at him. He got to his feet. Mais ne vous dérangez pas, she said. A man with white flannel trousers and tennis shoes, and a man in black with a pointed grey beard and amused grey eyes, had come into the room, followed by a stout woman in hat and veil, with long white cotton gloves on her arms. Introductions were made. Andrews's spirits began to ebb. All these people were making strong the barrier between him and Geneviève. Whenever he looked at her, some well-dressed person stepped in front of her with a gesture of politeness. He felt caught in a ring of well-deserved conventions that danced about him with grotesque gestures of politeness. All through lunch he had a crazy desire to jump to his feet and shout, Look at me! I'm a deserter! I'm under the wheels of your system! If your system doesn't succeed in killing me, it will be that much weaker! It will have less strength to kill others. There was talk about his demobilization and his music and the Scola Cantorum. He felt he was being exhibited. But they don't know what they're exhibiting, he said to himself with a certain bitter joy. After lunch they went out into the grape arbor, where coffee was brought. Andrews sat silent, not listening to the talk which was about empire furniture and the new taxes, staring up into the broad, sun-splotched leaves of the grapevines, remembering how the sun and shade had danced about Geneviève's hair when they had been in the arbor alone the day before, turning it all to red flame. Today she sat in the shadow, and her hair was rusty and dull. Time dragged by very slowly. At last Geneviève got to her feet, "'You haven't seen my boat,' she said to Andrews. "'Let's go for a row. I'll row you about.' Andrews jumped up eagerly. "'Make her be careful, Monsieur Andrews. She's dreadfully imprudent,' said Madame Ro. "'You are bored to death,' said Geneviève as they walked out on the road. "'No, but all these people seem to be building new walls between you and me. God knows there are enough already.' She looked him sharply in the eyes a second but said nothing. They walked slowly through the sand of the river edge, till they came to an old flat-bottomed boat painted green with an orange stripe, drawn up among the reeds. It will probably sink, 
"'Can you swim?' she asked, laughing. Andrews smiled and said in a stiff voice, "'I can swim. It was by swimming that I got out of the army.' "'What do you mean?' "'When I deserted.' "'When you deserted?' Geneviève leaned over to pull on the boat. Their heads almost touching, they pulled the boat down to the water's edge, then pushed it half out onto the river. "'And if you are caught?' They might shoot me. I don't know. Still, as the war is over, it would probably be life imprisonment, or at least twenty years. Can you speak of it as coolly as that? It is no new idea to my mind. What induced you to do such a thing? I was not willing to submit any longer to the treadmill. Come, let's go out on the river. Geneviève stepped into the boat and caught up the oars. Now push her off and don't fall in, she cried. The boat glided out into the water. Geneviève began pulling on the oars slowly and regularly, Andrews looking at her without speaking. When you're tired, I'll row, he said after a while. Behind them the village, patched white and buff color and russet and pale red with stucco walls and steep tiled roofs, rose in an irregular pyramid to the church. Through the wide-pointed arches of the belfry they could see the bells hanging against the sky. Below in the river the town was reflected complete, with a great rift of steely blue across it where the wind ruffled the water. The oars creaked rhythmically as Geneviève pulled on them. "'Remember when you're tired,' said Andrews again, after a long pause. Geneviève spoke through clenched teeth. Of course, you have no patriotism. As you mean it, none. They rounded the edge of a sandbank, where the current ran hard. Andrews put his hands beside her hands on the oars, and pushed with her. The bow of the boat grounded in some reeds under willows. We'll stay here, she said, pulling in the oars that flashed in the sun as she jerked them, dripping silver, out of the water. She clasped her hands round her knees, and leaned over towards him. So that is why you want my revolver. Tell me about it, from Chartres, she said in a choked voice. You see, I was arrested at Chartres and sent to a labor battalion, the equivalent of your army prison, without being able to get word to my commanding officer in the school detachment. He paused. A bird was singing in the willow tree. The sun was under a cloud. Beyond the long pale green leaves that fluttered ever so slightly in the wind, the sky was full of silvery and cream-colored clouds, with here and there a patch the color of a robin's egg. Andrews began laughing softly. But, Geneviève, how silly those words are, those pompous, efficient words. Detachment, battalion, commanding officer. It would have all happened anyway. Things reached the breaking point, that was all. I could not submit any longer to the discipline. Oh, those long Roman words, what millstones they are about men's necks. That was silly, too. I was quite willing to help in the killing of Germans I had no quarrel with, out of curiosity or cowardice. You see, it has taken me so long to find out how the world is. There was no one to show me the way. He paused as if expecting her to speak. The bird in the willow tree was still singing. Suddenly a dangling twig blew aside a little, so that Andrews could see him, a small grey bird, his throat all puffed out with song. It seems to me, he said very softly, that human society has always been that, and perhaps will be always that, organizations growing and stifling individuals, and individuals revolting hopelessly against them and at last forming new societies to crush the old societies, and becoming slaves again in their turn. "'I thought you were a socialist,' broke in Geneviève sharply, in a voice that hurt him to the quick. He did not know why. "'A man told me at the labor battalion,' began Andrews again, "'that they'd tortured a friend of his there once by making him swallow lighted cigarettes. "'Well, every order shouted at me, every new humiliation before the authorities,' was as great an agony to me. Can't you understand? 
His voice rose suddenly to a tone of entreaty. She nodded her head. They were silent. The willow leaves shivered in a little wind. The bird had gone. But tell me about the swimming part of it. That sounds exciting. We were working unloading cement at Passy. Cement to build the stadium the army is presenting to the French, built by slave labor like the pyramids. Passy's where Balzac lived. Have you ever seen his house there? There was a boy working with me, the kid. Le Gosse, it'd be in French. Without him, I should never have done it. I was completely crushed. I suppose that he was drowned. Anyway, we swam under water as far as we could, and as it was nearly dark, I managed to get on a barge, where a funny anarchist family took care of me. I've never heard of the kid since. Then I bought these clothes that amuse you so, Genevieve, and came back to Paris to find you, mainly. I mean as much to you as that, whispered Genevieve. In Paris, too, I tried to find a boy named Marcel, who worked on a farm near Saint-Germain. I met him out there one day. I found he'd gone to sea. If it had not been that I had to see you, I should have gone straight to Bordeaux or Marseille. They aren't too particular who they take as a seaman now. But in the army, didn't you have enough of that dreadful life, always thrown among uneducated people, always in dirty, foul-smelling surroundings? You, a sensitive person, an artist? No wonder you are almost crazy after years of that. Genevieve spoke passionately, with her eyes fixed on his face. Oh, it wasn't that, said Andrews with despair in his voice. I rather like the people you call low. Anyway, the differences between people are so slight. His sentence trailed away. He stopped speaking, sat stirring uneasily on the seat, afraid he would cry out. He noticed the hard shape of the revolver against his leg. "'But isn't there something you can do about it? You must have friends,' burst out Genevieve. "'You were treated with a horrible injustice. You can get yourself reinstated and properly demobilized. They'll see you as a person of intelligence. They can't treat you as they would anybody.' I must be, as you say, a little mad, Genevieve, said Andrews. But now that I, by pure accident, have made a gesture, feeble as it is, towards human freedom, I can't feel that... Oh, I suppose I'm a fool. But there you have me, just as I am, Genevieve. He sat with his head drooping over his chest, his two hands clasping the gunwales of the boat. After a long while, Genevieve said in a dry little voice, well, we must go back now. It's time for tea. Andrews looked up. There was a dragonfly poised on the top of a reed, with silver wings and a long crimson body. Look just behind you, Genevieve. Oh, a dragonfly. What people was it that made them the symbol of life? It wasn't the Egyptians. Oh, I've forgotten. I'll row, said Andrews. The boat was hurried along by the current. In a very few minutes they had pulled it up on the bank, in front of the Rose House. "'Come and have some tea,' said Genevieve. "'No, I must work.' "'You're doing something new, aren't you?' Andrews nodded. "'What's its name?' "'The Soul and Body of John Brown.' "'Who's John Brown?' "'He was a madman who wanted to free people. There's a song about him.' Is it based on popular themes? Not that I know of. I only thought of the name yesterday. It came to me by a very curious accident. You'll come tomorrow. If you're not too busy. Let's see. The Boileau are coming to lunch. There won't be anybody at tea time. We can have tea together alone. He took her hand and held it, awkward as a child with a new playmate. All right, at about four. If there's nobody there, we'll play music, he said. She pulled her hand from him hurriedly, made a curious formal gesture of farewell, and crossed the road to the gate without looking back. There was one idea in his head, to get to his room and lock the door and throw himself face down on the bed. The idea amused some distant part of his mind. 
that had been what he had always done when as a child the world had seemed too much for him he would run upstairs and lock the door and throw himself face downward on the bed i wonder if i shall cry he thought madame boncourt was coming down the stairs as he went up he backed down and waited when she got to the bottom pouting a little she said so you are a friend of madame gros monsieur how did you know that a dimple appeared near her mouth in either cheek you know in the country one knows everything she said au revoir he said starting up the stairs mais monsieur you should have told me if i had known i should not have asked you to pay in advance oh never you must pardon me monsieur all right monsieur est américain monsieur est américain you see i know a lot her puffy cheeks shook when she giggled. And monsieur has known Madame Gros et Mademoiselle Gros a long time. An old friend. Monsieur is a musician. Yes. Bonsoir. Andrews ran up the stairs. Au revoir, monsieur. Her chanting voice followed him up the stairs. He slammed the door behind him and threw himself on the bed. When Andrews awoke next morning, his first thought was how long he had to wait that day to see Genevieve. Then he remembered their talk of the day before. Was it worth while going to see her at all? he asked himself. And very gradually he felt cold despair taking hold of him. He felt for a moment that he was the only living thing in this world of dead machines, the toad hopping across the road in front of a steam roller. Suddenly he thought of Jeanne. He remembered her grimy, overworked fingers lying in her lap. He pictured her walking up and down in front of the Café de Rohan one Wednesday night, waiting for him. In the place of Genevieve, what would Jeanne have done? Yet people were always alone, really. However much they loved each other, there could be no real union. Those who rode in the great car could never feel as the others felt, the toads hopping across the road. He felt no rancor against Genevieve. These thoughts slipped from him while he was drinking the coffee and eating the dry bread that made his breakfast. And afterwards, walking back and forth along the river bank, he felt his mind and body becoming as if fluid and supple and trembling, bent in the rush of his music like a poplar tree bent in a wind. He sharpened a pencil and went up to his room again. The sky was cloudless that day. As he sat at his table, the square of blue through the window and the hills topped by their windmill and the silver blue of the river were constantly in his eyes. Sometimes he wrote notes down fast, thinking nothing, feeling nothing, seeing nothing. Other times he sat for long periods, staring at the sky and at the windmill vaguely happy, playing with unexpected thoughts that came and vanished as now and then a moth fluttered in the window to blunder about the ceiling beams, and, at last, to disappear without his knowing how. When the clock struck twelve, he found he was very hungry. For two days he had eaten nothing but bread, sausage, and cheese. Finding Madame Boncard behind the bar downstairs polishing glasses, he ordered dinner of her. She brought him a stew and a bottle of wine at once, and stood over him watching him eat it, her arms akimbo, and the dimples showing in her huge red cheeks. Monsieur eats less than any young man I ever saw, she said. I'm working hard, said Andrews, flushing. But when you work hard, you have to eat a great deal, a great deal. And if the money is short, asked Andrews with a smile. Something in the steely, searching look that passed over her eyes for a minute startled him. There are not many people here now, monsieur, but you should see it on a market day. Monsieur will take dessert? Cheese and coffee. Nothing more? It's the season of strawberries. Nothing more, thank you. When Madame Boncourt came back with the cheese, she said, I had Americans here once, monsieur. A pretty time I had with them, too. They were deserters. They went away without paying, with the gendarme after them. I hope they were caught and sent to the front, those good-for-nothings. 
There are all sorts of Americans, said Andrews in a low voice. He was angry with himself because his heart beat so. Well, I'm going for a little walk. Au revoir, madame. Monsieur is going for a little walk. Amusez-vous bien, monsieur. Au revoir, monsieur. Madame Boncourt's sing-song tones followed him out. A little before four, Andrews knocked at the front door of the Rose House. He could hear Santo, the little black and tan, barking inside. Madame Ro came to the door for him herself. Oh, here you are, she said. Come and have some tea. Did the work go well today? And Geneviève, stammered Andrews. She went out motoring with some friends. She left a note for you. It's on the tea table. He found himself talking, making questions and answers, drinking tea, putting cakes into his mouth, all through a white, dead mist. Geneviève's note said, Jean, I'm thinking of ways and means. You must get away to a neutral country. Why couldn't you have come and talked it over with me first, before cutting off every chance of going back? I'll be in tomorrow at the same time. Bien à vous, G. R. Would it disturb you if I played the piano a few minutes, Madame Ro? Andrews found himself asking all at once. No, go ahead. We'll come in later and listen to you. It was only as he left the room that he realized he had been talking to the two cousins as well as to Madame Ro. At the piano he forgot everything and regained his mood of vague joyousness. He found paper and a pencil in his pocket and played the theme that had come to him while he had been washing windows at the top of a stepladder at the training camp, arranging it, modeling it, forgetting everything, absorbed in his rhythms and cadences. When he stopped work it was nearly dark. Geneviève Rowe, a veil around her head, stood in the French window that led to the garden. I heard you, she said. Go on. I, I'm through. How was your motor ride? I loved it. It's not often I get a chance to go motoring. Nor is it often I get a chance to talk to you alone, cried Andrews bitterly. You seem to feel you have rights of ownership over me. I resent it. No one has rights over me. She spoke as if it were not the first time she had thought of the phrase. He walked over and leaned against the window beside her. Has it made such a difference to you, Geneviève, finding out that I am a deserter? No, of course not, she said hastily. I think it has, Geneviève. What do you want me to do? Do you think I should give myself up? A man I knew in Paris has given himself up, but he hadn't taken his uniform off. It seems that makes a difference. He was a nice fellow. His name was Al. He was from San Francisco. He had nerve, for he amputated his own little finger when his hand was crushed by a freight car. Oh, no, no. Oh, this is so frightful. And you would have been a great composer. I feel sure of it. Why, would have been! The stuff I'm doing now is better than any of the dribbling things I've done before. I know that. Oh, yes, but you'll need to study, to get yourself known. If I pull through six months, I'm safe. The army will have gone. I don't believe they extradite deserters. Yes, but the shame of it, the danger of being found out all the time. I am ashamed of many things in my life, Geneviève. I'm rather proud of this. But can't you understand that other people haven't your notions of individual liberty? I must go, Geneviève. You must come in again soon. One of these days. And he was out in the road in the windy twilight, with his music papers crumpled in his hand. The sky was full of tempestuous purple clouds. Between them were spaces of clear, claret-colored light, and here and there a gleam of opal. There were a few drops of rain in the wind that rustled the broad leaves of the lindens and filled the wheat fields with waves like the sea, and made the river very dark between rosy sand banks. It began to rain. Andrews hurried home so as not to drench his only suit. Once in his room he lit four candles and placed them at the corners of his table. 
a little cold crimson light still filtered in through the rain from the afterglow, giving the candles a ghostly glimmer. Then he lay on his bed, and staring up at the flickering light on the ceiling, tried to think. "'Well, you're alone now, John Andrews,' he said aloud, after a half-hour, and jumped jauntily to his feet. He stretched himself and yawned. Outside the rain pattered loudly and steadily. "'Let's have a general accounting,' he said to himself. "'It'll be easily a month before I hear from old Howe in America, and longer before I hear from Henslow, and already I've spent twenty francs on food. Can't make it this way. Then, in real possessions, I have one volume of Villon, a green book on counterpoint, a map of France torn in two, and a moderately well-stocked mind. He put the two books on the middle of the table before him, on top of his disorderly bundle of music papers and notebooks. Then he went on, piling his possessions there as he thought of them. Three pencils, a fountain pen. Automatically he reached for his watch, but he remembered he'd given it to Al to pawn in case he didn't decide to give himself up and needed money. A toothbrush, a shaving set, a piece of soap, a hairbrush and a broken comb. Anything else? He groped in the musette that hung on the foot of the bed. A box of matches, a knife with one blade missing and a mashed cigarette. Amusement growing on him every minute, he contemplated the pile. Then in the drawer, he remembered, was a clean shirt and two pairs of soiled socks. And that was all, absolutely all. Nothing saleable there except Genevieve's revolver. He pulled it out of his pocket. The candlelight flashed on the bright nickel. No, he might need that. It was too valuable to sell. He pointed it towards himself. Under the chin was said to be the best place. He wondered if he would pull the trigger when the barrel was pressed against his chin. No, when his money gave out he'd sell the revolver. An expensive death for a starving man. He sat on the edge of the bed and laughed. Then he discovered he was very hungry. Two meals in one day. Shocking, he said to himself. Whistling joyfully, like a schoolboy, he strode down the rickety stairs to order a meal of Madame Boncoeur. It was with a strange start that he noticed that the tune he was whistling was John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. The lindens were in bloom. From a tree beside the house, great gusts of fragrance, heavy as incense, came in through the open window. Andrews lay across the table with his eyes closed and his cheek in a mass of ruled papers. He was very tired. The first movement of the soul and body of John Brown was down on paper. The village clock struck two. He got to his feet and stood a moment looking absently out of the window. It was a sultry afternoon of swollen clouds that hung low over the river. The windmill on the hilltop opposite was motionless. He seemed to hear Genevieve's voice the last time he had seen her, so long ago. You would have been a great composer. He walked over to his table and turned over some sheets without looking at them. Would have been! He shrugged his shoulders. So you couldn't be a great composer and a deserter, too, in the year 1919. Probably Genevieve was right. But he must have something to eat. But how late it is, expostulated Madame Boncoeur when he asked for lunch. I know it's very late. I have just finished a third of the work I'm doing. And do you get paid a great deal when that is finished? asked Madame Boncoeur the dimples appearing in her broad cheeks. Some day, perhaps. You will be lonely now that the rose have left. Have they left? Didn't you know? Didn't you go to say goodbye? They've gone to the seashore. But I'll make you a little omelet. Thank you. When Madame Boncoeur came back with the omelet and fried potatoes, she said to him in a mysterious voice, you didn't go to see the roses often these last few weeks. No. Madame Boncoeur 
stood staring at him, with her red arms folded round her breasts, shaking her head. When he got up to go upstairs again, she suddenly shouted, "'And when are you going to pay me? It's two weeks since you have paid me.' "'But, Madame Boncar, I told you I have no money. If you wait a day or two, I'm sure to get some in the mail. It can't be more than a day or two.' "'I've heard that story before.' I've even tried to get work at several farms round here. Madame Boncoeur threw back her head and laughed, showing the blackened teeth of her lower jaw. Look here, she said at length, after this week it's finished. You either pay me or... And I sleep very lightly, monsieur. Her voice took on suddenly its usual sleek sing-song tone. Andrews broke away and ran upstairs to his room. I must fly the coop tonight, he said to himself. But suppose then letters came with money the next day. He writhed in indecision all the afternoon. That evening he took a long walk. In passing the Rose House he saw that the shutters were closed. It gave him sort of a relief to know that Genevieve no longer lived near him. His solitude was complete now. And why, instead of writing music that would have been worth while if he hadn't been a deserter, he kept asking himself, Hadn't he tried long ago to act, to make a gesture, however feeble, however forlorn, for other people's freedom? Half by accident he had managed to free himself from the treadmill. Couldn't he have helped others? If he only had his life to live over again. No, he had not lived up to the name of John Brown. It was dark when he got back to the village. He had decided to wait one more day. The next morning he started working on the second movement. The lack of a piano made it very difficult to get ahead, yet he said to himself that he should put down what he could, as it would be long before he found leisure again. One night he had blown out his candle and stood at the window, watching the glint of the moon on the river. He heard a soft, heavy step on the landing outside his room. A floorboard creaked. The key turned in the lock. The step was heard again on the stairs. John Andrews laughed aloud. The window was only twenty feet from the ground and there was a trellis. He got into bed contentedly. He must sleep well, for tomorrow night he would slip out of the window and make for Bordeaux. Another morning. A brisk wind blew fluttering Andrews's papers as he worked. Outside, the river was streaked blue and silver and slate-colored. The windmill's arms waved fast against the piled clouds. The scent of the lindens came only intermittently on the sharp wind. In spite of himself, the tune of John Brown's body had crept in among his ideas. Andrews sat with a pencil at his lips, whistling softly, while in the back of his mind a vast chorus seemed singing, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, but his soul goes marching on. If one only could find freedom by marching for it, came the thought. All at once he became rigid. His hands clutched the table edge. There was an American voice under his window. Do you think she's kidding us, Charlie? Andrews was blinded, falling from a dizzy height. God, could things repeat themselves like that? Would everything be repeated? And he seemed to hear voices whisper in his ears, One of you men teach him how to salute. He jumped to his feet and pulled open the drawer. It was empty. The woman had taken the revolver. It's all planned, then. She knew, he said aloud, in a low voice. He became suddenly calm. A man in a boat was passing down the river. The boat was painted bright green. The man wore a curious jacket of a burnt brown color and held a fishing pole. Andrews sat in his chair again. The boat was out of sight now, but there was the windmill turning, turning against the piled white clouds. There were steps on the stairs. Two swallows, twittering, curved past the window 
very near, so that Andrews could make out the marking on their wings and the way they folded their legs against their pale gray bellies. There was a knock. "'Come in,' said Andrews firmly. "'I beg your pardon,' said a soldier with his hat that had a band in his hand. "'Are you the American?' "'Yes. "'Well, the woman down there said she thought your papers wasn't in very good order.' The man stammered with embarrassment. Their eyes met. "'No, I'm a deserter,' said Andrews. The M.P. snatched for his whistle and blew it hard. There was an answering whistle from outside the window. "'Get your stuff together.' "'I have nothing.' "'All right. Walk downstairs slowly in front of me.' Outside, the windmill was turning, turning, against the piled white clouds of the sky. Andrews turned his eyes towards the door. The M.P. closed the door after them and followed on his heels down the steps. On John Andrews's writing-table, the brisk wind rustled among the broad sheets of paper. First one sheet, then another, blew off the table, until the floor was littered with them. End of Section 17 End of Three Soldiers by John Dos Passos